Catching the Cowboy, a Royal Brothers novel, Grapeseed Falls Romance, Book 5, written by Liz Isaacson, performed by Caroline McLaughlin. Chapter 1 Dylan Royal aimed the all-terrain vehicle toward the ranch and got the machine going at full speed, the pictures on his phone adding weight to the device in his pocket. Dwayne, the owner of Grapeseed Ranch where Dylan worked, wouldn't be happy. Calls would have to be made. After all, they were losing cattle to the coyotes that had been plaguing the ranch for over a year now. A downed cow here and there was a normal loss. But the pictures Dylan had on his phone marked the hundredth cow they'd lost in the past two months alone. Not just coyotes, he muttered to himself, his bones vibrating from the bumpy ground as the ATV sped toward home. Home. What a funny word for Dylan. He wasn't sure if Grapeseed Falls the town or Grapeseed Ranch was really home, but both of his brothers were here, and he supposed that family made a place home more than where a place was physically located. He bypassed the house where Duane used to live before he married Felicity. It was used for dinner sometimes if the wind was particularly bad, and Duane kept the fridge stocked with water and soda and the cupboards with crackers and other snacks. Dylan had stopped by the house dozens of times on his way in from the outer zones, where he spent most of his time. He liked lounging on the comfortable couch in the living room, or sometimes the hammock he tied to one post of the back porch, and the trees several feet from that. The house, which had been empty for a couple of years now, was a great place to get away and just think, just be, reset himself. But he didn't stop today. Today he needed to find Duane and have a serious talk. He knocked on the back door of the homestead. Duane? He entered, but he knew immediately that no one was home. Instead of traipsing all over the ranch to find him, Dylan pulled out his phone and called the boss. Hey, he said when Duane answered. Where are you? Loud laughter came through the line, and Dylan frowned. Didn't they all know they'd just lost 13 more cows to wolves? Wolves, not coyotes. Of course they didn't know. No one else on the cowboy crew at Grapeseed Ranch spent more time in the outer zones than Dylan did. Duane said something over the ruckus on his end of the line, but Dylan couldn't make out the words. Frustration boiled beneath his skin, similar to the way he felt whenever his father texted him. I'm over it, Kurtz. May set out lunch. Of course she did. Dylan loved May and Kurt, his next-door neighbors in the cabin community directly east of the homestead. His stomach growled, reminding him that he'd been out in the wilderness for over 24 hours with only protein bars and bottled water. We lost 13 more cows, he said. Duane sucked in a tight breath. 13 in one day? Some of them were killed further out, probably a few days ago, Dylan said. I just now found them. He stepped back outside and swung his leg over the seat of the ATV. Boss, I think they're wolves taking our cows down. You're gonna need to make that call. Duane exhaled like Dylan had asked him to donate his kidney. Yeah, all right. I'll need you there to present everything. Tell me when and where, and I'll be there. He started the ATV and let the engine roar die down before asking, is there still something to eat at May's? Do you know May at all? Duane chuckled. She'll probably box it all up and send it home with Austin. You two will eat like kings for a few days. Dylan's mood lifted and he turned the vehicle toward the cabin community, where all the cowboys lived in a homey four-by-two grid of cabins, with a covered pavilion, a flagpole, and Kurt and May as their ranch parents. He parked the ATV behind his back door because it was his primary mode of transportation around the ranch. While the other boys mostly used horses, Dylan had way too far to go to take an animal. With the scent of chocolate hanging in the air, he walked next door and up Kurt's back steps. The door was open, letting the April breeze blow through the house, and laughter and chatter met his ears. Relief spread through Dylan, bringing a smile to his face. Hey, guys, he said upon entering. Kurt turned toward him, the cutest little girl cradled in his arms. Despite Dylan's hunger, he reached for Greta, the almost 12-month-old who'd stolen his heart the day she'd been born. Hey, my baby, he chuckled at her as her face lit up. With a head full of dark hair, Dylan had been smitten by Greta at first sight. The pull to be a father radiated through him as he cooed at the little girl and hugged her. May and Kurt had been so good to him, letting him watch Greta while they went to town, drove to the river, whatever. 
He'd volunteered to babysit more times than he could count, and Greta snuggled into him the way she always did. Dylan liked to think she loved him third best, behind her mom and dad, and he asked, Did you eat without me? The girl babbled something, and Dylan took her with him toward the food still spread out on the counter. Oh, I see pickles. You love those. He picked up a baby dill and handed it to Greta, holding it for an extra moment until he was sure her chubby fingers had taken hold. An extra six-foot table had been set up beside the dining room one, and Dylan found almost everyone there. His older brother, Shane, and his fiance, Robin, at the end of the dining room table. They'd be married by the end of the summer, about four months from now. Austin, Dylan's younger brother, sat next to him, engaged in what looked like a heated conversation with Chadwell Dyer, the youngest cowboy at the ranch. Dean Orwell sat across from them, watching but silent. Gabe sat next to Tretton and Jorge, and they tipped their heads back and laughed at something Felicity said. She sat across from them with Duane at her side. Dylan let time slow for a moment, enjoying the sense of camaraderie and family he could feel in this cabin. So his core family had been broken. Shane had found a way through it. Dylan would too. Not that he had any reason to. The lack of females out at Grapeseed made dating difficult. Getting to town hardly ever happened for him because of his isolated assignment on the edges of the ranch. Not that he'd tried that hard, but as he balanced Greta on his hip and took his plate of brisket, baked beans, and macaroni salad to an empty spot across from Shane, Dylan wondered if he should make more of an effort to get some female influence in his life. After all, he couldn't become a father by himself. There you are, Shane said. I called you four times. Out in the North End Zone, Dylan said, feeding Greta a small noodle before taking a whole forkful into his mouth. For three days. He looked at Dean, who worked with Duane on the agricultural side of the ranch. Hey, man, are we still on for ping pong tonight? Dean's whole face lit up, his bright blue eyes practically dancing with fire. He'd come to Grapeseed about the same time as the Royal Brothers, and he and his roommate had just bought a table tennis game for their cabin. Chad's got this whole bracket made. Dylan chuckled. Of course he does. Chadwell didn't do anything halfway, and Dylan spent most of his limited free time with his brothers or with Dean and Chad. Greta squirmed, and Dylan reset her on his thigh. She fussed, and he said, Hey, you're okay? You want another pickle? May appeared at the end of the table and scooped the toddler out of Dylan's arms. Little miss is ready for a nap. Ah, oh, Dylan complained. She just wanted another pickle. Greta's face crumbled, and she started to cry. May bounced her, her expression stern. It's nap time. Come by after work and take her to feed the chickens if you want. She smiled at Dylan, who nodded, a pull of sadness moving through him when May turned and took Greta down the hall to put her to bed. Shane chuckled as he shook his head. What? Dylan asked. You and that baby. I like babies, Dylan said, glancing at Robin. Not all of us live in a 200 square foot house. We're not opposed to babies. Robin said. We're not. Shane looked at her, surprise in his face. Oh boy, Dylan said. Sounds like you guys better work this out before August 25th. Another round of hysterical laughter came from the other end of the table, and Dylan turned toward Felicity and the other cowboys, once again with a full heart and the worry of those downed cows out of his mind. For now. Now? Dylan twirled the ping pong paddle as he glanced out the front window of Dean's cabin. It was almost 6.30 and he'd been done working for an hour. Freshly showered and with a bag of barbecue potato chips, his favorite, he'd been hoping for some fun and games tonight. I called the Texas Parks and Wildlife after lunch, and they said they'd send someone out as soon as possible. It's now. Dwayne didn't speak unkindly, but he also didn't care much about a friendly game of ping pong going on in the cabin community. Fine. Dylan said, give me a few minutes to grab the file from my cabin. We'll be at Kurt's. Duane hung up before Dylan could confirm, and he turned back to the other boys. I have to go, he said. Texas Parks and Wildlife showed up. He tossed his paddle to Austin. I was winning, so see if you can uphold the royal family name. He grinned at his brother, who looked so much like him they got mistaken for twins growing up. Dylan's hair was a little darker than Austin's now, like his blonde hair had been dipped in wood stain and left to dry. They both had a pair of blue eyes, 
but Austin's were more the color of the sky while Dylan's mimicked a deep water. He left his friend's cabin and headed toward his own. After quickly retrieving the folder where he kept detailed records, with pictures, dates, locations, and actions taken for the cattle they'd lost over the past year. Whistling, he headed over to Kurt's, where he suspected Shane had already gone, since their cabin was empty. He couldn't quite imagine living in the cabin with just Austin, but with Shane's wedding right around the corner, and Robin's tiny house parked on a patch of property Levi Rhodes owned, his brother would definitely be moving out. He heard Greta's babble as he climbed the front steps, and he scooped the girl into his arms as she toddled toward him on the porch. Hey, baby. He laughed and started whistling again. His mother had always told him he should move to California and become a professional whistler for Disney. They need people to do birds for their animated movies, she'd said, her face the animated thing in the room. Dylan had always shrugged off her suggestion, knowing it wasn't really what she thought. Who made a living whistling for cartoons? But Greta loved his whistling, and she started to sing along her high-pitched baby babbles not really a harmony that matched. He didn't care, and he danced with her the way he'd seen the princes and princesses do in those animated movies Disney made. The little girl giggled and laughed, and Dylan cut off his whistling to join in. Can I cut in? The definitely female pitch made Dylan freeze, almost giving Greta whiplash. He turned around to find a woman lifting her long, long leg to the top step of the porch and then coming to a rest a brilliant smile on her tanned face. She wore jeans that seemed to go on for miles before they covered a pair of dark brown cowgirl boots. Her pink and black plaid shirt was tucked in, revealing curves that made Dylan's throat dry. She had dark hair flowing over her shoulders, but pinned back from her face so her stunning dark golden eyes could glint at him in what he could only define as flirtatious. Impossible. Though he didn't know who she was, she hadn't shown up on the ranch to flirt with him, a cowboy whose best friend happened to be a 12-month-old baby. You're a great whistler, she said when he stood there, mute. The dancing could be improved, but considering you have to hold your partner up, I'd give it a six. A six? His eyebrows went up, and he glanced down at baby Greta. I think we deserve a ten, don't you? The girl said nothing, simply stared at the imposter on the front porch. Dylan glanced at her, too. Are you from Texas Parks and Wildlife? She gave a little curtsy that sent Dylan's pulse into a frenzy. Her limbs were long, and a smattering of freckles dusted her cheeks and nose. Her smile was quick, with white teeth showing through, and it might have been because Dylan hadn't seen an available female in months, but he really wanted to know everything about this woman. I'm Hazel Brewster, she said. I heard you have a wolf problem, and I'm here to help you with that. She spoke with a drawl that definitely didn't come from Texas. Dylan wanted her to help with a lot more than the wolves stalking their cattle, but he kept that thought to himself. Meetings in there. He used Greta to gesture toward the cabin. I guess we've just been waiting on you. Hazel stepped closer to him, the scent of her skin or her shirt almost making his eyes roll back into his head. She probably used shampoo called vanilla snowflake or something else that made entirely no sense. But in that moment, he didn't care. She smelled feminine and floral and fruity, with a hint of red-hot cinnamon, and he wanted to take a deep inhalation of her scent and hold his breath for as long as possible. Using those long legs, she moved past him and into the cabin, glancing over her shoulder to say, I really do want to dance with you sometime, before turning back and disappearing through the doorway. Chapter Two Hazel Brewster basked in the energy at Grapeseed Ranch. Sure, she'd heard of it. Everyone within a hundred-mile radius of Grapeseed Falls had heard of the ranch. They produced some of the best beef in the state of Texas, and when their cowboys came to town, it was all female hands on deck. Not Hazel, of course. She dated enough cowboys to know they came in gorgeous packages, from the boots to the belt buckles to the hats, but that most were more interested in their horse than they were in her. Of course, she knew that was her fault. She wasn't serious about getting serious with anyone, and most men didn't just want a first date and then a BFF to laugh with. Some did, sure. Jason Bell, who worked at the ice cream parlor, made a sinfully good grilled cheese sandwich, and Hazel ate one with him at least twice a week. But Hazel wasn't good dating material, and she somehow managed to broadcast that message to men within minutes. Probably because you flirt too much. 
she told herself as she paused and glanced around the cabin. Three more men sat at a massive dining room table, and a dark-haired woman fluttered around the kitchen. Music played from unseen speakers, and Hazel grinned again. Hello, gentlemen, she said, her voice oozing with so much coyness that her brother would roll his eyes and say, That Hazel, that's why you scare men to death. Marshall didn't have a lot of room to talk, as he was currently single and looking to mingle. Hazel liked her fun, flirty lifestyle, though it did get lonely in the evenings with just her and her two English bulldogs. But not this evening. Oh, no. Tonight, she had four cowboys with their attention on her. The man from the porch came in behind her, stepping to her side and saying, This is Hazel Brewster from Texas Parks and Wildlife. All three men at the table stood and approached her. None of them stared and scanned the way the blonde cowboy on the porch had, so they were married or otherwise taken. The woman turned down the music and gave Hazel a welcoming smile. She liked her immediately and recognized her from town. Her family owned Sotheby's, a restaurant Hazel had frequented on at least a dozen first dates. I'm Dwayne Carver. The tallest man extended his hand and shook hers. I own this ranch. He introduced his co-foreman, Shane and Kurt, and then nodded to the beautiful man with the baby. That's Dylan Royal. Dylan Royal. Hazel let the name roll around in her head, her attraction to him sparking through her like firecrackers. He handed the baby to the dark-haired co-foreman, who passed the girl to the woman. Obviously, they were together, and that baby wasn't Dylan's. The fact that he might be single and childless had giddiness galloping through her bloodstream. So I hear y'all have some issues with a wolf. She followed them to the table, where Dylan opened a folder and proceeded to push pictures and papers around to the group. Our first instance was in March of last year. He spoke with an easy, rolling voice that Hazel thought would be mighty fine to fall asleep to. She forced herself to look at the pictures, read the charts, and do her job instead of fantasizing about a man she'd just met. He used his hands enough for her to see that he wasn't wearing a wedding ring. And though the other blonde cowboy wasn't either, he clearly belonged to someone else. These are the pictures from this week. Dylan collected the pictures he'd passed out and spread out a new set. Fourteen cows lost in a matter of days, some in an area I'd checked a few days ago. It looked like they'd been dragged there. Coyotes don't do that, Duane murmured. Which is why I think it's a wolf, Dylan said, not looking at her. Or a pack. You can also see the difference in the claw marks in this picture, and this one. He placed a previous one next to a particularly gruesome photo. Hazel was glad she hadn't had that grilled cheese sandwich with Jason yet. And the pictures weren't pleasant, and thankfully, Dylan gathered them and placed them face down in the folder only a moment later. These charts show our loss, and how it's escalating. We send crews to fix fences, and seemingly overnight, they're down again. Only the low radio provided any sound now, and Hazel pulled out her phone to get the paperwork she needed. Definitely a wolf, she declared. Probably more than one, as you said, Dylan. She glanced around at the group. I've got a few forms that I need y'all to fill out, and then I can start my case study. A frown pulled at Duane's eyebrows, and he exchanged a look with the other men at the table. Hazel was used to the reaction. No one liked how case study sounded, because it meant boring and will take forever. Wolves are protected in the state of Texas, she said, her usual spiel. So I need to go out and see the site for myself. Stay out there, see what I can observe about their behavior and decide if relocation is the best option. Relocation is the best option, Duane said. They're killing my cattle on my property. There are only 113 Mexican wolves in the United States, Hazel said evenly, her smile still stuck in place on her face. That pack is in eastern Arizona and western New Mexico, so to have wolves here at all would be very, very interesting. Her heart jumped at the chance to be involved in this case. We don't even know if it's a wolf. She looked at Dylan, his ocean-colored eyes locking on hers. You didn't see a wolf, right? No, ma'am, he said quietly. I was just speculating because of the number killed in such a short time. Hazel glanced at her phone. I just need an email address and I'll get the form sent to you. If you decide to fill them out and file, someone will be assigned to the case to come investigate the issue. She met Duane's eyes. We don't want you losing your cattle any more than you do, Mr. Carver. The wildlife in Texas needs to stay wild, not depend on domesticated farms or ranches for survival. 
She smiled around the table, noting that only Dylan returned the gesture. He clearly wasn't in a top position of power like the other three men. He probably worked the fence line where the cattle casualties had been happening, and he obviously kept meticulous records. The detailed, organized side of Hazel really liked that, and she thought maybe she could get his email address or number before she left. He was definitely worth one date, and Hazel knew it would be a good one. I'll fill them out, he finally said. Joy filled her, and she typed in his email address and sent the files off. There you go. Let me know if you need any help with them. He frowned at his phone, scanning and swiping quickly. How do I get in touch with you? My number's at the bottom there. She swept the crowd again, finding them all now watching Dylan. Anything else? Who'll be assigned? Dylan asked the same time Dwayne said, How long does it take to get started once we file? Hazel tucked her hair behind her right ear. It takes two or three days to process the paperwork and assign a scientist. We have three mammologists on staff, and two of us are specifically trained in large felines and canis. She nodded like she made the assignment herself. She didn't. She worked cases assigned to her, and did visits like this one to see if a case was even viable. She hadn't wanted to come out here tonight, but now that she was here, she was glad she'd come. And Leslie would be so mad when she learned that she'd missed out on meeting a handsome cowboy. Just another reason Hazel was faithful to a fault with taking vitamins and washing her hands. It could have been her home with the stomach flu tonight instead of Leslie, and then she would never have been able to get her phone number to the blonde cowboy still watching her with those eyes she wanted to dive into. Are you one of them? Dylan pressed. Shane coughed, bringing his hand to his mouth to hide a smile. Dwayne leaned back in his chair and folded his arms, halfway between amused and disgruntled. Kurt continued to stare at Dylan. I am, Hazel said. I've never been out to this ranch. It's nice. Got a great vibe. She stood and tapped the folder Dylan had presented from. Make copies of those and send them in. I'm sure your case will get approved. She normally didn't guarantee such things, but she could meet with Alan, push the issue, beg him to let her study the wilderness out here that had largely been ignored in favor of controlling the coyote population closer to Austin. I'll see myself out. Dylan jumped to his feet and went with her, the folder tucked under his arm. You really think I should make copies of all those pictures? Just the charts, she said. You keep great records. She stepped at the door and onto the porch. You living out here? Right next door, he pointed north. I live with my brothers. Shane's one of them. He nodded back toward the cabin they'd just left. I knew you two were related. Hazel started down the steps and continued on toward her truck. I hope I get assigned to the case, she said. Let me know if you need any help with the forms. Dylan stopped a few paces back and saluted her as she climbed behind the wheel and started her vehicle. She forced herself to back out and drive away but she did check her rearview mirror more than entirely necessary for a dirt road with absolutely no vehicular traffic. She giggled as she went under the carved arch of the ranch, a prayer slipping into her thoughts that she really could be the one assigned to the issue at Grapeseed Falls. So I met a man tonight. Hazel pushed a bit of chocolate ice cream out of the way, going for a chunk of banana covered in melted vanilla and loads of caramel. Jason's green eyes came to hers immediately and Michaela gave a little shriek. Tonight? Weren't you working? Her spoon hovered in midair, where it had frozen with Hazel's declaration. Yeah, I met him at work. Oh, boy. Jason snagged a big bite of all three ice cream flavors in the banana split the three of them were sharing. The shop had closed half an hour ago, but they sat inside with all the lights still on. Michaela slapped Jason's bicep, as if they weren't the cutest couple on the planet. Hazel might be jealous of their easy relationship. Stop it. What? He looked at his girlfriend. She won't go out with him twice. Hazel dipped her spoon in for more caramel sauce. She didn't like strawberry ice cream, preferring hot fudge with chocolate and caramel with vanilla. But Jason insisted on the purity of banana split. With all three flavors of ice cream, as well as four flavored sauces, butterscotch, caramel, hot fudge, and strawberry. I'm thinking I might make an exception with this guy, Hazel said. Michaela dropped her spoon this time, the resulting clatter of metal on the table making Hazel jump. I'm sorry, she said. What did you just say? Hazel shrugged one shoulder. 
her attention on the treat in front of her instead of the two people across from her. He was really good-looking, smart, organized. She kept his dancing with the toddler to herself, finding it endearing and special, not something she babbled to her besties the moment she left the ranch. So was Flynn, Jason said. He got one date, and Cooper, and Jasper, and... All right, Hazel said, giving him a glare. They were nice, sure. Jasper was a great singer. She remembered their single day to the karaoke bar in nearby Careville. Very low voice. If the Bar J Wranglers hadn't just picked up a new bass, he could have been it. So good singing doesn't earn a second date. Michaela picked up her spoon, her auburn hair swishing as she swiveled to look at Jason. There must be something different about this guy, better than good singing. He looked back and forth between Hazel and Michaela. Obviously but what could it possibly be? I haven't even gone out with him, Hazel said. I barely know him. He doesn't have any personal contact information of mine. It's all through work. Then why do you think you'd give him two dates when you haven't done that for anyone in years? Michaela asked. Years? Hazel scoffed, though she couldn't remember the last guy she'd gone out with more than once. Oh, but she could. And he'd taken her heart, sliced it up, and served it back to her in tiny pieces when he broke their engagement and left town all within the space of an hour. She didn't need anyone to see the scars where she'd stitched her most vital organ back together, so she didn't let anyone in. Since Peter, Michaela said, speaking the unspeakable. Hazel stood as if someone had strapped a rocket to her back. Thanks for the ice cream and the company. I'm beat. Hazel, Michaela called after her as she started for the front door. It's locked, Jason said, and Hazel did a 180, ignoring her best friend's doleful brown eyes as she passed. She made it around the counter and through the kitchen with only several long strides. Why did her breath still stick in her lungs after all these years? Why did Peter get to have that power over her for so stinking long? She wasn't getting any younger, and if she wanted a life in a cabin with a cowboy husband and a dark-haired baby he danced with on their porch, she only had a few years left to get it. She made it outside and pressed her back against the metal door. Drawing in a deep breath, she caught the stale smell of air in the alley, trying to sort through what she wanted, how she felt, and why she couldn't get the blue-eyed, blonde-haired cowboy out of her mind. Chapter 3 Dylan returned to the cabin in somewhat of a stupor. Had he been thinking properly, he would have gone back to his own cabin, put the file away, and headed back over to Dean's to play ping pong. What in the world was that? Shane asked, a laugh bubbling out of his mouth. Did you fancy her or something? Fancy her? Dylan scoffed, heat rising to his face. Had he been that obvious? Who talks like that? Kurt handed him a cup of coffee like he belonged in this cabin with these older, established men. Dylan looked at it, took a sip, nearly spitting it out when he said, he's interested for sure. Come on, he said. I was just asking her questions. Yeah, Shane said. Like, how can I get your phone number so I can ask you to dinner? He laughed again and clapped Dylan on the back. Hey, I'm not judging. Sure seems like you are. He fisted his phone before stuffing it in his back pocket. I just might need help with the forms. Dwayne passed him with his own cup of coffee in tow. Get them done as quickly as you can. If she has to come up here and observe, who knows how many more cattle we'll lose. He paused in the doorway. And do you want me to assign you to this? Dylan blinked at him. Who else would you assign? I've been going out to the far reaches for years. Dwayne couldn't take that from him. Could he? What if she doesn't get assigned to our case? Dwayne asked. What if it's some smelly old male scientist you'll need to shadow for a few weeks? Foolishness raced through Dylan. I'd still want this assignment, he said. Hazel has nothing to do with it. Oh, Hazel has everything to do with it. Shane breathed out her name like Dylan had done such a thing. Of course he hadn't, had he? His brother laughed, and he, Kurt, and Duane took their leave to sit on the front porch, sip their coffee, and talk about boring ranch business. Dylan set his coffee cup in the sink and rinsed it out so May wouldn't have to clean up after him. He exited through the back door so he could avoid any more ribbing, a 
and went home to his empty cabin, his mind rotating from Hazel's beautiful eyes to her obviously capable ability to relocate wolves. He wasn't sure which was sexier, only that he wanted to spend more time with her so he could learn everything about her. Then he could decide what her most attractive quality was. The next day, his phone rang while he swung lazily in the hammock behind the guest house. He jolted from his near nap, hoping it wasn't Duane. The man had a way of sniffing out a cowboy that took a break for too long, and while Dylan had never really fallen into that category, he was slated to go out to the northern zones in an hour and had to work until well into the night to keep an eye on the herd. He could afford a nap. Yep, he said after he'd answered his boss's call. You haven't left yet, have you? No, sir. Dylan pushed himself with one foot to get the hammock swinging again. He loved Texas, couldn't imagine living anywhere else. Felicity has some food for you at the homestead. Dylan perked up at the mention of food and promised to drop by and get it before he left for the fence line. An hour later, with a half a dozen blueberry muffins for breakfast and two BLTs for dinner, he swung his leg over the ATV and set it northward. He went along the paths between the alfalfa fields, saw the abandoned grove of peach trees, and passed three cabins before he even got close to his destination. The further from the ranch he drove, the less weight his shoulders seemed to be bearing up, and he didn't even know why. He didn't have a particularly hard job around the ranch. He liked all the men he worked with. There was just something freeing about being out in the open wilderness, with no cell service and no one to talk to. Just his own thoughts, his own self. A man and his god. Please help our paperwork to go through quickly, he prayed. Something that had been on his mind since that morning when he'd emailed in the completed forms. They weren't hard, and he hadn't needed any assistance from the lovely Hazel Brewster. He considered calling her, and then decided that there was no way he could ever tell Shane she'd caught him dancing on the porch with Greta, and then called her to ask a question he already knew the answer to. So he'd simply filled out the forms and submitted them, as if Hazel were the old smelly male scientist Duane had kidded him about. And please allow Hazel to be the one to handle our case, he added. Might as well put it all on the line. It was just between him and the Lord anyway. Shane didn't need to know. He arrived at the cabin, which was in the best repair out of any on the ranch. Dylan knew, because he spent a lot of time in it, fixing it up and making it his sanctuary. Duane hadn't approved anything, but Dylan had patched the roof so it was airtight. He cleaned the windows with vinegar until they were so clear he wasn't sure if they were open or closed. He'd purchased curtains at the last peach jamboree, nice manly curtains with horses and cowboy hats on them, and hung them over the windows. He painted the front door white and the side door baby blue that reminded him of Austin's eyes. He'd refinish the floor inside and use some leftover barn stain to make it a rich chocolatey shade that gave the cabin an upscale feel. If he had the time and materials, he could have sectioned it into more rooms. But since the cabin was mostly used by him or a crew of cowboys, as they worked on the long fence lines that ran around Grapeseed Ranch, there was no need. There were already two large private rooms on the far side of the house with a bathroom between them. Those doors closed and locked, and Dylan had left them as is. The big room the front door opened up to held four long couches in neat rows, and honestly, he sometimes preferred the one against the back wall to the cot in the bedroom. The side door opened into a small kitchen area with a U-shaped counter, a standard refrigerator he never used because he didn't want to start the generator, and a sink. The biggest perk of the cabin was the running water, and Dylan liked the shower out here more than the one at his place on the ranch. He unpacked his food and left it on the counter for later, wishing for at least the twentieth time that he had a dog of his own. Shane had gotten an Australian shepherd several months ago, and Cinna loved all the royal brothers. Shane best, so she followed him all over the ranch. Dylan needed a companion like that, and he determined to get into the shelter again and see if they had any German shepherds. He'd looked several times, to no avail. Life out in the cabin would almost be perfect if he had a dog to share it with. Once he'd gotten settled in the cabin, he headed out on the ATV to check the fences he'd just fixed. The brighter, near wood seemed intact, as did the chicken wire he'd used to prevent even the smallest of foxes and coyotes from coming through. He stood on the ATV while he drove, constantly moving his attention from left to right and back. The last thing he needed was to be caught unaware out here by a wild animal, or a big rock he rammed his vehicle into. 
or any number of other dangers that came when a man let his guard down out in the middle of nowhere. The Texas sun beat down relentlessly, but Dylan actually enjoyed it. The heat, the sweat trickling from under the brim of his cowboy hat, and the scent of dust in the air. There was nowhere he'd rather be than out here doing this job. Okay, he said aloud to himself. There could be something better. He gazed into the clear sky, not a cloud to be found. Maybe if I was out here, doing this job with Hazel. Four days passed before Dylan got another call. This time it wasn't from the owner of the ranch, but an unknown Texas number. He'd spent two nights out at the cabin and hadn't found any evidence of more creatures coming in and disturbing the herd. Which was great, really. But he needed to get back out there in the next day or two and make sure things were still going well. Hello, he answered walking through his cabin toward the back door, hoping and praying with everything he had that it wasn't his father, fresh out of the relationship he'd broken their family with, using a burner cell. He was the only one home, but he'd always gravitated toward open space when talking on the phone. In general, he'd rather text than talk, but when a woman drawled, Is this Dylan Royal? With the edge of something non-Texan in her words, he was grateful for the modern invention of the phone. Maybe, he said if this is someone who's never seen me dance with a baby. Hazel laughed, and he imagined the bright free sound coming from her throat as she tipped her chin toward the heavens. He wanted to be there with her next time she laughed like this, and he couldn't help the chuckles that came from his mouth too. I have some good news, she said. I've been assigned to your case. A smile burst onto Dylan's face. He didn't want to give away too much of the complete euphoria flowing through him so he grinned at the fields beyond the cabin community like a lunatic. I'm so glad our case got approved. Very neutral, he thought. Nothing about her. So what's the next step? I get to come out to the ranch and start the study, she said. It's Friday today, so I'm wondering what your week next week looked like. Dylan thought he could maybe skip going out to the far zone tomorrow. How about Monday? He asked. We can go out and get you all set up. How long do you need to be out there, making notes or whatever? Several days. Several days alone with her sounded fantastic, and Dylan worked to keep his thrumming pulse in check. So maybe Monday through Friday, he suggested. I'll just want to plan food and activities. Activities? Well, once you're out there, there's not a whole lot to do, he admitted. It was why he'd worked on the doors, the curtains, the windows, the floor. The herd is safe during the day. It's at dusk and dawn that the observations need to happen. A flash of pride stole through Dylan that he could even remember what she'd said she'd do during the case study. Right, dusk and dawn, Hazel said. What time should I be out at the ranch? He suggested ten, and she said she'd be there, and the call ended. As Dylan held his phone against his thigh, several questions ran through his mind. How had she gotten his personal cell phone number? Did she know what to bring out to the cabin? Did she have any nut allergies? He didn't want to spend five days out in the cabin without a hot meal, and he resolved that he would indeed need to make a trip out to the far zone so he could take out a hot plate, some simple cookware, and enough gas to keep the generator going for five days. After all, he could eat protein bars and day-old muffins for a day or two, but Hazel certainly shouldn't have to. Chapter 4 Hazel gazed at herself in the mirror on Sunday morning, the bright white gems in her necklace making her much more sophisticated and chic than she actually was. She slipped three diamond, okay, cubic zirconium, studs in the holes in her ears, each a different size. She liked dressing up. She liked shoes. She liked wearing her fun, flirty, fit and flare dresses to church. The one she wore today was black and white leaf patterns that blended and blurred as the skirt extended to her knee. She paired it with a simple diamond jewelry and a simple pair of bright yellow heels. She hardly ever got to wear heels on her first dates because she stood five feet nine without them. But to church, she always wore heels. She hadn't had a relationship get to sitting by each other at church since Peter, so there was never any threat of towering over her boyfriend. Michaela had called twice before Hazel couldn't take it anymore and had picked up the phone. She listened to her best friend apologize about Peter and ask silly questions about Dylan. Hazel hadn't given any specifics, not even the man's name, so she thought he was cute. 
More than cute, she murmured as she slicked on a layer of clear lip gloss. She picked up a pair of yellow reading glasses she got at the drugstore for $5 and set them on her nose. Perfect. This was the absolute perfect outfit for church. And she told herself over and over she hadn't taken this much care just in case she happened to see this strikingly handsome cowboy from Grapeseed Ranch. Definitely not. She put this much effort into her appearance every Sabbath day. She arrived at church seemingly at the same time as everyone else, inching forward as families, couples, and singles crossed the parking lot in front of her. After finding a space in the back, she headed for the door, grateful and glad for a job that allowed her most weekends off, for friends to sit with, for gentle reminders of faith, family, and forgiveness she found inside the gray and white building. There had always been a plethora of cowboy hats in the congregation. Hazel had honestly never looked for a man at church, but today she did. A particular man with coppery blonde hair peeking out from under his charcoal-colored cowboy hat. It was impossible to find him in such a short time, and before she knew it, the minister was standing up and Michaela was waving her forward like she was an air traffic controller. Hazel slid onto the end of the bench just as Pastor Gifford welcomed everyone with his jovial smile and booming voice. She sighed a happy little sound that signaled that she'd made it through another week without too many catastrophes. What's with the glasses? Michaela hissed, her hand now firmly planted in Jason's. They match the shoes. Hazel lifted one leg so her friend could see the heels. Michaela smiled. Of course they do. She turned her attention to the front of the chapel as Pastor Gifford started talking about a few people in their congregation that needed help. Sign-ups for food and visits were in the hall outside his office and Hazel listened for the names of those in need. When Pastor Gifford said, and Widow Burno has asked for help in her gardens and someone to talk to, be as generous as you can. Before continuing with his sermon, Hazel wanted to get up and go sign up right then. She adored Maggie Burno, a little old lady with more fire than energy whom Hazel had signed up to visit on a whim. Now the older woman was one of her best friends, had taught Hazel how to bake bread, and could always make Hazel laugh. She'd stop by even if the sign-up list filled up. A tug of guilt pulled against her conscience. She should have been over there to visit before now. It shouldn't take a church sign-up sheet to get her across town to Freesom Street to check in on her friend. As soon as the sermon ended, she hurried to the table and waited behind a couple of other women. She studied Maggie's sheet, realizing she'd be out of town all week. In the end, She'd sign up for a slot that afternoon and one next Saturday before heading out and getting on home. Three hours later, she knocked on Maggie's door with one hand while the other kept a sour cream crumb cake balanced. The front yard needed to be mowed, and weeds had started popping their heads through the dirt in the flower beds. Though she was excited to see Dylan again, Hazel couldn't help wishing she'd be around this week to help with the outdoor spring cleanup that needed to happen. Max, she called when the older lady didn't come to the door. She pushed it open and called again. Coming, I'm coming. She appeared a few moments later, her wrinkled hand gripping the doorframe as she entered through the back door. Her snow white hair was flatter than Hazel had ever seen it. When she saw Hazel, her whole being lit up. Oh, Hazel, dear. Hazel set the cake on the kitchen counter and embraced the woman who was at least a foot shorter than her. Why didn't you call me? She asked, holding onto Maggie's slight shoulders and looking down into her face. I would have come and set your hair ages ago. Oh, pish posh, Maggie said, waving away Hazel's concern. I know how busy you are. Hazel wasn't that busy. I made a sour cream crumb cake, she said, and I'm going to run home and get my curlers. We'll get you all set up while we catch up. It's not, Maggie. Hazel ran her fingers through the woman's hair. This is just not okay. She grinned as she said it hoping Maggie could feel the love and affection she had for her. Please let me do this for you. I'm going out on a job all week, and I won't be back until Saturday. All right. Maggie turned and hobbled into the kitchen. I'll put together some sandwiches to go with the cake while you're gone. Perfect. Hazel hurried home and grabbed the items she needed. In a previous life, before Peter, she'd done hair out of her home. Sometimes the sting of missing it hit Hazel hard and sometimes she could walk by the beauty chair she'd store in the carport without a single thought. Today, she hesitated. She'd cut Michaela's hair in a pinch, and once she told Maggie she used to set hair as easily as breathing, she'd been doing the older woman's perms every three months. 
She hadn't even realized so much time had gone by. Sadness combined with guilt, and she vowed to set a calendar reminder on her phone so she wouldn't forget about Maggie again. Back at Maggie's, she got to work while Max chatted about her neighbors, her sister down in Tampa, and how much she loved listening to the birds singing in the morning. Speaking of birds, Hazel said, I met a man who can whistle just like them. Is that so? Yep, right here in Grapeseed Falls. Who is he? Oh, just a cowboy out at the Carver Ranch. He's well, she shrugged. He's part of the job I'm doing this week. He's got some wolves or coyotes or something killing their cattle, and I'm going to do a case study on it to see if we can keep all the animals alive. She didn't need to mention how utterly devastating Dylan was. Maggie wouldn't know who he was, and Hazel didn't need to sound like a schoolgirl with a big crush, even if she was one. Those boys out at Grapeseed Ranch came and did all my yard work one day, she said. That's far. Nice bunch of men they were. Why that didn't surprise Hazel, she wasn't sure. She had limited experience with anyone at the ranch, but the men she'd met seemed like the type of guys who'd show up with shovels and rakes and leaf blowers and take care of business. She, being the oldest, with only four younger brothers to talk to for advice, Hazel didn't have a lot of opportunities to talk about her feelings, her crushes, or her heartaches. She talked to her mom every week, but for some reason, she hadn't mentioned Dylan yesterday while she scrubbed her bathrooms and ran a duster over her end tables and other surfaces in her house. He was a delicious secret, one she didn't want to reveal quite yet. Sure, she'd said something about him to Michaela and Jason, but she hadn't mentioned Dylan by name, savoring that for herself. Maggie started talking about her daughter and granddaughter, and Hazel kept her on that topic for a while. Loretta was only a few years older than Hazel herself, but she had four children and lived in a suburb of Dallas. Hazel had never felt even so much as a twinge of jealousy when she listened to Maggie talk about her daughter. But today, today something had changed. She wasn't sure when, and she had no idea exactly what. But something had changed. She'd grown up in a loud household with lots of love and laughter, but she never really envisioned that life for herself. Her father and all four of her brothers ran their family carpet cleaning business while their mother worked in the office, keeping financial records, arranging jobs, and holding everything together. Her mother was exceptionally skilled at that, and Hazel, well, Hazel wasn't. But she smiled at Maggie's stories, asked questions about Loretta, who she'd met on several previous occasions and felt like she was good friends with, and spent a perfectly enjoyable afternoon with an old friend. The following day found her at Grapeseed Ranch, her heart bobbing strangely in her chest, as if it had come unanchored sometime during the night. She hadn't arranged a meeting place for her and Dylan, but he'd mentioned he'd lived next door to the cabin where she'd met with everyone last week. So she pulled up to the one next door, and found a pretty Australian shepherd lounging on the grass at the bottom of the steps. Hey there. Hazel crouched down to scrub the pooch behind the ears. Is your daddy here? If Dylan was half as good with dogs as he was with babies, Hazel might propose by the end of the week. Bootsteps sounded on the porch above her, and the dog got to its feet. Sinna, come, a man said, and the shepherd did exactly what her master said. She glanced up, her best smile on her face, only to find the co-foreman from the other night. Shane, if she remembered right, not Dylan. Hello, she said. I'm looking for Dylan. Oh, he's over at the guest house, or the homestead. Shane gazed into the distance, his fingers absently running through his dog's fur. We were supposed to meet at ten, she said. He brought his attention back to her. He'll be ready, I'm sure. It's only quarter till. Mind if I wait here? She gestured to the steps, already moving toward them. Be my guest, he said. Want some coffee? She already felt overstimulated, so she declined. Past the cabins, she caught movement as cowboys went about their chores, as a pair of people worked with a pair of horses out in a pasture without saddles or ropes. The air smelled out here the way it did in town after it rained, which was hardly ever. But the crispness of it was somehow preserved out here, with the straw, the animals, the cool grass. Minutes later, the sound of an approaching ATV met her ears, and her heart took flight at the cowboy driving it. She stood and slicked her palms down her thighs, hoping she'd packed all the right things. 
This wouldn't be her first foray out in the wilds of Texas Hill Country. And she knew enough to bring sunscreen, bug spray, lots of water, extra clothes, especially socks in case they got wet, two pairs of boots, a couple of hats, and any special snacks that would make the days bearable. Dylan was grinning before he came to a stop. He leapt from the ATV and approached her with the joyful clip of a man who'd been dying to see her. Could that be true? Hazel's heart beat like it certainly could. Hey there, he said, stopping a healthy, respectable distance away. I thought you might show up here. You've got a bag? He glanced around and she practically darted toward her truck parked in front of his cabin. Yeah, a duffel. Are we riding that thing out? She lifted the army green duffel bag from the back of the truck. Is my truck okay here? If you want to leave the keys, Shane or Austin can move it. My brothers. You and your brothers all work here? Yeah, that's right. Wow, could his shoulders be any broader? His hands any bigger and more powerful as he took her bag from her and slung it over his back. She handed him her keys. Probably best to leave these so they don't get lost. I'll leave them for Shane. Then he can move the truck if it's in the way. He dashed off a grin before taking the steps two at a time up to the porch. Hey, Cinnawinna, where's Shane? He opened the door, her bag still swaying on his back. He said something undiscernible and laughter came out the front of the cabin. Hazel tucked her hands into her back pockets and waited for Dylan to come back, her eyes straying to the idling ATV and the tiny seat which she'd share with him. Every cell in her body felt like it had been lit on fire. It made no sense. She barely knew Dylan at all, and yet she was already thinking about going out with him more than once, which led to holding hands, which hopefully led to kissing. All right, Dylan returned. Let's get over to the guest house. I almost have the side-by-side -side packed up. So we're not taking this out to the far reaches of the ranch. Dylan secured her duffel to the rack on the back of the ATV and slung his leg over the seat and scooted as far forward as he could. When I go myself, I take it. But I can usually take everything I need in a backpack. There's two of us, and we're going about three times as long as I usually do, so... He shrugged and chin nodded to the microscopic space behind him. Climb on. This is a short ride, and then we won't have to cram. Oh, but Hazel liked cramming herself behind his body, squeezing in tight between him and the duffel bag, and wrapping her arms around his waist and holding on tight. He smelled like fresh air and masculine, spicy cologne, both scents that urged her to inch closer and breathe deeper. She liked it too much, but couldn't bring herself to ease back or loosen her grip. The wind grabbed her hair and spread it behind her as he turned and round and headed toward the big homestead. She laughed at the exhilaration coursing through her veins, thrilled at the chance to spend the next five days with this man, who had intrigued her since the moment she'd caught him twirling and whistling with a baby in his arms. Chapter 5 Dylan pulled up to the back of the guest house, parking almost alongside the hammock where he'd taken many naps. So I've got my bag already on the side-by-side. -side. He indicated the much larger all-terrain vehicle, this one with a front row of two bucket seats and a back row bench seat that could seat three more really skinny adults. It had a narrow trunk area where he'd already put his packs. He lifted her duffel and set it on top of his stuff, using a bungee cord to keep it tied down. There's food in the house. Felicity went all out. He grinned at Hazel, his heart doing a weird skipping beat in his chest. He'd never been more thankful for skin and shirts that kept his feelings hidden. He went up the steps and into the house, where Felicity was packing chocolate chip cookies into zipper bags. Hey, he said. You're still here. Dylan thought she'd be long gone by now. Stepping to the side, he added, This is Hazel Brewster, from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Hazel, this is Felicity, the owner of the ranch. You must be Dwayne's wife, Hazel said, moving past Dylan and giving him a dose of that iced peach tea perfume to shake Felicity's hand. The two women smiled at each other, and Felicity returned her attention to the food. All right, Dylan, she said with a long exhale. Sandwiches for today are in the cooler. Everything you need to make dinner and breakfast, she pointed to a huge blue cooler on the floor. We took the hot plate out already, and I've got bread, cookies, and drink mix in this box. She placed a zipper bag of cookies on top of what looked like a month's supply of bread. We'll be fine he told her, just like he had been for the past two days. 
But Felicity had always doted on him specifically, claiming he reminded her so much of her father. Dylan and Felicity had spent lots of time together right after she'd married Duane, sharing stories of their dads. Hers had been a gentleman, a gem in the heart of Texas. His had been less than that. Somehow the grief they each carried because of their fathers, though they were light years different, had united them. She turned toward him, a motherly look on her face, though she was only a few years older than Dylan. I know you will. You've just never gone for so long. She leaned over to hug him, and Dylan watched as Hazel took in the exchange, a small smile on her pretty mouth. You've got a radio, Felicity asked. Battery packs. Fuel for the generator. Yes, ma'am, Dylan said, clearing the emotion out of his voice. It sure was nice to have someone fuss over him. He hadn't had that in years, as Shane had done the best he could to keep the family together after their father's secrets and lies had come out. But he wasn't a mother, and Dylan had been starved for such attention for a long time. Radio in when you get there, she said. You want to grab that in at the cooler, Hazel, he said, his tongue tripping over her name. Hazel, Hazel. He wanted to say it to the stars, whispered in her ear while he drew in a deep breath of whatever minted lemon lotion she used that day, touch his lips to hers, and murmur her name into her mouth before really claiming it. Felicity nudged him with her elbow, and Dylan shook himself out of the insane fantasies playing through his mind. Hazel stood partially stooped over, her end of the cooler lifted in the air, while she stared at him expectantly. I'll follow you with this box, Felicity said. Dylan flew into motion, grabbing the remaining handle on the cooler and hoisting it up. He and Hazel put it on the floor in the back row, and Felicity placed the box on the bench seat. He took a quick inventory of things, making sure he wasn't leaving something important behind. They had enough food to feed themselves for two weeks instead of one. Extra blankets, fuel, their personal belongings and bags, the radio and battery pack, which sat in the holsters up front. I think that's everything, he said looking back and forth between Hazel and Felicity. All right, Felicity gave him another quick hug. Good luck out there. She turned and walked back into the guest house, leaving Dylan to gesture to the passenger seat. Hazel took her spot in the front next to him and pulled her seatbelt across her body. What are the chances of me driving this thing? Dylan paused in his own buckling up and lifted his eyes to hers. His vision tunneled to just her beautiful pixie face. Those liquid gold eyes drinking him in as thirstily as he did her. Y'all want to drive? He managed to push out through his too narrow throat. This woman did things to him he'd never experienced before and had no idea how to make sense of. Yeah, kinda. She lifted one shoulder in a shrug, the emerald green fabric bunching and then smoothing. With her tanned complexion and dark hair, the shirt added another layer of beauty to her that had Dylan barely able to keep his composure. Well, come on over here and drive then. He stepped out of the side-by-side -side and started around the front as she giggled and slid across from one bucket seat to the other. With them both buckled into the new seats, she started the vehicle and flashed him a grin the size of the entire state of Texas. Part of him thought it would be perfectly natural for him to reach across the tiny space between them and take her hand in his. But he didn't know how, and he barely knew more than her name, so he kept his hands on his own side of the vehicle. Which way? she asked. The side by side already pointed north, so he said, That away. I'll tell you where to go. He directed her across the field and onto the dirt paths between their hayfields. He narrated the things they passed, talking about the ranch in general, until they arrived at the cabin farthest from civilization. Here we are, he grinned at her. You're a great driver. In fact, it was one of the sexiest things Dylan had ever seen. Hazel was unlike any other woman he'd ever met, both as a teenager and as an adult. He dated a few women from town, but none of them wore hiking boots, jeans, and cowgirl hats. None of them listened to him talk about abandoned peach orchards, crops, horses, and fence lines the way Hazel did. Not only had she listened, she'd asked questions, seemed genuinely interested, and mentioned a few things about another ranch she'd been on. So he said as they took their bags inside. Where are you from? Alabama, she said, making her accent thicker. Can't you tell? She gave him that flirty smile that was starting to grow on him. I knew y'all wasn't from Texas. He moved toward the two doors to the left of the front room. So there's two bedrooms here, 
You can pick which one you want. They have the same beds in them. Bathroom there. He indicated the door in the middle. Lots of places to sit. He glanced around at the couches. No TV, no radio, no Wi-Fi, he said. But I'll get the generator going, and we'll plug in the fridge and be able to use a hot plate for the week. There's running water. She opened the bathroom door and peeked in. Oh, there is. Yeah, there was a well here, he said. So it's all well water. That's why Felicity sent the tablets and the drink mix. I usually drink bottled water when I come out here. How often do you come out here? Oh, every few days. I might stay for one night or two. He wanted to tell her he'd live out here if he could, if he didn't think he'd be too lonely, if he really could survive on protein bars and bottled water. She stepped to the bedroom at the back of the house. I'll set up in here. But she didn't go in. Only tossed her duffel bag inside and closed the door again. She faced the rest of the cabin and tucked her hands in her back pockets. This place is really nice for a cabin on the edge of a ranch. Dylan copied her by placing his bag just inside the room where he'd be sleeping. Thanks. I've done a lot of work on it. Oh, yeah? Her eyes scanned the ceilings, the curtains, the small kitchen in the corner. Yeah. Pride tiptoed through him. I resanded the floors and stained them. They were a mess before. They're beautiful. Hazel actually crouched down and ran her fingers along the wood he'd spent hours taming and then beautifying. I bought some curtains and hung those. I put on all the couch covers. Dylan shrugged and told himself to stop talking. She didn't need to listen to him brag about sprucing up a cabin no one came to but him. He hooked his thumb over his shoulder and said, I'll go get the generator going. I'll come. She shadowed him as he filled the generator with fuel and gave the pull a mite tug to get it running. It sputtered and didn't start. His heart did the same, stuttering in his chest. Without a refrigerator or a hot plate, they'd be eating plain bread and cookies for a week. The engine finally caught on the fourth pull, and relief cascaded through Dylan with the power of a waterfall. Phew! He swiped his hat off and wiped his hands across his forehead. A nervous chuckle took the remaining anxiety with him, and he met Hazel's gaze again. That same narrowing feeling happened again. There was no generator, no sun beaming through the window at his back, no worries, cares, or problems. Just her and him, and this moment. She reached up and brushed her fingers through the hair above his right ear, sending shockwaves through his whole body. Instead of blushing and dropping her hand, then muttering something and running away, Hazel trailed her hand down his arm and settled her weight on her back foot. Her hand dropped back to her side, and still she hadn't acted awkwardly. She had more confidence than anyone Dylan had ever known, and he felt miles out of her league. He cleared his throat. Okay, so now we have power. Or we should. Let's go find out. In the kitchen, he plugged in the refrigerator, glad when the hum of it started to fill the room. He grinned. It's like magic. Magic, she repeated, plugging in the hot plate and twisting the dial. Everything works here. She switched it off again. Great. Let's get everything in then. They brought in all the food and began unpacking it onto the counter and into the fridge. So Shane's your older brother, Hazel said. Is Austin older or younger than you? The fact that she'd remembered their names when he'd spoken them only a couple of times amazed him. Austin's younger than me. Ah, the middle child. She shot him a smile as she put a huge jar of peanut butter next to the loaves of bread. Yep. And Dylan had hated it, for the most part. Sometimes mom would call me Shane, then Austin, then Shane again before getting my name right. And that was the truth. He knew now that she hadn't done it on purpose, but he'd felt overlooked for most of his life. Being the oldest isn't all that fun either, she said, especially when you've got four brothers that come after you. Dylan finished putting the lunch meat and cheese in the fridge. Wow, four younger brothers, no sisters. None, so guess he spent her whole life babysitting. Hazel's eyebrows went up, and a flickering fire entered her eyes. Hey, at least everything you do is probably the best, the most, the absolutely right thing to do. She tipped her head back and rewarded him with that delightful laugh he'd wanted to be privy to. Right, she said with joy and sarcasm in her voice. I think my mother would disagree about that. Dylan liked this back and forth, this banter, this conversation. Are they all still in Alabama? Yeah. My family owns a carpet cleaning business in Birmingham. 
Marshall, the oldest brother, went to school and got a business management degree. He even became an accountant and does a bunch of that for the company. Gideon is a foreman of five crews. Sean is a mechanic for our vans and machinery. My mom runs the office, answers phones, does payrolls, billing, all that administrative stuff. And you're a mammologist. I actually went to beauty school first. Hazel's expression became hooded, and Dylan sensed more to that story. He wondered when he could push for it. Oh, yeah? He asked. Hair, nails, and makeup, and that kind of stuff. Just hair, she said. I do a few ladies in town now, but I used to have a salon in my house. Dylan finished unpacking the cooler and leaned against the counter to face her fully. Why'd you stop? She swallowed. The first sign of nerves from her Dylan had seen. It's a long story. She flashed a falsely bright smile. I'll tell it later. Short version is, I went back to school to finish my wildlife management degree, and I got a job with Texas Parks. So this is what I do now. That was a really short version, Dylan said, surprised at the quality of teasing and flirtation in his voice. What about you? She slid the now empty box into the corner of the counter. Cowboy forever and all that. Something like that, Dylan said, realizing he had several long stories of his own. So what brought you to Grapeseed Ranch? She asked. All three of you. Seems like you'd have a ranch or farm of your own to tend. It would seem that way, he said. It's a long story. He grinned at her and folded his arms, hoping the sparkly feeling dancing through him showed in his eyes. She slapped at his bicep. I see how it is. It's a long week, he said. I'm sure I'll tell it by Friday, but only if you tell me yours. He watched her wrestle with something in her mind, and then she finally nodded. Yeah, all right, by Friday. Chapter Six Hazel threw down the five dice, making a big show of spreading her arms wide as they clattered around on a table before coming to a stop. I can't believe it. Dylan threw his pencil down in disgust as Hazel's eyes skittered from die to die. She burst out laughing. Yahtzee! It was the only score she didn't have on her card, and honestly, she couldn't believe it either. But all five dice had three black dots on them. On the last roll, Dylan shook his head, his handsome face a picture of perfection with that straight smile and gleaming white teeth. Hazel giggled as she wrote in the score and totaled her sheet. Okay, mister. The score to beat is 298 points. She sat back, proud of herself for the score, but for making casual touches of her hand against his during the game, her flirtation game on point this afternoon. He collected the dice with an exaggerated sigh. I don't see how I can beat that, he said. I need a Yahtzee for sure. And he hadn't gotten one yet. They'd unpacked and made turkey and cheese sandwiches for lunch. There had been barbecue chips, Dylan's favorite she'd learned, and cheese puffs, along with those delicious homemade chocolate chip cookies. He'd taken her for a ride along the fence line, and they'd seen no breaks, no damage, nothing. They checked the herd and found nothing out of sorts there either. So, back at the cabin, Dylan had produced a stack of board games, card games, puzzles, and coloring books. This is what we do without electricity, he said. Does it get dark out here? Super dark, he'd said. But with it almost being May, it won't get dark until about eight, and we've got candles. The thought of sitting beside him on one of those long couches in the cabin, maybe curling into his chest with candlelight as a background, had Hazel thinking all kinds of romantic thoughts. He tossed the dice, bringing her back to the game at hand. Twos, she said, pointing to the three he'd rolled. She didn't like it when someone touched her dice during the game, so she didn't touch his. He slid the twos together and picked up the remaining dice. Wouldn't this be wild if I got it? Their eyes met, and that same charge had been flowing between them all day kicked in again. She smiled at him, no flirt this time. He returned it, and Hazel wondered if she really could have a genuine relationship with a man. After Peter, she'd vow she'd never even try again. But six years had gone by, and Dylan didn't seem like a heartbreaker. They never do, she told herself as he rattled the dice in his red cup. He threw them out and they rolled. One two and one six. Only one more, he said. One more roll, too. She leaned away from the table as if she didn't care if she won or not. She didn't really, but she kind of did. 
He lifted his hat and wiped his forehead as if he were really sweating to get this last dye to become a two. The ghost of his hair along her fingertips made her twitch. She'd been slightly mortified by her actions in the mudroom, reaching out to touch him so intimately without being invited. He'd frozen, a look of awe on his face she didn't quite understand. Embarrassment had coiled in her stomach, but she'd refused to be ashamed or awkward. She wanted to touch him, feel his hair. So she had. Maybe she'd given him the very clear hint that she was interested in him, as if the flirting hadn't done that job. Still, sometimes cowboys could be a little dense, and while Dylan seemed as sharp as attack, she hoped her interest was well known by now. He rolled again, a three, and groaned. You won. He didn't even bother to tally his score before he stood. Wanna go for a walk? Sure. She left her pencil and paper with the dice and moved with him out the side door. That was really fun. I haven't played Yahtzee since I was a kid. Yeah, me either. What do you do when you come out here alone? He cut her a glance out of the corner of his eye. Promise you won't laugh. Oh, I can't make that promise. I like to laugh. I've noticed. He dipped his chin when he said it, his own smile carving across his face. I work on the cabin a lot, and I sketch. People and dogs, mostly. The dog I want, I mean, a dog. Hazel put her hand on Dylan's forearm, causing him to stop. Why would I laugh at that? His blazing blue eyes seared right into her. He was so handsome, so vulnerable in that moment. My dad never liked it when I drew. Said nothing would come of it, and I should spend my time doing something that mattered. Hazel blinked, surprised that his father would say such a thing. Dylan, wow. I, I do all kinds of things just for enjoyment. I guess sketching is like that for you. She started walking again, glad when he came with her. Not glad when he kept his gaze on the ground and tucked his hands away into his pockets. Yeah, he said. It's a good release. I only sketch out here. My brothers don't even know about it. Hazel tucked her hand into the crook of Dylan's arm, lacing her fingers together and matching her stride to his, step for slow step. Why haven't you told them? He shrugged. I don't know. She thought he did, but she didn't push him. They'd made a pact to share long stories by Friday, and it wasn't even Monday evening yet. What kind of dogs do you sketch? I want a German Shepherd, he said, but the animal shelter never has any. He exhaled. I'll probably have to buy one. I've got two English bulldogs, she said. Monty and Milo. One's brown and white, the other black and white. She turned her face fully toward the sun, enjoying the warmth on her skin. They are the best. Who's taking care of them this week? He asked. Oh, I've got them over at my friend Jason's. He's always begging to take them, and he lets them sleep on the bed with him, so... She gave a light laugh. He owns the ice cream shop. Maybe you know him. I don't get into town all that often, Dylan said. But I have been to the ice cream shop. Can't say I'd be able to pick him out or anything. We go to the church on Alberta Street, she said. We, Dylan repeated. Is he your boyfriend? Hazel tightened her arm against Dylan's, practically bumping into him with her hip. You think I'd be clinging to you like this if Jason was my boyfriend? I have no idea, he said. Slightly stung, Hazel released his arm and put a foot of distance between them. He's not my boyfriend. Do you have a boyfriend? No. He extricated his hand and caught hers on the next swing. Great. He squeezed her fingers and she turned to catch him smiling. You're a piece of work. Covering my bases, he said. Fact finding. That too. Jason has a girlfriend. Good for Jason. Do you have a girlfriend? Do you think I'd be holding your hand if I did? I have no idea, she said dryly. Dylan half scoffed, half snorted, and then he let himself laugh. Sure, he chuckled before, a little bit, but nothing like this wide, open sound coming from his throat. Hazel gazed at him in wonder, and he sobered quickly. You don't laugh very often, do you? She asked. He cleared his throat, a flesh staining his neck in an adorable way. I suppose not. It's the best medicine. Although, she had gone through several months after Peter's departure from her life, where Hazel feared she'd never laugh again. Yeah? he asked. You speaking from experience? Of course, she said. 
It's part of the beauty school story. They took a few steps together, the wild breeze whispering among the tall grasses out here. I was thinking that was a happy story, he said. She squeezed his hand and bumped him with her hip. Getting happier every day. So I'm pretty useless in the kitchen, he said as a plume of smoke came out of the frying pan. Felicity said this would be easy. Hazel giggled and got up from the counter where she'd been watching him struggle to cook hamburgers for the past few minutes. He glanced at her helplessly, and she liked this flustered version of Dylan Royal as much as she liked the calm, cool, collected version and the vulnerable version. The cowboy version was pretty sexy, too, and the game-playing version. Let me. She nudged him back and slipped the spatula under the first burger and flipped it. The heat's too high. Fiddling with the knob, she tried to get it to cool down. It seemed to have one temperature, hot. She lifted the pan off the burner to try to get it to cool a little, but she wasn't sure it did anything. The burgers weren't too seared, but she figured the pan was hot enough to finish cooking the meat. So she flipped off the hot plate and set the pan on the counter. So we've got buns, burgers, and all the fixins. She took stock of the tomatoes he'd cut and the cheese he'd laid out. She grabbed a few slices and laid them over the burgers in the pan. And chips he said, reaching up into a high cabinet to pull down the bag they'd gotten out for lunch. She reached into the bag and grabbed a barbecue chip and popped into her mouth. She managed to chew and swallow before diving for a bottle of water. Okay, yeah, no, I don't see how you like those. They're great. He took a whole handful and started chowing down. So are the burgers ready? Yes. She spun away from the movement of his mouth. Yes, they're ready. They sat side by side at the counter and ate, the small talk between them easy and casual. After dinner, he handed her a flashlight, shouldered a shotgun, and said, Let's go get your case study started. I really hope it's not a wolf, she said, eyeing the weapon. And you're not going to shoot it. I don't go traipsing around in the dark without protection, he said, his voice on the cusp of dangerous. Why are you hoping it's not a wolf? Yeah, Remember how I said there were no wolves in Texas? If there are, it'll be a major big deal. She shrugged into her windbreaker and accepted the flashlight he still extended toward her. So what do you think it is? I don't know. She pulled open the door and stepped into the twilight. The air had taken on a bite, and she took a few moments away from the cabin to breathe in the freedom of this place. It's beautiful, she whispered as if speaking aloud would shatter the pinpricks of lights as the stars started to become visible in the night sky. Dylan stepped next to her. Now you see why I come out here every week. She switched her attention from the beauty of the heavens to the beautiful man beside her. It would be so easy to kiss him, right here, right now. She wondered if she could. Better not chance it, she told herself. If it was awkward or too forward, she still had to be out here with him for the rest of the week. So which way? She asked instead. I found the most casualties this way. He led her east from the cabin and the further they went, the less beautiful the landscape became. Being outside, under the huge sky, with little for protection left Hazel feeling more vulnerable than she'd like to admit. She was suddenly glad Dylan had some way to protect them, should they need it, especially as a shiver ran down her spine. She switched on her flashlight so she wouldn't accidentally step into a hole and break an ankle. She thought about telling Dylan about Peter right now, when it was too dim for him to see her face. She pushed the idea out of her mind. She'd known him for only a few days, and while she liked everything she'd seen and heard, besides the smoky hamburgers, she kept her mouth shut. Whoa, he whispered, throwing his arm out to stop her. Lights off. He snapped off in the next moment, and she hurried to do the same. What? She hissed, searching the area in front of her then to her left where the fence sat. Without the bright flashlight beams, her eyes took a few moments to adjust to only the moonlight. Dylan moved slowly, inch by inch, with so much control she couldn't believe it. His arms came around her, causing a completely new kind of shiver. Right there, two pairs of eyes. He spoke so low, it was more of a rumble from his chest to hers as he eased behind her slightly. The arm he'd slid around her came up under hers and pointed at about ten o'clock. She searched the horizon for any hint of what he was talking about. The light of the moon was just bright enough to catch on the reflective eyes, but she couldn't see them. 
Just when she was about to ask, she caught the movement. Coyotes, she whispered. And there were more than two now. Four, five that Hazel could see. They prowled the perimeter of the fence, and they were bigger than any coyote she'd ever seen in her work outside of Austin. She pulled out the camera that had a wide open aperture and a long shutter speed, hoping the last of the light would be enough to capture the coyotes. The clicking of the camera became the only sound as the Canis Latrans glared at the Homo sapiens, a simple ten-foot fence between them. It was exciting and exhilarating and horrifying all at the same time. She lowered herself to the ground and watched. Do they break through the fences? Yeah. Dylan sank to the ground beside her. You think they're getting the cattle at night? I think so, yeah. Only one coyote prowled the fence line, and Hazel watched him. This is odd she said, leaning closer to Dylan so she didn't have to speak too loudly. Which part? Coyotes don't generally hunt in packs, she said. Pairs, maybe. And way out here? Why don't they come during the day? I mean, night hunting is what they usually do in more populated areas. They probably can't take our steers down by themselves, he said. Or with a partner. They need a pack. Hey, Bright's out here, she said, leaning into his body and wishing his arm was around her again. What's that? he asked. They're not wolves. She turned to smile at him before focusing on the coyotes again. She shifted, and somehow God granted wishes, because Dylan lifted his arm and placed it around her shoulder. She leaned further in. This is okay? he asked, that sexy rumble making all her cells come alive. Absolutely a-okay, she said, laying her head against his chest and keeping her eyes on that pacing coyote. Chapter 7 Dylan could have held Hazel in his arms forever. Number one, it meant the raging heat between them wasn't just coiling through his bloodstream, but hers too. Number two, she smelled like everything he loved. Grass and sunshine, sweat and horse and leather. Oh, and that peachy scent kept drifting from her hair too. So this is what you do, he asked. Sit in the grass and watch coyotes pace. We'll see where they show up every night and morning. See how brazen they are with us right here. Then we'll tag them by the end of the week. All of them? Just the big one, I think, she said. He's clearly the leader. He was a magnificent animal with a big bushy head and a black tipped tail he kept tucked low. Of course, Dylan could just as easily shoot the animal if it weren't for Hazel. Not that he'd enjoy it, but his loyalty was with the cattle on Grapeseed Ranch not a pack of coyotes on the other side of the fence. What do you do once they're tagged? We monitor the GPS signal. Come out and see where they're living. While they can't find food they need outside the ranch, they make determinations on relocation from there. She lifted one shoulder, which slightly pressed into his chest. It doesn't take long to know. Another week, perhaps. Hmm. Dylan didn't normally sit down when he went out at night, and a restlessness tortured him. She would go check the cattle. You think the coyotes have already been over the fence? They go under, he said, or through. All right, technicality. She gave a light laugh as she stood and brushed off her pants. Dylan left his gun on the ground as he stood, only shouldering it once he was ready to start walking. I just want to check them. It was what he did. His responsibility was to make sure the fences stayed intact surrounding the ranch, report problems, and check the herd while it grazed in the wild. He couldn't keep them away from this particular section of fence, but he'd noticed they'd moved further west since the slaughter a week or so ago. It's a long walk, he said. Maybe a mile in the dark. You up for it? Do you normally walk it? Not usually, no. He didn't care either way how they got there. He just wanted to make sure his cows were safe. We can drive. You can be my chauffeur. She tucked her arm into his again, and he smiled into the night. Sure can. He put the shotgun in the back of the side-by-side -side and got behind the wheel. When they were both buckled, he eased the vehicle along the fence, heading west. He found the cows further south than they'd been last time he'd been out here, but the night air was clean. No scent of blood, no skin of worry, no sense of unease. Looks good, he said, swinging around to go back. His headlights caught on a reflective pair of eyes, and he slammed his foot on the brake. Did you see that? I sure did. Her voice hovered halfway between terrified and awed. Dylan's heart thrashed in his chest, definitely leaning toward terrified. That wasn't a coyote. 
He put the side by side in reverse and inched it slowly back the way he'd come. Sure enough, the lamps illuminated a very feline pair of eyes, which shone like green orbs in the night. That's a mountain lion. And his gun was in the back seat, out of arm's reach. He kicked himself for letting his guard down, for thinking this was a romantic tryst when it was a very serious ranch situation. The cougar remained very still, despite the lights shining right on it. That's what took down those cows, Hazel said. We have to tag it. You didn't bring anything, did you? Of course I did. Two darts. One tag. When she was concealing that equipment, he didn't know, but he heard clicking as she prepared her dart gun. Can you get closer to it? We're a hundred yards away, he said. If it wanted to go through that fence, it could. I don't think closer is wise. I can't dart it through the chicken wire anyway. I mean, maybe if I was a better shot. Dylan looked at her and found her hands shaking, so she wouldn't be able to hit the mountain line through the one-inch holes in the chicken wire, and she probably wouldn't be able to hit it unless it was right in front of her, teeth bared. Should we switch? He asked. I can try to dart it. You can drive. Yeah, okay. She nodded, handing him the dart gun and sliding over on the seat before he could even unbuckle. He kept his eye on the wild animal, a very large, very deadly wild animal, as he rounded the side by side. Go slow, he said, only settling himself half into the vehicle. Real slow. Hazel obliged, barely inching the vehicle forward. The darts don't go super far, she whispered. Maybe twenty yards. Dylan nodded, though they didn't look at each other. He wasn't giving anything or anyone his attention until that cat was asleep or gone. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Hazel hunch forward, both hands gripping the wheel like it was her lifeline. The cat hissed and crouched low in the grasses. Easy, Dylan said, trying to get a grip on the dark gun in his hand. It felt like a toy, like no way he could incapacitate the 120-pound animal with it. He held his arm out in front of him, steadying the gun in his right hand with his left, the way his father had taught him to shoot a revolver. Just like that, he coached himself. The gun had a sight too, but the animal really wasn't showing much of himself. Just his face and a couple of bony shoulders. Dylan aimed in the shoulder area as Hazel moved them closer foot by foot. His muscles ached. He took in a deep breath and held it, whispered, All right. Hazel brought the vehicle to a stop, and Dylan pulled the trigger. The mountain lion yowled, and he sent the other dart at it too. He had no idea if he hit his mark or not. The cougar disappeared from the headlight beams, and Dylan slumped against the seat. Well, he exhaled, how do we know if we got it? We go looking, Hazel said, and the sleepers only last three hours. So they couldn't wait until morning. Maybe we should have waited until it was light, he said. There was no guarantee that we'd ever see that mountain lion again, she said. We did the right thing. She relaxed her grip on the steering wheel and blew out her breath. So let's go find it. She turned and their eyes finally met. A slow grin cascaded across her delicate features, and Dylan found himself returning it. There's never a dull moment with you, is there? She asked. He chuckled because he was anything but exciting. Just wait, he said. There's a birthday party for Greta this weekend. Her eyebrows bunched together in cute confusion. Greta? Gonna be a real barn raiser, Dylan said, standing and peering into the darkness beyond the fence. He met Hazel near the driver's side. After all, a baby's first birthday is usually a riot. An hour later, Hazel said, right there. Dylan swung the vehicle in the direction of her finger, and sure enough, there was a mass holding down the grass. He stopped a healthy distance away, the cougar in the direct line of his headlights. Is it safe? I'd say so, she said. He made it pretty far, but he's down now. Dylan got out of the side-by-side, -side, adjusting the shotgun he'd been wearing since firing the dart gun. He didn't want to take any chances with his life, nor Hazel's. She hadn't questioned the presence of the weapon again, and he led the way, the gun poised and ready to shoot. A low growl filled the air, and he stopped short. It's snoring, she whispered. She unzipped something and went to go around him. Hazel, he reprimanded. It's fine, she said. It's out cold, but it could wake at any time. Let's move fast. Dylan didn't know what needed to be done, 
so he stood over the cougar with the gun pointed at it while she made short work of a patch of hair on its shoulder. She fitted something into what looked like a tube with a flat end, and she held it right against the animal's shoulder and leaned into it with all her weight as she depressed a trigger. She grunted, and the cougar's arm flinched a little. She straightened back up fast, saying, Done, in a slightly triumphant tone. Dylan stared at her. That was... He knew he wanted to say, hot, but he felt like it would be inappropriate. Incredible. She was incredible. She'd gotten right up to that cougar in a sleep or not. His heart was still pounding in fear and anticipation. He don't want to be here when it wakes up. She gestured for him to step away. Oh, and it's a girl. Could be a mama or something. Dylan hurried back to the vehicle with her, but he didn't put the gun in the back. Well, we don't want her teaching her cubs how to destroy our fences and take down our cows. No, Hazel murmured. We don't. Back at the cabin, she paced from one door diagonally to the other. I can't believe it, she kept saying. Now that the adrenaline had worn off and they were safe, Dylan had crashed on the couch he liked best, third from the front. Hazel, on the other hand, seemed more hyped than ever. I mean, a real cougar sighting right here in Gillespie County. She ran her fingers through her hair, pushing it away from her face. It's unbelievable. There have been cougar sightings here before, he said, closing his eyes as he leaned his head back. It was only ten o'clock. But considering that his day started before the sun rose, his exhaustion was normal. Suppose sightings, she said. We got pictures and actually put a tracker on one. The couch cushions jostled as she sank next to him. Thank you. Her hand trailed over his, and he jerked his eyes open. Thank you. For what? for letting me come out here with you. Her dark honey eyes sparkled with heat, with mischief, with excitement. Maybe all three, he wasn't sure. I just put a tracker on a cougar. A laugh slipped from her mouth, and Dylan wanted to kiss those lips as strongly now as he ever had. Are you gonna call it in? She asked. In the morning, he said, closing his eyes again. Cowboys go to bed early, sweetheart. She lifted his arm and snuggled into his side. Is that so? Yes, ma'am, he murmured, the shape of her beside him welcome and comforting. Oh, all right, she said, her voice softening. What time do we get up? I think the herd will be all right, he said, so we probably don't need to be out there at dawn to see what's been attacking them. Still could be coyotes, her tone suggested she was coming off her high. Could be. She cuddled closer, and Dylan gripped her shoulder to keep her there happy to share this cabin with her when company usually bothered him. Her breathing evened before his did, and he silently pressed his lips to the top of her head, hoping to be able to share a real kiss with her very, very soon. Then he dreamt of cougars, coyotes, and Hazel's liquid gold eyes. Chapter 8 Hazel woke, a distinct sound in her ears that she struggled to place. She sat up, the cot beneath her foreign but comfortable. She hadn't fallen asleep here, however, and as she cocked her head to catch the sound she'd heard, a soft memory of being carried in Dylan's strong arms and tucked into bed flitted through her mind. He hadn't been inappropriate. Just covered her up and snuck out the door the same way he'd come in. Music. She swung her legs over the side of the cot, still dressed in yesterday's clothes. She didn't want to take time to shower or change, not yet, because Dylan was somewhere nearby strumming a guitar. She found him on the front steps, a guitar balanced on his knees, his fingers moving mindlessly while he gazed out into the dawn. Hey, she sank to the step beside him, stifling a yawn. I thought we weren't getting up at dawn. Have it, he said, giving her a lazy look that formed into a smile. Did you sleep on the couch all night? She asked, though she knew he'd carried her into the bedroom. I like that couch. His fingers stilled. Didn't see any coyotes this morning. You've been out already. Just down about half a mile and back. Hazel spotted the gun standing up against the railing beside him. We will need to tag at least one of them. They could be your poachers over the past year. It's definitely the mountain lion that's taken the casualties to the next level, though. She followed his gaze out to the countryside, struck again with the beauty of this land. They sat for a few minutes, the song he plucked an underlying accompaniment to their silence, until he said, I called it in to Duane and Felicity already. That's good, 
she exhaled and wrapped her arms around her knees. So what's on the docket for today? His fingers stilled. I was thinking story time today. Oh, yeah? She gave him a coy smile, though a slight tremor ran through her core. It's only Tuesday. Doesn't have to be a long one, he said. Then I'll even start. Relief spread over her anxiety. I like the sound of that even better. After all, she didn't have a whole lot of stories beside the really long one. Mine's about baby Greta. His voice softened, and Hazel relaxed even further. She'd already seen the evidence of his love for the little girl. It was a bit odd for a tall, tough cowboy like him to be cooing with the baby, so Hazel's interest had been piqued. I've never considered myself a big baby guy, he said. But when we went to see her in May in the hospital, there was just something about that dark-haired human that captured my heart. He spoke with a soft passion that tickled her eardrums and made her feel warm. So I babysit for them every chance I get, and I like to think I'm Greta's third favorite person. Hazel wanted to hold his hand, but with the guitar in the way, she couldn't. So you want kids? Oh yeah, loads of kids. He cut a look at her out of the corner of his eye and started plucking again. Maybe it's because I only have brothers, but I just love that little girl. Hazel wanted kids too, but at age 37, she wondered how many she could feasibly have. Certainly not loads. That's a nice story, she said. He cleared his throat. Okay, your turn. Hazel's mind blanked, except for the one name she didn't want to speak. Peter. I don't really have any stories. Sure you do. He looked fully at her, but she couldn't bring herself to meet his gaze. Sure she'd blurt out what she didn't want to talk about quite yet. What do you do when you're not at work? I clearly dance around with babies, so you'll have to beat that. A giggle started in her throat, and she let it turn into a laugh that went well with his music. All right, she said. So I do a few old ladies' hair every month. It's fun to sit and visit with them. Old ladies, huh? That's almost as bad as babies. Just on the other end of the spectrum, Hazel said. I like listening to them talk about their kids, their lives, their husbands. Everything she didn't have, she realized in that moment. She drew in a deep breath, trying to find the bravery to continue. And I'm not doing that. I like spending time with Jason and Michaela, my two best friends, eating ice cream and planning their future together. Again, a future that wasn't hers. Hazel hadn't realized just how futureless she was, how little she really had in her life. And you like your job? He asked. Oh yeah, definitely, love my job. So friends, ice cream, old ladies, and wildlife management. Well, I've never had my life summed up in four things before. She wasn't sure she liked it, especially those four things. I call my mom every week too, she said. I'm so close with my family, though I left Alabama. So we can add family and Texas to the list, he said. I think you said you loved Texas. I do love Texas. She smiled, still thinking she should have more important things on her list. What's on your list? My brothers, my mom, my ranch family, Greta, of course. This cabin, I suppose. He shrugged. Do y'all have a horse? Not one of my own, he said. His fingers stilled. No house, no ranch, none of that. And no dog either, she teased, hoping to erase the low vein of danger that had entered his voice. Not really danger. Sadness? Regret? Anger? Maybe all of the above. He chuckled thankfully. Wow, my life is really pathetic. No, oh, I don't think so. She listened to the breeze pull its way through the grasses for a few seconds. I think it's simple, like mine. She liked simple. It was safe. She knew what each day would bring, and she liked the routine of her life. Simple, huh? And simple is good? He seemed to be genuinely asking. I don't think it's bad. She looked at him and found a frown creasing his eyebrows. But since I have my own house and two dogs, I clearly win. Dylan's dark blue eyes widened, and he opened his mouth to say something, then snapped it shut again. He went back to plucking cords. Can't argue with that, I suppose. She'd hoped he'd start singing along with the music he produced, but he didn't. Instead, he whistled, the notes weaving in and around the vibrations from the guitar strings, 
in a way that made a sense of peace and comfort envelop Hazel in a lazy movement. It was a simple way to spend time together, guitar and whistling and a few easy stories. Hazel couldn't remember the last time she'd enjoyed a morning quite so much, and holding his hand was the only thing that would have made it better. After he filled the cabin and the entire countryside with the scent of burnt eggs, Hazel declared herself the cook for the rest of the week. It was nice to know that Dylan had a flaw, and while she wasn't the greatest in the kitchen, she knew how to scramble eggs and fry sausages, whereas he clearly did not. She showered, changed, and found him sitting at the kitchen table, coloring. Surprise pulled her mouth into a smile. He was so childlike in such a refreshing way, and she joined him. Who's the last woman you dated? she asked. His green-colored pencil stuttered and snapped as he yanked his eyes to hers. I thought story time was over. Hazel simply couldn't imagine what kind of woman he'd date, and she wanted to know. I've never met a man who colors. She examined the intricate pattern he'd been working on, this coloring book more than cartoon characters. It's extremely relaxing, he said, pushing the box of colored pencils toward her. There are three more in that stack. He nodded toward the games, puzzles, and the books at the other end of the table. She got up to go through the pile, because they were clearly onto the indoor activity portion of the day. Do you ever take your cowboy hat off? She asked as she sifted through her options. Sunlight streamed through the windows, a reminder that she should be glad their work only took them outside when it wasn't quite so hot. His hat landed on the table, sliding down until it hit a pile of games she'd already set aside. Sure I do. She twisted to look at him, taking her time to drink in his appearance without that sensual hat. I like you both ways. His eyes widened, and Hazel pressed her eyes closed. I mean, what I meant was, she cut off, hoping he'd save her, or that the floor would open up and swallow her, or that she'd go mute. Dylan said nothing, and the scratch of his pencil didn't sound. She looked at him, her face flaming with heat. A smile tugged at the edges of his mouth, and without the hat, he was so handsome her breath stuck somewhere in her lungs. What did you mean? He asked, leaning back and folding his arms across his broad chest. Sometimes I speak without thinking, she said, going back to the puzzles and deciding to lay it all on the line. But I don't think it's a secret I find you attractive. She selected a puzzle that depicted Texas Hill Country and returned to the chair next to him. Is it? Hazel met his eye, never one to be afraid of talking about how she felt. Dylan swallowed, clearly not as experienced as her at speaking without thinking. She reached over and curled her hand around his. Is it? No. The word caught in his throat. Do you find me attractive? She released his hand and lifted the lid on the puzzle box. Yes. A blush heated her face. All right, then. Do you want to keep coloring, or do you want to help me with this puzzle? The coyotes didn't show up that evening, nor the next morning or evening. Hazel enjoyed spending time with Dylan out in the middle of nowhere, but by the time Thursday dawned, she wasn't sure how many more board games she could play or how many more puzzles they could put together. Plus, she hadn't said a word about beauty school, her wildlife management degree, or Peter. Dylan hadn't revealed anything about why he didn't have a ranch, a horse, a dog, or a house of his own. Today's the day, she whispered to herself as she silenced her alarm. Dylan seemed to have an internal alarm that woke with him at five o'clock each morning, and she'd been using her phone so she could get up with him each morning. The half-mile walk to where they'd spotted the coyotes that first night was invigorating the first thing in the morning, with yesterday's clothes on and her hand secured in Dylan's. He didn't always have a whole lot to say, and Hazel didn't mind telling him things about her friends, her job, or her family back in Alabama. They hadn't spoken about their relationship and what might happen to it once they returned to normal life. They hadn't tagged the big coyote yet, and time was running out on that. And the thread of those long stories hung over them as they set out on their walk. He kept the gun on the side away from her, and she fiddled with her zipper pack, wondering when he'd take her hand and make everything normal between them. When he didn't, she knew he was all wrapped up inside his mind, too. Okay, she said, drawing in a deep breath of the cooler morning air. I'm going to start my long story now. All right, he murmured. She stepped, and stepped again, and then again. She hadn't told anyone this story who hadn't lived through it with her. And even with Jason and Michaela, she didn't allow them to bring it up, hash it out, help her past it. 
The ground went by and they approached the area where they'd stop and go back, and Hazel still couldn't speak. Chapter Nine. We used to own a ranch near San Antonio, he said when Hazel had been silent for almost five minutes. He hadn't planned on telling her the depths of his pathetic life after they'd made their lists a few days ago. He figured simple meant boring, and while Hazel still seemed keen to hold his hand, laugh with him while they played childish board games and talk about her life, Dylan was sure as soon as they got back to civilization, the spark between them would fizzle. After all, what did he have to offer a woman like her? No college degree, no home, no ranch, not even a horse or a dog. About halfway between the city and Bernie, he said, his mind flowing back to the wonderful childhood he'd had, at least up until he was confronted with the ugly truth about his father. It was a great ranch. Shane, my oldest brother, had been working it as an adult for a few years. All us boys worked it from the time we learned how to walk. He kept his eyes scanning, but it was easy to fall back into the memories of family game nights, the way his mother quoted the Bible to him every time he got in trouble at school, and how his father could tame any horse into the best animal in the world. Now he sat behind a desk, with a new wife at home, with an occasional text to the three sons he'd abandoned. Dylan wondered if his dad ever thought about the royal ranch he'd left half a million dollars in debt. Did he miss the homestead? With its new hardwood floors, he'd spent a month teaching Dylan how to install, sand, and finish. Did he miss the time he spent outside, under this gorgeous Texas sky, with his horses following him around like puppies? Did he ever think he'd made a mistake? If he thought any of those things, Dylan didn't know about them. He'd been 18 when life as he knew it had crashed and burned, and he said, My dad made a lot of bad decisions. Terrible mistakes. Our family broke up. My mom lives in a condo in San Antonio now and works as secretary in a doctor's office. Shane kept the three of us together, and we worked at a neighboring ranch while everything was sorted out with the bankruptcy, the divorce, and the sale of everything we had to pay my dad's debts. Hazel sucked in a breath but otherwise said nothing. Dylan gathered his courage close, reminding himself that these weren't his mistakes, his terrible decisions. We lost everything we'd spent our lives working for, he said. We landed at Grapeseed Ranch about four years ago. Four and a half, something like that. Shane's a co-former now, and if he ever gets up the nerve to propose to his girlfriend, he'll move out of our cabin and into our tiny house. He drew in a breath, suddenly glad to be talking about this. Not everyone can have a big house, Hazel said. Dylan chuckled, finally reaching for her hand and squeezing her fingers as their palms met. No, she really lives in a tiny house one of those that you can hook up to a truck and tow it behind you. She's got it parked on a patch of land over by the Rhodes' peach orchards. Oh, interesting. It is interesting, he said. She's a minimalist, produces very little trash, that kind of thing. He liked Robin a lot. She'd always been kind to him, and she had a great sense of humor. Not only that, but she was absolutely perfect for Shane, who changed drastically in the years since he and Robin started dating. So, Dylan exhaled, I have no ranch of my own. They're expensive, as I'm sure you can imagine. I live on site, because room and board is included in my pay. We lost our horses, our land, our dad. His emotions choked him, and he hated that they'd snuck up on him like that. Most of the time, he didn't miss his father. Only if he allowed himself to remember who taught him how to check a horse's teeth, or who'd sat by him all night in the barn when he had the flu. His mother had always quarantined the boys outside when they got really sick, and his father had always been the one to nurse them back to health. But you have a great ranch family now, Hazel said gently. A job you like, and I'll help you find a German shepherd when we get back to town. Dylan paused, drawing Hazel in front of him. So, he cleared the emotion and insecurity from his voice. So you think you'll still be interested once we get back to town? She blinked at him the moon highlighting the shape of her face and the disbelief in her expression. Dylan, of course I will. His heart started tromping around in his chest and thumping and thundering like he'd never experienced before. What's wrong? She asked, tilting her head as she studied him. Nothing's wrong. Slowly, he put his free hand on her waist and drew her closer. Maybe I'm a little nervous. 
His pulse was screaming, very nervous, I'm very nervous. He lifted her hand and placed her palm against his heartbeat. See? She gazed at her fingers on his chest, wonder running through her eyes when she met his again. Are you scared of me, cowboy? She spoke in a sexy whisper that made Dylan's fingers tighten along her waist. Terrified, he whispered, ducking his head. If she'd just stretch up a half a foot, he could kiss her. She inched that way, sliding her hand from his chest to his throat and along his jaw. Sparks popped along his skin there, and he breathed in the warm peach scent of her hair. When their lips were only a knuckle apart, their breath mingling, a growl filled the air. Dylan whipped the rifle around his shoulder at the same time he stepped in front of Hazel. They're back, he said, not bothering to keep his voice down. Switch me, Hazel said. You're better with the darts than I am. In a flurry of motion and movement, she loaded the dart gun with five sedatives this time and took the rifle in exchange for the dart gun. Don't point it at me, Dylan said as she started swinging it around. Out there, keep it out there. Even just firing it will scare them off. You don't have to hit one. You do, she said, the big one. Dylan's hand shook the tiniest bit, and he took a moment to steady himself. Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, let us get this over with quick, he prayed. A clean hit. He not only wanted it to go well for Hazel, he really wanted to get back to what they'd been about to do before the night got too late. The coyotes didn't seem to be afraid of him at all. He strode toward them, the dark gun in front of him, lining up the sight on the animal's chest. The leader bared his teeth, that growl warning Dylan to stop. He did, took a breath, held it, and released the dart. The coyote yelped, sending the other four scattering, and bounded twice before falling down. Got it, he said, handing her the dart gun and taking back the rifle. We'll need to be fast once we get over the fence. There are four more out there that aren't sedated. He scanned the darkness for them, but couldn't see them, couldn't hear them. I'll get the tracker ready before we go over. Hazel stepped past him, and he wondered if her heart was crashing around inside her chest the way his was not only from the thought of going over the fence and leading over a hundred-pound coyote with four still on the loose, but from the thought of kissing him. She worked with quick and able fingers and nodded at him. He went over first, landing on the other side of the fence and waiting, listening, the rifle held at the ready. All right, he whispered, and she joined him a moment later. He liked a woman who could climb eight-foot fences without help, and a woman who marched toward a fallen coyote, bent over, shaved a patch of fur on the shoulder, and then planted a tracker. The whole process took three minutes, during which Dylan didn't let his guard down for a second. Back on the other side of the fence, he finally allowed himself to breathe. Wow. Hazel giggled, the sound made more of nerves than anything else. Yeah, wow. She tucked her equipment back in the zipper pouch she wore around her waist and tossed her dark curls over her shoulder. Should be head back. A kiss under the moonlight wasn't going to happen, not unless Dylan wanted to grab her and plant one on her right there. He did, and he didn't. Yeah, let's head back. At least he got to hold her hand for the short walk back to the cabin, but it was a consolation prize to what he really wanted. Chapter 10 Hazel bustled around the small kitchen, making coffee. Dylan had retreated to his favorite couch. He'd fallen quieter and quieter the closer they got to the cabin. Now he sat silently looking at something on his phone. Sure, they didn't have Wi-Fi or access to the internet or email, but he could be reading or playing a game. Her throat felt like someone had taken her tongue out and tied it in a knot before putting it back in. He'd share his deeply personal story, and she'd try to soothe him with, You have your ranch family now, and I'll help you find a dog but he obviously still carried a lot of baggage and emotion over the loss of his ranch and family, as he should. He hadn't said how long ago it was, but it had to be years and years. He'd been at Grapeseed for almost five years and had worked somewhere else before that. She'd seen him put cream and sugar in his coffee that morning, so she fixed him a cup and took it to him on the couch. Here you are, she sighed as she sat next to him. Thank you, he said, accepting the mug and taking a sip ready to go back tomorrow. Hazel swallowed her own creamy sweet coffee and groaned. No, are you? Birthday party tomorrow, he said. And yeah, it gets a little lonely out here. Even with me here. 
He reached over and curled his hand around hers. No, you've made it bearable. She half snorted, half laughed. Oh, I'll put that on my resume. Makes camping bearable. Dylan chuckled too, and Hazel knew he'd either fall asleep on the couch or head to bed if she didn't start talking. So, I went to beauty school as soon as I graduated from high school. She removed her hand from his and leaned forward to set her coffee mug on the floor before tucking her feet under her body. She was already keyed up and didn't need the extra stimulant. I had a salon in my home in Alabama, but... She exhaled, really pushing the extra air out of her lungs. Since I wasn't part of the family business, things were a bit strained. They'd call me when they needed help. Didn't understand when I couldn't just run over with a missing hose or call a client, that kind of stuff. She braided her fingers together and then released them. It was like they didn't get that I wanted a different life. My own life. All of my relationships are better now that I don't live there. When did you move to Texas? About 15 years ago. So at the same time, my life fell apart. Hazel twisted toward him and removed his hat from his head. You've put it back together nicely. He ran both hands through his hair and nodded a couple of times. Go on. So I came here and had a salon in my home. There's a utility room off the back entrance. Hazel's hands started to shake, as she suspected they would. At least her coffee was safe on the floor. I met a man, she said, instantly sobering and wishing her lungs and voice didn't tremble quite so much. We fell madly in love and got engaged. Everything was perfect. The wedding was only three months away. Dylan calmed her hands by covering them with his. Deep breath, he coached, and Hazel pulled in air through her nose, praying for help to get through the story. I like this man, Lord, she thought. Please help me get through this. I had just finished with a client one day when he showed up at my house. Hazel felt removed from her body, like her past self was reliving the situation while this future self talked about it. He said he couldn't go through with the wedding. Her emotion prevented her from continuing, and she couldn't believe Peter still had this power over her six years later. That alone angered her to the point of tears. She sniffed and wiped her face, nestling her hand back in with his with a quick smile that wasn't an indication of her happiness. Aunt Silly, I know. It's obviously not he said, watching her with those blue, blue, blue eyes. He was obviously very important to you, and he's obviously still capable of making you cry. He lifted his hand to her face and ran it lovingly down her cheek. She leaned into his touch as he whispered, I don't like him. I don't like that he can make someone as witty, charming, and beautiful as you cry. I'm not really crying over him, Hazel said. I promise I'm not. I'm angry that I've let him have this effect on me for so long. How long? It's been six years now. I only use the salon as much as necessary to put myself through college. I've been working for Texas Parks and Wildlife for three years now. What's his name? Peter. Dylan's eyes narrowed for a moment, and he said, I need a haircut. Would you do it? Hazel gave a short laugh and nodded. Yeah, sure. She leaned into his chest, and he lifted one arm and put it around her shoulders. His other hand kept both of hers occupied as he ran his fingertips up and down her fingers, palms, and wrists. There's more, he whispered into her hair. I've been dumped before. This is more than that. Hazel swallowed and forced herself to say, When I asked him why he couldn't marry me after 18 months of dating and a year of our engagement, he said he couldn't be with a stylist. That someone like him, he was a banker, was expected to marry higher than someone who just cuts hair. Dylan nodded as another angry tear leaked down Hazel's face. So you became someone else. I tried. You said you loved your job. I do, yes. Did you try to get Peter back after you graduated college? Hazel wanted to deny it, but she couldn't. He wasn't interested. He had been dating someone else for a couple of years. I don't think they ever got married. As soon as Hazel said it, a flash of light illuminated her mind. He'll never get married, will he? He doesn't seem like the type to settle down, no. Dylan played with the ends of her hair which fell over her shoulder. I mean, I don't know the guy, but if I found a woman I was madly in love with, I wouldn't be engaged for over a year, you know? Hazel knew now. With the candles flickering and the warmth of Dylan's body next to hers, Hazel finally calmed completely. And I can help you get your salon up and running again, if that's what you want. She exhaled, sinking deeper into him. 
I don't know what I want. Fair enough. I want a German Shepherd. I think my life will drastically improve with a German Shepherd. Hazel grinned, glad he'd taken this moment and made it light again. We'll get you one, she promised. When his chest lifted and rose in an even rhythm, she slipped from beneath his arm and perched on the edge of the couch, twisting to watch him sleep. He was a gentle giant of a cowboy, even without his hat, which still lay discarded on the couch where she'd set it after removing it. She stretched across him and trailed her fingers along his forehead, whispering, I've never told anyone about Peter. He didn't twitch or otherwise respond, and Hazel added, Thank you for listening and not judging me. She rose from the couch, sending a prayer of gratitude to God, too, that she'd been able to tell this story at all. She didn't feel tired, but she did feel dusty, so she decided to get in the shower before bed. The hot water helped center her even further, and she wrapped herself tightly in a towel, peeking out the door to make sure Dylan was still asleep before she tiptoed around the door jams and into her bedroom. He wasn't on the couch. She couldn't see him anywhere in the main room, so she flung the door open and hurried from the bathroom to the bedroom and shut the door behind her. Dressed in her pajamas and with slightly damp hair, she went to get one of the last chocolate chip cookies. She and Dylan had rationed them throughout the week, keeping them in the refrigerator to keep them as fresh as possible. They each had one left, and she'd planned to eat hers in the morning for breakfast. Two steps outside of her bedroom, she caught sight of Dylan's broad shoulders as he sat at the bar. What are y'all doing up? she asked as she patted toward him in bare feet. I thought you went to bed. He turned toward her, half a cookie remaining in his hand. She tipped her head back and laughed, completely eradicating the confessions and awkwardness that had settled in the cabin since her story. I was just coming to get my cookie. She stopped next to him, nudging him with her hip. Did you eat mine too? Course not, he said around a mouthful of chocolate chip cookies. He swallowed. It's in the fridge. His eyes felt like two-ton weights as they followed her around the peninsula and into the kitchen. You showered. Was feeling a little dusty, a little on edge. She ignored the leftover coffee in the pot and reached for the fridge. Hot water helped both of those. With her cookie in hand, she joined him at the bar. We're sleeping in tomorrow, right? He asked. Do you actually know how to sleep in? Sure. Then yes. She yawned before taking her first bite of cookie. Let's sleep in tomorrow. What time do they expect you back? No one expects me back, he said. I show up when I want. What about you? I won't go back to the office until Monday. She grinned at him, the chocolate making her feel even more like herself. Thanks for listening to me tonight, she said. I've never told anyone about Peter before. I know. He glanced away. I heard you. Her stomach dropped to her feet and rebounded again, a little higher than before. Oh, I see how it is, feigning sleep so you can eavesdrop on me. I had no idea you'd talk to yourself so much, he chuckled. I'm just a light sleeper. My mom used to lecture me about it, play the piano a half an hour after I went to bed, trying to teach me to sleep through noise and touch. She failed, obviously. He flashed her a grin, and Hazel's worry about what he'd heard vanished. She hadn't said anything she didn't want him to know, anything she hadn't just revealed to him. She finished her cookie, and still they sat at the bar. He stood and stretched, the scent of his skin and his fabric softener making her lightheaded. Well, good night. He started across the cabin toward his bedroom, and Hazel pressed her eyes closed. She really didn't want to end this day without kissing him. Then do something about it. It was something she told herself after Peter had left, and she hadn't known what to do. Don't want to be a stylist? Do something about it. Dylan, she jumped to her feet and turned around, catching him just as he reached his bedroom door. With his hand on the doorknob, he twisted. Yeah? Hazel didn't hesitate and she didn't question what she wanted. She walked toward him, the shakes returning to her fingers. I wanted... She had no idea how to finish that sentence without sounding needy or psychotic. His eyebrows quirked as she reached him and slid both hands up his chest. She tipped up onto her toes stopping just the right distance away from him to know what she wanted without demanding it. Plus, she wanted him to kiss her. He hadn't said as much, but Hazel had gotten the impression he didn't date a whole lot. But he still knew where to put his hands to steady her, right along her waist, with gentle pressure along her back. He still knew how to dip his head and brush his lips across hers just for a taste.
He knew how to knead her closer, growl deep in the back of his throat, and kiss her like he meant it. He knew how, and he did it all spectacularly. Chapter 11 Dylan had never had a woman fit so well inside the circle of his arms. Of course, he'd hardly dated at all over the past 15 years, and before that, he'd been working a ranch and in high school. But as he continued kissing Hazel, with her kissing him back with just as much enthusiasm, he felt like everything in the world had finally aligned itself. When he finally got the good sense to pull away, his eyes drifted open to see Hazel still with hers closed and licking her lips as if she could still taste him there. That made his heart launch back into its rapid beat, and he kissed her again. Will you come to the birthday party on Saturday? He murmured when they parted again. Am I invited? I just invited you. To a one-year-old's party when you're not her parent. May and Kurt won't care. He really wanted Hazel there, and no, May and Kurt wouldn't care. May would have enough food to feed the entire town, and she wouldn't care if Dylan brought Hazel. Say you'll come. He grazed his lips along her jaw and down her neck. Please. Will there be cake? Have you ever eaten at Sotheby's? Hazel drew back a couple of inches, still holding onto his shoulders with both of her hands. Sotheby's? I've heard of it, never eaten there. Dilla wasn't all that surprised. Hazel was a simple woman in the very best of ways, and she didn't require the ritziness of Sotheby's. Well, May owns that restaurant, or she did. She made the chocolate cake there that landed them on the list of must-eats when in Hill Country. So yes, there will be cake. A smile lit up her face and made Dylan ache to have her in his arms forever. Then yes, I'll be there. So I'll text you what time the party is. Dylan had a hard time slipping his phone into his back pocket without grinning at it first. Hazel had just typed her number into his device, and it was somehow more precious to him now than it had been five minutes ago. Sounds good, she said. Her bag was already in the back of her truck, which had been moved alongside the cabin instead of in front of it. She took a hesitant step forward, glancing around. Do we dare kiss goodbye right here in the open? Dylan's heart leapt to the back of his throat, clogging it. He glanced around, too, trying to get his hormones back in check. He was a grown man for crying out loud. I think the coast is clear, he said. Though, if you show up at the party tomorrow... Everyone's going to know about us anyway. Well, here's to one more day of intrigue. She fisted the front of his shirt in her hands and stretched up to kiss him. And it suddenly didn't matter that he was 35 and not 15. She made him feel alive in ways he hadn't felt in years. See you tomorrow, she said, settling back onto her feet and opening the driver's door of her truck. She climbed in and Dylan lifted his hand in a friendly wave goodbye before lifting his two backpacks and the rifle and moving up the back steps. No one was home, as he'd suspected for 11.15 on a Friday morning. He hadn't slept well out of the cabin, not that that was a new thing. The cots were uncomfortable, always biting into his shoulder blades. And with Hazel only a wall or two away, he'd spent a lot of time gazing at the dark ceiling, thinking about her. A new level of exhaustion filled him, and he only kicked off his boots before climbing into the loft and crashing. He woke when he heard his brother's voices in the main cabin below. He's got to be back, Shane said. Boots sounded on the ladder leading up to the loft. Dylan sat up and looked at his brother as he poked his head over the railing. He's here. A smile crossed Shane's face. How'd it go? Great, Dylan said, maybe a little too cheerily. I'll come down and tell you all about it. Austin ordered pizza. He'll have to go meet him at the gate. Dylan followed his brothers downstairs and clapped both of them in a hug. Did you talk to Duane at all? He asked while they washed up and hung their hats. Normal activities after work. Yeah, we heard it was a cougar. We tagged her, Dylan said, and a big coyote. He was in the pack of five. We think they're both responsible for different killings at different times. He turned on the sink and held a big cup under it to get a drink to quench his thirst. Shane pulled out the bread and proceeded to make himself a fried egg sandwich. And you survived in the cabin with Hazel. He didn't look at Dylan but he still heard the river of interest in the undercurrent of his brother's question. It was hard at first. I'm used to doing whatever I want out there. She didn't just go along. No, oh, you know, she wanted to do a puzzle when I wanted to color. She accused me of trying to kill her with my cooking. That kind of thing. Sounds like you hit it off, 
Austin said. Did you get her phone number? Dylan took too long to answer, and Shane grinned at him. Silence means yes. He cracked two eggs into the pan, and smoke didn't immediately lift into the air. Dylan didn't understand how anyone could achieve such a feat. Yeah, all right. I got her number. I invited her to Greta's birthday party tomorrow, too. Shane stepped back from his eggs. You kissed her. What? Dylan's whole body warmed, but his brother couldn't know that. I said I invited her to the birthday party tomorrow. Which reminds me, I need to go check with May and make sure it's okay. He spun away from Shane's knowing gaze, his teasing smirk, and walked toward the back door. You wouldn't have invited her to the party if you hadn't kissed her, Shane called after him. How'd you know that? Austin asked. I have a girlfriend, Shane said matter-of-factly. Tell him, Dylan. Dylan didn't want to tell Austin or Shane anything, but he didn't really see how he could keep his relationship with Hazel, as new as it was, a secret. He understood now what she meant by the intrigue of their relationship. Yeah, all right, he said, turning back. We, uh, uh, kissed? Shane supplied, his attention back on the pan. Why he was cooking anything escaped Dylan. Austin had ordered a pizza. Yeah, we kissed. Dylan didn't like the wide-eyed stare of his younger brother, or the satisfied expression on his older brother's face. As if Shane had known all along that Dylan would go out for a week and come home with a girlfriend. I'm gonna go talk to May, he grumbled. Text me when the pizza comes. I'll go out and meet them. He escaped out the back door without having to endure any more ribbing and took a few deep breaths to bring his adrenaline back down. Next door, he knocked on the back door and waited for Kurt to open it. Hey, you're back. The co-foreman slapped Dylan on the back. How'd it go out there? Good, real good. Dylan looked over his shoulder. Can I come in for a sec? Is May home? Right here, she called from further in the house. Kurt stepped back and Dylan entered, taking Greta as May handed her to him. Oh, hey, baby, he cooed at the little girl. Did you miss me? I haven't seen you in forever. Greta reached up and gripped the brim of his cowboy hat in her fist, pulling it free. He laughed and she did too, and Dylan bounced her around in a circle. Are you staying for dinner? May asked, lifting the lid on a giant pot on the stove and stirring it. The scent of tomatoes and beef and spices hit him, and he really wanted a bowl of that chili. No, ma'am, Dylan said. Austin ordered a pizza. He set Greta on the counter and kept her safe inside his arms. It's about the party tomorrow. You're coming, aren't you? Kurt asked, nudging his wife out of the way. This needs to simmer. You're letting all the magic out. Magic? May scoffed as he replaced the lid and put the stirring spoon in the sink. You think just because you won the last cook-off means your recipe is better than mine? It is, Kurt said simply, or it wouldn't have won. May pretended to be appalled by what he'd said, but Dylan could see the love between them, feel it in the very air, and experience it when they looked at Greta or each other. I'm coming, Dylan said, and I'm wondering if I'm allowed a guest. That got May and Kurt to stop teasing each other and look at him. Kurt's eyes went wide, as did May's, and she stalked a couple of steps closer. A guest. Specifically Hazel Brewster, he said. We sort of hit it off out at the cabin, and I'd like to see her again outside of work. For some reason, it was much easier to admit their relationship to Kurt and May than it had been to Shane and Austin. The front door of the cabin opened, and Felicity walked in, followed by Duane. May barely glanced at them. Eat it off? What does that mean? Hey, guys, Kurt said. Did you bring the cornbread? Felicity lifted a rectangular pan and met Dylan's eye. You're back. I can't believe you didn't come check in with me. She set the cornbread on the kitchen counter and stepped over to embrace him. How was the cabin? Did the cookies last? You didn't burn the place down, did you? Dylan chuckled and released her as Kurt bent his head toward Duane and said something too low to hear. No fires. We ate the last of the cookies late last night. Everything's fine. I'm sure Duane told you about the animals we tagged. He sure did. She exchanged a glance with May, who had stepped back over to the chili again. She still watched Dylan with a sharp look he'd seen in his mother's eyes in the past. What were you asking him? He hit it off of someone? Hazel Brewster, May said, the wildlife woman. Felicity faced him again, surprise in every line of her face. Oh, really? 
Why is that such a surprise to everyone? Dylan looked from May to Felicity and back. Kurt and Duane didn't seem concerned by it, and Shane had seemed to know Dylan would fall for Hazel. I'm not surprised, Felicity said, her voice turning into a monotone. You look surprised. Dylan frowned and lifted Greta into his arms again. Can I take her for a while? He asked. I'm supposed to go meet the pizza guy at the gate. Maybe she'd like to ride in the wagon. I'm sure she'd love that. May plucked the little girl's jacket from a peg around the corner from where she stood. She came over and started to dress Greta. I'm not surprised by you and Hazel, she said, keeping her voice low. Felicity edged closer. I'm not either, I swear. Is it such a far reach to think she might be interested in me? He asked, really wanting to know. Of course not, Felicity said at the same time May said. Not at all. Then what was with the weird expressions? He asked. What do you know about her that I don't? I don't know her at all, Felicity said. Honestly, I don't. She smiled up at him. I think it's real nice y'all got along. Me too, May said, not an ounce of anything in her gaze to say otherwise. And of course she can come to the party tomorrow. Dylan nodded and balanced Greta, now in her jacket and ready for the wagon, on his hip. What time is it at again? Eleven, she said. We're feeding the whole ranch. Then we'll have cake. Then we can all nap. She put her hand on her pregnant belly, a barely there bump reminding Dylan that she ate more and got tired faster than she usually did. Oh, Felicity, did you bring the papers you need us to sign? Dwayne's got them, she looked at Dylan. You were gone this week, but we've decided to put in our application to adopt. We'd love a letter from you as a character witness. Dylan's heart tore a little along the edges. At least Felicity could talk about adoption now. He'd seen her run out of the room before whenever babies were discussed or brought up. Of course I will, he said. You'll have to edit it something fierce, though. I'm not much of a writer. She grinned and he grabbed her in a tight hug. I hope you get a dozen raven hair babies just like you, Felicity. Her shoulders shook, and Dylan held her tight for an extra few seconds, long enough for Duane to meet his eyes and come on over. Hey, he said, touching her back. You okay? She jumped away from Dylan and swiped at her eyes. Oh, I'm fine. She smiled through the tears and drew in a big breath. Honest, I am. She giggled and grabbed onto Duane, hugging him tight now. I'm fine, sweetheart. Duane brought his arms around her and nodded at Dylan. He took Greta out the front door and down the steps to the wagon. Okay, baby, he said to her. It's kind of a bumpy ride, so you stay in your seat, okay? He sent a quick text off to Hazel before towing Greta in the wagon down the dirt lane to the gate to collect their pizza. Chapter 12 Hazel showed up at Grapeseed Ranch a half an hour early, as Dylan had asked her to. He sat on the front steps, and when he glanced up and saw her truck, he jumped to his feet, a smile filling his whole face. He opened her door only a moment after she put the truck in park, and she giggled as he pulled her out of the cab and cradled her face in his large hands. How are you today? He asked, his gaze dropping to her mouth. Great, she said. I took a long nap yesterday, believe it or not. She gave a fake yawn. Some of us aren't used to getting up at 5 a.m. She slid her hands across his shoulders and around his neck, laughing outright when he picked her up and swung her around. I've seen these moves before, cowboy, she said a feeling of life and light entering her that she hadn't felt since the day Peter asked her to marry him. She thought that was the happiest day of her life, and she'd never imagined that he'd break her heart and cause the next six years of her life to be lived inside a shell. A shell she hadn't even realized was there until she'd met Dylan Royal. Then he'd cracked it wide open with a brilliant whistle and terrible dance moves, and a baby in his arms, a baby whose birthday Hazel was about to celebrate with Dylan's entire ranch family. I'm a little nervous, she said. I ate a ton of saltines slathered with butter this morning, trying to soothe myself. Dylan's eyebrows went up. Saltines and butter, huh? I've never had that. It's my favorite snack, she said. Of course, then I have to run a billion miles. Oh, wait, I hate running, she laughed. I figure if I only eat like that every once in a while, it all balances out. I'll take your word for it, Dylan said. 
What are you nervous about? The party, of course. You said everyone would be there. May said she was feeding the ranch, so yeah. All the ranch hands will be there. They'll love you. She pulled in a breath, half expecting him to say something more personal. Maybe like, just like I do. Which was ridiculous. They'd met a week ago, and just because they'd spent five full days together didn't mean he was anywhere near loving her. He just gazed down at her, pushing her long hair off her shoulders and leaning down to touch his lips to hers. A catcall interrupted them after two seconds, and Dylan straightened and looked toward the sound. Ah, so here's Dean. He grinned at the similarly blue-eyed, blonde-haired cowboy making his way toward them. Not quite as tall as Dylan, and definitely not as wide, Dean still had a commanding air about him. His smile was quick, and his cowboy hat black as he said, You must be Hazel. And you're Dean. She cut a quick look at Dylan. I've heard a lot about you. Not too terribly much, but enough to know he was one of Dylan's closest friends on the ranch, besides his brothers and the bosses. You can't trust anything this guy says. Dean laughed, shifting the gift he was carrying under his arm. It was bigger than a gift for a baby should be, and Hazel's nerves made a full return. She fisted her fingers into a ball and tried to keep her smile pinned in place. Dylan dug in his pocket and handed a $20 bill to Dean. You put my name on the card, right? Of course I did. The front door of the cabin next door opened, and nursery rhymes spilled into the air. Dean turned that way. I said I'd help with the setup. I'll see y'all later. He walked away, and Hazel didn't want to get out the gift she'd brought for a baby she didn't know. But she had brothers who had kids, and she'd sent gifts to her nieces and nephews for Christmas and their birthdays. She reached back into the cab and lifted the pink gift bag she'd tucked the cutest pair of baby shoes into. I hope this is okay. Dylan barely glanced at it. I'm sure it's fine. He laced his fingers through hers. We have a few minutes. Maybe you'd like to see the ranch. Sure. She set the bag back in the truck and slammed the driver's door. Let's go. He narrated who lived where, but she couldn't keep track of all the names. There were two large fenced pastures with a stable at the end of them, along with two more barns. Silos and a storage building went by before the homestead came into view on the other side of the long dirt lane. He glanced behind him, and Hazel followed his gaze. The cabin community couldn't be seen at all, and the music that had filled the air before couldn't be heard at all. His hand tightened on hers, and he ducked around the back of the storage building, his bright blue eyes sparking with heat as he leaned back against the wood. I'm glad you came. He ducked his head in an adorable way, his cowboy hat nearly touching his forehead. Are you nervous about the party? She asked, detecting a hint of something anxious in his stance. Not about the party, no. Hazel inched a little closer, trying to see his eyes under his hat. Then what? Instead of answering with words, he put his hand on her back and brought her closer. Dylan swept his hat off his head and leaned down, pausing before claiming her mouth. Hazel trembled, partly from his nearness and partly because she wondered if he really wanted her at the party. Should I just go? She asked, her eyes half closed, the anticipation of his kiss almost too much to bear. I don't really belong here. I probably should have started introducing you to the boys one at a time, he whispered. I didn't realize. I, I'm not great at this dating thing. So you don't want me here? She wasn't asking and her heart shrank two sizes. Dylan backed up a few inches, clearly reeling from what she'd said. Of course I do. I just didn't realize how nervous it would make you, and I feel bad about that. He brought his other hand to her back and held her against his body. Of course I want you here. I just don't want you to be nervous. The kindness on his face, his genuine concern for her feelings, made Hazel's muscles soft and her heart melt. I'll be okay, she said. Maybe you should kiss me first. He blinked at her, his smile slow as his concern leaked from his expression. If you insist. He matched his mouth to hers, and it was a perfect fit. Hazel sighed into him, relying on him to hold her upright. The kiss was unrushed and filled Hazel with the life she'd been missing for so long. Dylan broke their connection and sucked in a long breath. We should go on over now. Hmm. Hazel couldn't quite articulate words at that point the salty taste of his lips still on hers. 
He chuckled and gently backed her away from him. Come on, sweetheart. Remember, there's chocolate cake. They walked back over to the cabins, where noise came with the music pouring from the cabin. Hazel told herself to breathe, to keep taking steps. She made it to the doorway and then through. No one even looked at her. Maybe she could fade into the background and watch Dylan interact with his ranch family without incident. Oh, Dylan's here. A dark-haired woman Dylan had talked about out at the cabin made a beeline toward him, and it seemed like every eye in the place turned their way. You made it. Sure did. Dylan dropped Hazel's hand so he could give Maya a quick hug. Where's Greta? In the high chair. We're just waiting for the tortillas to finish up, and then lunch will be ready. She glanced at Hazel, her eyes kind but appraising. She took in everything on Hazel, from the way she'd clipped her hair back on the sides to the tips of her cowgirl boots. Hazel did her best not to squirm, but she couldn't control the tremors in her fingers that started, so she tucked her hands in her pockets and rocked back onto her heels, waiting for an introduction. You remember Hazel, Dylan said, stepping beside May and grinning at Hazel, which calmed her slightly. Of course I do. May shook her hand and turned toward the party. Welcome to the party. She wiped her hands across her forehead. I had no idea birthday parties were so much work. When's your next baby due? Hazel asked. August, May sighed. A timer went off, somehow covering the noise the rest of the cowboys were making, and she said, Excuse me. She joined her husband in the kitchen, and they turned as a unit. Kurt whistled, and everyone fell silent. May turned off the music and Dylan edged around the party toward Greta, Hazel's hand in his. Welcome to the party, May said. We're so glad you're here to celebrate Greta's birthday with us. Her voice cracked on the last word, and Hazel saw tears gather in her eyes. The love that filled the air rendered everyone silent, and Hazel stilled. She longed for this kind of acceptance, this kind of place to belong. She marveled at the community of this ranch, and she couldn't believe Dylan had all this and didn't even know it. She watched him as he lifted Greta out of her high chair and grinned at her like she was his best friend. The baby giggled, and Kurt said, We've got chicken fajitas down here. Steak on that in. Let's say grace, and then we'll eat. He glanced around and said, Shane, will you? Sure. All the cowboys removed their hats and bowed their heads, and Hazel marveled again. Sure. She'd seen cowboys at church before. She just didn't realize every one of them out here were the praying type. Shane said a prayer, and a loud chorus of amen rang through the cabin before complete chaos started. The two couches had been pushed against the walls, and several long tables put in their place. Bright rainbow-colored sprinkles adorned the white paper on the top of the tables, and the scent of men's cologne mixed with roasted meat and a hint of chocolate. Hazel hung back watching as the people she knew went through the line. Felicity and Duane, the owners of the ranch. She knew Shane, and he seemed stuck at the hip with a pretty blonde woman, obviously the girlfriend Dylan had spoken of with the tiny house. Another woman she didn't know had arrived in the few minutes they'd spoken to May. She carried a younger infant on her hip, and her husband was Levi Rhodes. Even though Hazel wasn't always in the thick of town gossip in Grapeseed Falls, she realized with a start that Heather Carver had married Levi Rhodes, and duh, this was her brother's ranch. She uncovered a large bowl of something like she belonged in this cabin and had been there many times. Of course she had. It was only Hazel who was the imposter here. She swallowed, trying to make the feelings go away, but they refused to budge. They stuck in her throat and made talking difficult when another cowboy came over and said, You must be Hazel. Hazel nodded and Dylan said, Chadwell. He lives with Dean. Oh, of course. Hazel shook his hand and then repeated a similar version of the conversation with every cowboy that lived on the ranch. She remembered Gabe, Chad, and Dean, all the other names blurring as they went by with heaps of steaming meat and vegetables on their plates. Should we eat? Dylan asked, glancing at her. Sure. He took Greta with him, talking about the food like the one-year-old could understand him. Somehow, he managed to make two plates of fajitas and hold the baby, all but effortless for him. Hazel followed behind him, feeling very out of her league. He'd had some hardships in his life, sure, but what he had now? He had the whole world in his hand, 
and he didn't even know it. Hazel had two dogs and a few friends and weekly phone calls with her mother. And she craved this sort of community. If she and Dylan took things all the way, could she live out here? She pushed the thought away. They just started dating, and such a life was on a far distant horizon she couldn't even be thinking about. Hey, Hazel. A blonde cowboy who looked a lot like Dylan spoke to her like they were old friends. I'm Austin. Oh, right, Dylan's brother. He grinned at her. He's something with that baby, isn't he? She watched Dylan take Greta over to the table, but he didn't buckle her back into the high chair. He balanced her on his lap and let her pick up a thin slice of beef with her chubby fingers. Why does he like baby so much? She asked. Dunno. Austin scooped a big spoonful of guacamole onto his plate. He's always been like that. Our mother said when I came along, Dylan wouldn't let me out of his sight. He was only three. He chuckled and shook his head. He's always watched out for me, and Shane's always been there for both of us. Hazel nodded, and the bond between the brothers obvious and thick. Of the three of us, Dylan's a worrier, he said. Shane took care of everything, and I guess me being the youngest just let the two of them do their thing. He smiled and went around her, his plate full. What does he worry about? Hazel wanted to know, and she hurried to finish her plate so she could take the empty spot next to Dylan at the table. Dean came and sat on her other side, and the conversation was easy, natural. Men laughed, and the food got eaten, and then May announced, Time for presents. I left mine in the truck, Hazel said, and Dylan handed her Greta. I'll go get it. He was gone before she could protest. She'd held plenty of babies in her life. She was the older sister to four boys, after all, but not for a while. Thankfully, it came naturally, and she bounced the little girl on her knee. May had everyone situate their chairs in a circle, and she took Greta from Hazel with a, Thank you, darling, and put her on the floor just as Dylan returned with her pink bag. All right, baby, she cooed. Time for presents. May and Kurt helped Greta rip the paper off all the gifts while everyone watched and laughed. Dylan held Hazel's hand for everyone to see, but no one was watching. Hazel felt herself relaxing as she somehow carved a space for herself inside this life, on this ranch with Dylan. Everyone accepted her, and she hadn't felt accepted or good enough since Peter had left. By the time the chocolate cake was served, Hazel wondered if this life, this ranch, and this man were too good to be true. Chapter 13 Dylan rode the high of May's chocolate cake and kissing Hazel for several days. He had to, because life on the ranch resumed, and Hazel had a full-time job to contend with. They'd exchanged numbers, and Dylan had lost some serious sleep as he exercised his sums and tried to keep his laughter from waking Austin, who shared the loft with him. He'd gone out on the ATV on Sunday, so he wouldn't have to discuss Hazel and his relationship with everyone he ran into that day. Didn't see anyone? Didn't have to explain anything. So we're still on for tomorrow night. He texted her on Thursday night while the cabin sat in darkness. She'd seemed to fit right in at the party, though it had taken her several minutes to warm up to everyone. If you're still okay to double, her response came. Dylan's heart leapt over a beat, then reminded himself that she'd come to a birthday party with about 20 strangers. He could handle two of them, her friends Jason and Michaela, and a restaurant. Hey. Any time I can eat food I don't have to make myself, I'm in. Ha ha, I've seen you cook. You never eat something you've made. Dylan didn't want to tell her that he rarely ate out either. So Shane made sandwiches and eggs and a few other things. All the brothers knew how to put a frozen pizza in the oven. And if Dylan could eat cold cereal for every meal, he'd die happy. Dress code? He asked as Austin rolled over and groaned. Dylan turned too, to block the blue light from his phone. What you normally wear? Cowboy boots and hats. You really must not make it to town very much. Every man here wears a cowboy hat and boots. Just checking. He wanted to ask her where they were going, but he'd asked every day this week, and she never answered him. Sometimes her texts were rapid fire, and at first, he thought she just missed the question. But as time went on, and he kept asking and she never responded, Dylan realized she didn't want to tell him so he'd moved on to questions to make sure he didn't show up in the wrong clothes. The last thing he needed was everyone staring at him, the cowboy who didn't get off the ranch much. 
He sometimes felt that way at church, but he went there because he could go in a group and leave in a group and didn't have to talk to anyone he didn't know. See you tomorrow. Hazel's message had an air of finality about it, and Dylan let his phone fall to his chest. He hoped she'd still be interested in him when he showed up at her house tomorrow night. Why he thought she wouldn't be, he wasn't sure. But he drifted to sleep with a sliver of doubt in his mind that made his night restless. He navigated himself to Hazel's house, a live nest of bees in his chest. His breath seemed to buzz in and out of his lungs as he parked and took in the small white house with her truck parked in the carport. With his window down, he heard a couple of dogs start barking, and he got out since she'd know he was here anyway. May had arrived a couple of days ago, and it felt like full-blown summer already. Maybe that was just his nerves making him sweat. No matter what, he slicked his palms down his thighs as he climbed a few steps to the front door and knocked. The dogs went wild now, and Dylan heard Hazel shushing them before opening the door. She wore a blue and white polka dot blouse that looked like silk, paired with a dark black pair of slacks that went all the way to the ground. Her bare toes peeked through, and by the time Dylan returned his gaze to her face, Hazel had cocked her hip into the door and was grinning. You want to come in for a minute? She asked, both dogs standing guard behind her. Yeah, sure. He stepped up to walk into the house, expecting Hazel to fall back. But she didn't. She put one hand on his chest and stretched up onto her toes. I haven't seen you in so long. Her voice was flirtatious and light, but her grip said something different. You smell fantastic. I smell fantastic. Dylan put his arms around her and smiled. So do you. What is that? I have this iced peach lotion. Of course you do. He knew it would be something with a strange name, and he breathed her in. And you look phenomenal. His voice dropped to a whisper of its own accord. What shoes are you wearing? It's a surprise. Like where we're going. I mean, how long are you going to stand there making me wait? Dylan wanted to kiss her immediately, but he forced himself to wait. The anticipation electrified between them, and by the time his mouth finally brushed hers, it felt like an explosion. He drew in a breath and went back for a second touch, this time kissing her fully. He really liked how she held on to the collar of his shirt and kept him in place. Liked the way she tasted like mint and strawberries. Liked that she definitely still seemed interested in him. A horn honked, and Dylan sprang away from her as if her father had just pulled up and caught them kissing on the doorstep. He twisted to look behind him and found another couple getting out of a bright blue SUV parked on the curb. Let me guess, he said, Jason and Michaela. The man waiting on the sidewalk for the woman had sandy brown hair without a cowboy hat covering it. The woman had auburn hair like Felicity's, and she wore a cute little sundress that said city chic more than country flair. They both had green eyes on opposite ends of the spectrum, with hers bordering on brown, and Jason's almost like emeralds. They clasped hands and climbed the steps, wearing wide smiles like Hazel hadn't introduced them to a boyfriend in a while. Dylan remembered that she hadn't, and the quick shake he felt in her hand as it touched his told him of her nerves. Hey guys, she said. This is Dylan Royal. Dylan, my friends, Michaela Long and Jason Bell. Hello. Dylan extended his hand and shook Jason's and Michaela's, noting that Hazel hadn't given him a label. Not friend, but not boyfriend either. I don't think Hazel's quite ready yet. He glanced at her feet, half a smile pulling at his mouth. Three minutes, she said, turning and moving further into the house. Oh, and Dylan, you can meet the pups. The brown one's Monty, the black one's Milo. She turned and headed down the hallway, leaving Dylan with her friends and her dogs. He crouched and held his hand out to the dogs, who both sniffed him. It seemed like their faces broke into a grin when they accepted him, and he scrubbed his fingers behind their ears. You're good dogs, aren't you? They're awesome, Jason said. I keep trying to get Hazel to give me Milo, but she won't. The black and white English bulldog flopped down on the floor and rolled over so Dylan could rub his stomach. He laughed at the dog. How long has she had them? About what? Jason looked at Michaela, but the false note in his voice wasn't hard to hear. Six years or so? Something like that. Dylan knew what had happened six years ago so she'd replaced her fiancé with a college degree and two dogs. He straightened as clicking came down the hall. 
Hazel had put an electric blue pair of heels on her feet, making it so her tailored slacks didn't drag anymore. Dylan licked his lips. She was stunning, a picture of perfection. What is she doing with me? The question entered his mind and hooked on, refusing to let go. Everyone who saw them together tonight would be wondering the same thing. He might as well try to figure it out. He wore his newest pair of jeans, his regular old cowboy boots, a blue polo with darker stripes at the bottom, and his dark gray cowboy hat. Nothing special about him. He felt like a giant fraud standing next to everyone else. Sweeping his hat off his head, he said, Maybe I'll leave this here. He looked around for a place to put it. The living room spread to his left, with a couch and two armchairs. Near the back of the house, a simple dining set sat by a big window, and the countertop made a bar area before someone would enter the kitchen. He set his hand on the back of the couch, where it sat for two seconds before Hazel grabbed it and smashed it right back onto his head. As much as I like seeing your hair, you're wearing this hat tonight. Why? he asked wishing he had more time alone with Hazel to properly express his nerves. She grinned up at him. Because we're going dancing tonight, and I want to dance with my cowboy boyfriend. Dylan pulled in a breath and held it. She was so good at saying what she wanted, and he wished his tongue didn't feel like it had been tied into a knot. Remember how I said I wanted to dance with you the first time we met? I remember, he managed to say. Michaela's and Jason's eyes felt like lasers, and Dylan was grateful for his hat as he ducked his head to get away from their stairs. Okay, Michaela said. I think we just heard her say boyfriend, which means it's time to go. Hazel laughed, causing Dylan to lift his head. Was that a key word or something? He looked at Jason. Should we have a code word in case something goes wrong tonight? Jason grinned and shrugged. We could go with Rocky Road. Right, because you own the ice cream shop. Dylan followed the group out of the house and shutting the dogs inside. Where are we going anyway? The barn. Michaela said at the same time Hazel said, It's a surprise. She gave a little yelp. Michaela, it was a surprise. I didn't know that. She gave Hazel a sympathetic look. But why is it a surprise? Yeah, Dylan said. Why is it a surprise? It just is. They piled into the SUV and Jason drove them out of Grapeseed Falls about five minutes where a huge red barn had been transformed into a bar and grill, complete with live music on the weekends, as a massive sign out front advertised. Dylan put all the pieces together as soon as they walked in. There was a live band, yes, but the man standing at the mic said, Karaoke sign-ups are worth your waiters or waitresses, so don't be shy. I'm not doing that, he said immediately, unsurprised by the glee on Hazel's face. I'll dance, I'm not singing. Oh, come on. She took one of his hands in both of hers and dragged him a little further inside. You can whistle, I'll sing. He scoffed, but he wasn't sure how long he could say no to Hazel. She was so beautiful and so playful, and Dylan liked the way she made him feel alive, made him do things he wouldn't normally do. But even he had his limits. Let's eat first, Michaela said. The band will play for the first hour anyway. A hostess led them to a booth about as far from the stage as they could get and Dylan took Hazel's hand in his and leaned over as the other couple placed their drink orders. Cowboy boyfriend, is that what I am? She looked up at the waitress and ordered a Diet Cola, and he said, same, without looking away from her. If you want the job. She lifted her shoulder as if shrugging, but she nestled into Dylan's chest, right where he wanted her and right where she belonged. He resisted the urge to kiss her ear and instead whispered, I want the job. Great she said, the smile in her voice evident. We'll get you started with dancing and karaoke. Chapter 14 Hazel enjoyed flirting with Dylan, probably too much, but he was so handsome in that hat, and it seemed like every female eye had swiveled their way as soon as they'd entered the barn. Of course they had. Dylan didn't come to town much, and he certainly never came out dancing and singing in a place like this. Hazel did, and often, and had found many of her first dates here. It was bizarre how she was thinking about never having another first date again. Dylan was handsome, kind, hardworking, punctual, witty, and probably a bunch of other things she hadn't learned about him yet. He was the first man she wanted more time to get to know, 
more dates, more of everything. This isn't a low-carb night, is it? He asked as he picked up the menu. I haven't eaten saltines and butter since last weekend, so nope. Great. He put the menu down and looked across the table. So, Michaela, what do you do for a living? I'm a motorcycle mechanic. She gave him a friendly smile and tossed her hair over her shoulder. Dylan clearly wasn't expecting that, because he made a noise of surprise. Well, that's great. You must work at Johnston's. It's my grandfather's shop, she glanced at Jason. It's been in the family for about as long as Grape Seed Falls has been a town. Do you ride a motorcycle mania? Dylan asked, and it was Hazel's turn to inhale surprise. The waitress arrived and placed their drinks on the table. Every year, Michaela said. Are you interested? It's coming up. I don't have a bike. It's not necessary, Jason said. Are you ready to order? The waitress interrupted, and they turned their attention to ordering. Dylan got an order of cheese and bacon french fries, as well as a tower of onion rings, and Hazel wondered how much the man could eat. When the petite woman walked away, Dylan asked, So anyone can ride? Where did they get a bike? You can rent them from us for the event, she said. I own three motorcycles. She scanned him, though almost all of him hid beneath the table. You're really tall, but my father's bike might be a good fit. Your father's bike? Hazel asked, her surprise echoing in every syllable now. Michaela shrugged, but Jason covered her hand with both of his. Someone should ride it. Dylan looked at Hazel, and they somehow had a conversation about how Michaela's father had passed away a few years ago without saying anything. She liked that so much, her fingertips started to tingle. She'd seen her parents have these silent conversations, and it always made her marvel that two people could be so in tune with one another. She longed for that kind of relationship before she'd even known what it was. I'd like to come and see if I can ride it, Dylan said. I'm okay on a horse, but a... And an ATV, Hazel said, and a side-by-side. -side. Dylan smiled at her, a soft gesture that made her insides gooey. Those two, but I've only ridden a motorcycle a couple of times. I love coming to the parade, though, and I've always wanted to ride in the mania. There's only another month to register to ride, Michaela said. I'll send you the application or you can fill it out online. All right. Dylan gave her an easy smile, and the conversation moved to Jason and how he'd come to open the ice cream shop in a prime retail spot before the age of 30. I've lived here my whole life, he drawled, and I used to ride my bike to that shop every weekend with my brothers. We'd work all morning on Saturday and get a few dollars for our effort and be off to spend it immediately. He smiled at the memories only he could see. When the owner went out of business, I told my parents I wanted to buy the building and keep the shop going. They loaned me the money, and the rest is history. Not quite, Hazel said. He worked like a dog for three years before the shop really solidified and started making money. Adding in the sandwich shop helped, he said, glancing at Hazel. And of course, we're very busy in the summer tourist season. He makes it to die for grilled cheese, Hazel said. We should go tomorrow for lunch. I'm headed out to the cabin tomorrow, Dylan said quietly. Hazel whipped her attention to him. You are, without me? He blinked at her, searching her eyes for her true meaning. What was her true meaning? Of course he'd have to go out to the cabin without her, often. It was his job and not hers, and she couldn't expect to be able to go along with him every time. Do you have any information on the trackers we put in? Leslie and I have been analyzing the coordinates. Maybe you should print them out and bring them with you tomorrow, he said, his blue eyes dancing with mischief. I'm only going for two days. I'll have you back on Sunday evening. Hazel was very aware of the way Michaela's and Jason's eyes moved from her to him with every turn in the conversation. She didn't want to jump at the chance to go with him, though she had no reason why she couldn't. I have my dogs, she said. Bring them, he said at the same time Jason said. I'll take them. She glanced at him, almost seeking his permission. He gazed at her even while Michaela did the nodding. All right, Hazel said. If we can take Monty and Milo, I'll come. I don't want you to have to take them again, Jason. I know you and Michaela were going to go down to that swap meet. Oh, right. He could have rolled his eyes as a perfect punctuation mark to his sentence. The swap meet. Hey, I thought you wanted to go, 
Michaela said in a half-hurt voice. I do, he assured her, but Hazel knew he really didn't want to. Thankfully, their food arrived, the perfect distraction for all the conversation. Dylan could indeed eat a lot of french fries, onion rings, and bacon cheeseburgers. When he finally leaned away from the plates in front of him, he groaned. That was incredible. He smiled at her lazily, and if he knew how dangerous that smile was, Hazel suspected he'd never do it again. Or maybe he would. She wasn't sure, but she enjoyed flirting with him. All right, cowboy, she said, sliding out of the booth and standing up. Time to dance. She extended her hand toward him, the horrified look on his face making a jolt of joy steal through her. Oh, uh, I need time to digest, he said, patting his flat stomach. She laughed. Right, and movement will get your digestive system going. Come on. She tried to keep the whine out of her voice. Please, she failed as her hand dropped to her side. Dylan regarded her for a moment, those bright blue eyes blazing with flirtatious fire. All right, he said, moving to the end of the bench and standing. But I'm warning you, just because I'm good at twirling a baby around doesn't mean I can actually dance. Oh, but he could. The moment he took her in his arms, Hazel knew this would be the best dance of her life. He had a natural rhythm, and he spun her around the dance floor to the beat of the quick tune the band was playing, pulling a laugh from her throat. He laughed too, and brought her close again, holding her hand right against his pulse. It's racing, she said, gazing up at him as everything and everyone around them fell away. I'm not nervous, he whispered. Excited? she asked, hoping. Having a great time. He leaned down and kissed her on the mouth, a quick peck that was there one moment and gone the next. Though she barely had time to feel his lips, her own heart skipped and stuttered and she knew she was in very real trouble of giving him her whole, battered, bruised, and scarred heart, and hoping he knew how to fix it. We never went and got you a German shepherd, she said as she watched Monty and Milo pile out of the side-by-side -side and trot after Dylan like he was their new master. He certainly had a way with animals, and Hazel added that to the list of things she liked about him. It was a long list, and she worked to remind herself that he wasn't perfect. He couldn't cook. He didn't go to church much, though he said he came in as often as he could. He didn't speak to his father, even after 15 years. He didn't have a house of his own, and why Hazel had lain awake last night thinking about where they might live after they got married was a mystery to her, and yet the thought still plagued her. Don't ask him, she told herself. It was a conversation they didn't need to have until she was wearing a diamond, and that was light years away. Or should I ask him, she wondered, quickly turning her thoughts into a prayer. She'd always been able to be direct with Dylan about her feelings. Why not this too? She waited to see if she'd feel anything one way or the other, but nothing came. He unlocked the side door of the cabin and let the dogs go inside first. Milo barked, of course, but fell silent after one yip. She found them sniffing in the kitchen and then rushing to the couches their noses going nuts with all the new smells of this new place. Have you ever thought about getting married? She asked. A terrible crash made her turn and face him. He dropped everything he'd been carrying, the hot plate, a small cooler, and both his backpacks. He stared at her, his face drained of color and his mouth hanging open. Not to me, she said quickly, though a frown tugged her eyebrows down. If not to her, why was she asking? I just meant, well, I just wondered if you ever thought about getting married in general. I suppose, he said, his voice a complete monotone. Where would you live? She walked over to the third couch back, his favorite one, and set her small bag down. Since they were only staying for one night, she'd brought considerably less with her. I don't know. So you have really thought about it. Are you thinking about it? All women think about every detail of their wedding and the life that follows it. She bent down to pat her dogs. Let's get some food, should we, guys? She busied herself with getting down a couple of bowls and filling them with water from the kitchen sink. Then she went back out to the side-by-side -side and collected the dog food she'd brought. Dylan stood in the exact same spot, making no effort to retrieve the equipment he'd dropped while she scurried about, feeding and watering the pair of English bulldogs. She shouldn't have asked 
and she shouldered her bag and kept her back to him as she said, Forget I said anything. I'm not thinking about getting married to you. She walked into the bedroom and closed the door, half hoping he'd call to her or come knocking to explain why he'd gone mute and still at the very topic of marriage. Maybe he's never thought of himself as a husband, she muttered to herself. But then, how did he expect to be the dad who twirls with her kids? She moved to the large window that looked out the back of the cabin, a fence along the edge of the ranch only a hundred yards away. The morning was still young, with plenty of time to check the herd, make lunch, and play games. And she'd ruined it with a bold, premature question about marriage. So they'd held hands and kissed a few times. So she liked texting him during the week and the promise of seeing him on the weekends and maybe even the potential to have him in her life long term. Didn't mean she should have brought up marriage within three weeks of their first meeting. How long could she stay sequestered in her bedroom? Every moment felt suffocating, and she turned back toward the door just as Dylan knocked on it. Chapter 15 Dylan couldn't get his heart to stop racing. It was like his most vital organ was in a marathon. He looked at the discarded items that had fallen from his hands at the mere mention of the word marriage. Why had Hazel asked that? Or was it more of a general question as she scrambled for clarification? In the end, he wanted to be brave like her, say what was on his mind the way she did, not be embarrassed by how he felt, as she never seemed to be. So I should go talk to her, huh? He asked the two dogs who'd piled onto his favorite couch. Only Milo looked at him, his eyes saying yes, you blithering cowboy, go talk to her. So Dylan walked across the room and knocked on the bedroom door. Hazel opened it only a moment later, her chin lifted high. Yes? I see myself getting married eventually, he said, keeping his voice low and even. Is that what you wanted to know? Yes, sir. Anything else? She sniffed, the wheels churning in her head if the fire in her eyes was any indication. I was thinking about where you might live if you chose to get married. Dylan's own worries surfaced, and he wasn't sure if he should play it off as something he hadn't thought about or own it. I guess that would depend on who I'm marrying, where they live, that kind of thing. Hazel's eyes widened for a fraction of a second, and then she nodded. Fair enough. When's lunch? Dylan leaned into the doorway and grinned. Well, that depends on how fast you can go through the data you brought with you. We have to work first. Didn't you eat breakfast? I told you to eat breakfast. I had to stop by my office, she said. And he tried to imagine what her desk would look like. Probably piled with folders and papers and old soda cans, if what he'd seen at her house was any indication. What are we eating for breakfast tomorrow? Bagels. He backed up a step as she started to emerge from the bedroom. I'm sure you can have one right now, if you're starving. He was starving too, but not for a bagel. His fingers stumbled over hers before aligning. You just took me by surprise, he said. I didn't realize we were on to serious topics like marriage and all that. I called you my boyfriend last night. There's a big jump from boyfriend to fiance, he said, lifting both eyebrows. I suppose that's true. She sat down on the couch next to her dogs, nowhere near gathering her paperwork to go over with him. It was just something I was thinking about. I shouldn't have let it slip out. Dylan crouched in front of her, playing with her fingers, his eyes on them instead of her eyes. I think you should be able to talk about what you're thinking about. He looked up at her, those gold eyes captivating him and adding courage to his next words. Especially with me, since you're my girlfriend and all. A smile touched his mouth at the word girlfriend. Wow, he hadn't had one of those in a really long time. Her lips curved upward too. Say that again. Which part? He asked, though he knew exactly what she wanted him to repeat. She pushed against his shoulder, unbalancing him and causing him to laugh. He sobered quickly, knelt in front of her, and took her face in his hands mere moments before kissing her. Girlfriend, he murmured in the brief second he removed his lips from her. You are my girlfriend. The 24 hours spent out at the cabin passed very quickly. Dylan learned more than he ever wanted to know about how wildlife trackers worked. Both of her dogs had slept with him because he was soft and allowed them to snooze on the cot with him. Hazel apparently didn't allow Monty or Milo in her bed. They're so warm, he said, 
I really like having them nearby. Dylan seriously needed to get a dog of his own. There was something about having a constant companion that he craved. How he'd made it this long in his life without one, he wasn't sure. He pulled up to his cabin to relative silence on the ranch, and Hazel climbed out of the side-by-side. -side. Great weekend, she said, giving him a sly look out of the corner of her eye. She shouldered her backpack and came around the front of the vehicle. So you meet me in town tomorrow after work? Yep, animal shelter closes at seven. I should be able to get away tomorrow anytime. Just come to my place then, she said. I'm done at five. We can go, say, 5.30 or later. Dylan wrapped both arms around her and brought her close to his chest. I'll be there. He leaned down and kissed her again, quicker and without quite as much passion as he'd done out at the cabin. After all, anyone could be watching here. Heck, Austin was probably peering through the window right now. He pulled back at the thought and let Hazel step out of his arms. Okay, so I'll call you later? You okay? She asked. Before he could answer, the back door in the cabin opened and both his brothers spilled out. Dylan held Hazel's eye for one long moment as if to say, see, I knew they were watching. There you are, Austin said, skipping several steps on the way down. It's about time. We're back early, Dylan said, frowning. We've got something to talk to you about. Shane came down to the lawn more slowly, but definitely about ten times more animated than he normally was. Dylan faced them, a certain excitement growing in his chest that he didn't quite understand. All right, what's the big deal? We're gonna buy a ranch, Austin blurted. Dylan's heart flat out stopped, just quit beating. He stared at Austin and then switched his gaze to Shane, the older, wiser brother who would surely set everything straight. What? With the word, his heart did that marathon thing again, sprinting in his chest like it could get out and run away. Austin, Shane chastised, and Dylan's pulse slowed. He met his older brother's eye. It's true that there's a ranch going up for sale, and it's true that there might be the possibility of us buying it, the three of us. Shane's eyes glimmered with hope, with possibilities, with the same passion Dylan had seen in him back when they used to have a family ranch outside San Antonio. Dylan could hardly keep the lid on his insane hope, and he reached for Hazel's hand to ground him. Tell me more. She squeezed his hand, but he couldn't look away from Shane. Triple Towers Ranch is to the west and northwest of Grapeseed. Shane started, gently taking the folder Dylan hadn't seen in Austin's hand. The ranch is not in great financial shape. He glanced from the folder to Dylan and back. So that has to be discussed. We'd be going in under to begin with. It could take a couple of years to build it back up and start to actually make money. How did you find out about this? Dylan asked. And when? John Hatch is the current owner of the ranch, Shane said. He came to meet with Dwayne yesterday afternoon, offered him the ranch since it's joining property. Thought maybe Dwayne would buy it and just incorporate it into grapeseed. Dylan started nodding before Shane finished speaking. He should do that. He wouldn't lose any money because grapeseed already does well. That's what I told him. Shane's expression turned wistful. He said he'd buy it, only if we didn't want it. He's willing to lose you as his co-foreman? Shane's eyes turned glassy, and Dylan felt like he'd been punched in the chest, hard. His older brother didn't cry, hardly showed any emotion, ever. He was too much like their father in that regard. Dwayne's the best man there is, he said quietly. He knows what we left behind to come here and work for him. He wants us to have the ranch, if we want it. I want it, Austin said. Dylan looked from his youngest brother to his oldest, somehow feeling like the swing vote though it was very clear Shane wanted the ranch too. He lifted his eyebrows in a silent question. You want it, right? We have to be practical, Shane said. We have to meet with a financial planner and make sure we all understand the risks. So let's do that, Dylan said, and then decide. He looked around at everyone, employing some of Hazel's tactics and adding in a sure voice. Because I want it too. You haven't even seen it, Shane said with a smile relief pinching in the lines around his eyes. No matter what it looks like, we can fix it up, Dylan said. No one works harder than the three of us. The very thought of having his own ranch with somewhere to call home made Dylan's whole chest expand. Could it really happen? Please let this be the real deal, he prayed. 
Nothing too good to be true. Just something to call our own. It comes with stipulations, Shane said. Employees, cattle, equipment, that kind of thing. When does it go on the market? Do we have time to get all our ducks in a row? John said he wouldn't put it up for sale until he knew if Dwayne wanted it or not. Austin beamed at Dylan. Dwayne said he needed time to think about it. Then he came straight to us, Shane said. I tried to radio you last night, but you didn't call back. His sharp eyes wanted to know why. Dylan cleared his throat. Last night's activities clearly playing through his mind. Had he heard the radio beep while he was kissing Hazel? He wasn't sure. And he deliberately didn't look at her so a flush wouldn't stain his whole upper half. Sorry, he managed to say in somewhat a normal voice. Maybe the reception was bad. Anyway, Shane said, accepting but clearly not believing the excuse. Duane said we could go into the bank tomorrow morning if we wanted. The question hung between them, and Dylan appreciated that Shane was actually asking him his opinion, really asking. I want to, Dylan said quietly. He had no idea what kind of credit or loan he and his brothers could get, but he had to hope it would be enough to buy a nearly bankrupt ranch. Me too, Austin said, stepping beside Dylan and looking at Shane for the final word. It seemed to take forever to come, but he finally said, I do too. He cut a glance at Hazel. We can look at this later if you guys are. Oh, I'm leaving. Hazel practically jumped away from Dylan, her fingers leaving his in a rush that left him breathless and cold at the same time. You'll call me later. Mm. He watched her walk to her truck, commanding her dogs up and into the back of it before she dropped her backpack over the side right behind the cab. I'd like Robin to come, Shane said quietly, wrenching Dylan's attention back to him. It took a few seconds before Dylan could make sense of what his brother had said. Yeah, he said. Yeah, of course. She'll be directly impacted by the decision. Dylan picked up his bag from the back of the side-by-side -side and started for the steps. How serious are you and Hazel? Shane asked. Do you want to invite her? The muscle in Dylan's hands felt like they'd failed again, and he'd drop everything he was holding, just like he had at the cabin with Hazel's unexpected question. He tightened his grip and kept a tight hold on everything. Do you think I should? Depends on how serious you are. Shane cast him a glance, and they went up the stairs together. Dylan followed his brother inside, glad for the cool air conditioning in the cabin. I don't know, he admitted. We've put labels on things. She asked me if I saw myself getting married. Shane's eyebrows went sky high and he paused. Really? Not to her, not really. But she wanted to know if I was the marrying type. I think because her last boyfriend who became her fiancé didn't want to ever tie the knot. Not with her, and not with anyone. Dylan dropped his bag at the bottom of the ladder leading up to the loft, a sigh leaking from his body like he was tired. But he'd slept great last night with those two dogs down by his feet. And she wanted to know where I'd live if I ever got married. He locked eyes with Shane. Sure would be nice to have somewhere to have a wife and family. Shane's gaze darted away, flitting around the kitchen as he tried to find something to land on. Sure would. So, Austin said, stepping between them, can we show him the ranch now? Chapter 16 Hazel half expected Dylan to cancel their date to go to the animal shelter, so when her phone chimed at 1.30, she wasn't all that surprised. He talked her ear off last night about Triple Towers Ranch and how the buildings could definitely use some work. But she'd seen his handiwork on the hardwood floors out at the cabin, and she knew if there were three men who could fix up a derelict and bankrupt ranch, it was the Royal Brothers. She'd seen Dylan's face when talking with Shane and Austin about that ranch, and she'd spent several seconds in her morning prayers on their behalf. Maybe a part of her wanted to live on that ranch with Dylan. A bigger part than you're willing to admit, she thought, pushing one folder out of the way so she could find a report she needed to finish. Oh, and she needed to find her phone so she could tell Dylan it was fine. They'd go look for a dog another day. You should clean that desk up. Leslie put a cold can of Diet Pepsi on the corner of Hazel's desk, and she picked it up and moved it so it wouldn't get knocked off. I know where everything is, Hazel said, though she still couldn't locate the report. Byron commented on it. 
Hazel looked at the mess covering every square inch of her workspace. Fine, I'll tidy it up. She started the job, filing completed reports in her drawer, and making a pile of cases she still needed to review. It was significantly shorter than before, and a weight lifted from her shoulders. She tossed her empty pop cans in the trash and had cleared a nice space in front of her when Byron came out of his office. Hazel, I need that report on Johnson State Park. Coming up. She lifted another stack of folders, sure the report she'd completed on the Avery at the State Park would be in it. Sure enough, she located the right folder and took it over to Byron. Right here. Thank you. He gave her a pleasant smile and turned back to his office. Her phone drew her back to her desk, and she found it partially pushed under the tray. It was Dylan, but he hadn't canceled their plans for later that evening. She smiled as she tapped out a response to his latest question. Do you want to come out and see the ranch with me tomorrow night? Another message came in before she could finish and send hers. Robin is coming with Shane. I know they're already engaged and all that, but I still want you to come. He hadn't invited her to the bank that morning, not that she'd expected him to. He'd been right when he'd said it was a big jump from boyfriend to fiancé. Of course I'll come. She added, what time? And sent the message off. Her phone chimed at the same time Byron appeared at her desk. I need you or Leslie to go out to Sunshine Farms, he said, looking back and forth between her and Leslie's, whose desk sat across from Hazel's. The other brunette met Hazel's eyes. What for? They've got a fox issue. Won't stop calling. He looked at a slip of paper in his hand. A Thomas Adams. Leslie jumped to her feet. I'll go. Hazel grinned and reached for her purse. I can go. No, you had to go all the way out to Grapeseed Ranch, she said, her dark eyes throwing lightning Hazel's way. I can take sunshine. If you're sure. She held back her laughter so Byron wouldn't know what was really going on between the women. Leslie moved toward the exit, tossing her long hair over her shoulder. I'm sure. I'll check in later. Hazel sat back down, her smile so wide it felt strange on her face. Byron moved away, and she went back to texting her boyfriend about their evening plans that night, and the next. When she pulled into her driveway at 5.15, Dylan's truck was already parked on the curb. He sat with his head down, his cowboy hat obscuring that handsome face. When he didn't look up, she approached his truck and knocked on the passenger window. He whipped his head toward the sound, softening when he saw her smiling through the glass. He pressed a button, and the window slid down effortlessly. Though the truck wasn't brand new, it was still nicer than hers, and she leaned against it, immediately jerking back at the heat searing into her skin. Hey there. Sorry I'm early, he said. Restless out on the ranch. She nodded toward his phone, still held in his palm. You reading? An email from my mom. He put down his device, a slow, soft smile curving his mouth. I can wait out here. Oh, come in and see the pups. She pushed away from the truck and walked backward toward her house, finally pivoting when he reached for his door handle and got out of the truck. He followed her inside and immediately tended to her dogs, scrubbing them and getting them fresh water and food. She went into her bedroom and changed out of her drab beige work clothes and into sensible denim shorts and a purple v-neck. She hadn't had time to call the animal shelter like she'd planned, but even if they didn't have a German shepherd, maybe Dylan would find another dog he liked just as well. She joined him in the kitchen, where he was loading her dishwasher. How he'd cleared her counter in only the time it took her to change, she didn't know. She opened the fridge and took out a bottle of water. Want one? I'm good. He touched her arm and she turned toward him. He wore a dozen emotions on his face, some of them coming and going so quickly she couldn't identify them all. Rough day? She asked. Roller coaster day, he whispered. How'd it go at the bank? Good, he nodded, though no smile graced his face. They'll give us the money, but we want to see everything in person before we decide. That's smart. She reached up and ran her fingers across his eyebrows. Why do you look so troubled? This could be exactly what you want, Dylan. He took her into his arms, and Hazel appreciated that he needed her in this moment that she could be the strong one for him, while in the past, he'd been the rock for her. He buried his face in the hollow of her neck and whispered, his breath brushing her collarbone. 
the hope can crush a man. She didn't know what to do with such truthful words or the weight they carried. She held him tightly and said, My mom once told me that it's better to have something to hope for than nothing to hold on to at all. He said nothing, just continued to hold her, breathe with her. Milo nosed her knee and she backed up a half step. Should we go find you a dog? He bent to pick up his cowboy hat, which had fallen to the floor during the emotional exchange, and straightened. I want a German shepherd. So you've said. She threw him a flirtatious smile and picked up her purse. Well, come on, cowboy. Let's go see what they've got. He drove them to the animal shelter, the country music on the radio filling the silence. Hazel wished she had more to say to comfort him, help him understand that his hope wasn't a bad thing. When they got out and went inside, she slipped her hand into his and squeezed. Thanks for coming with, he said. Yeah, I wouldn't miss this. They bypassed the cages with the cats and started looking at the dogs. It was easy to see there were no German shepherds. A worker came over and introduced herself as Marion. She asked them if they needed help, and Dylan shook his head. His disappointment pierced her, and she said, He wants a German shepherd. Do you ever get them in? Marion shook her head, her chin-length curls bobbing back and forth. Very rarely. If you want one, I suggest you try Shaley Hatch. She's got several German shepherds, and she breeds them. Marion pulled a pink post-it note off the pad and wrote down a name and number. Hatch. Dylan repeated. She's out at Triple Towers. That's right, Marion smiled. She's your best bet. Though, I'll always advocate for people to rescue a dog from here. If you're set on a German Shepherd, she'd be the one you need to talk to. They left and Hazel turned toward him. So, are you going to call her? We're going out there tomorrow. Dylan stuffed the post-it note in his back pocket. Maybe I'll just ask her then. Hazel quickened her step and moved in front of him, blocking his way. Give me the number. I'll call her. His blue eyes stormed, and she held out her hand, palm up. Come on, give it to me. He reluctantly complied, and she pulled out her phone and made a call. We're interested in getting a German Shepherd, she said when woman answered. Marion at the animal shelter gave us your name and number. Oh, Marion, right. Shaley sounded friendly enough, but she didn't offer for them to come out and see any of her dogs. So... Hazel wiped the sweat off her forehead and rounded the truck so she could get in and get the air conditioning going. Do you have any shepherds my friend and I could come look at? When she said nothing, Hazel looked at the phone to make sure the call was still connected. It was. Shaley? What? Oh, uh, yes. I have two left from a litter that someone just forfeited on this afternoon. She seemed incredibly distracted, and a blip of sympathy stole through Hazel. She wondered if she should suggest they come at a different time, but one look at Dylan's hopeful face, and she plowed on. We're about 25 minutes away. Can we come right now? I guess that would be okay. Hazel smiled, said, fantastic, and hung up. Where I go, she told Dylan, and he put the truck in drive. Half an hour later, they turned onto the lane that led to Triple Tower's ranch. Dylan flexed his fingers. I wasn't expecting to be here today. I feel, it feels wrong to be here without my brothers. We're just looking at the dogs, she said. He parked and a woman came out of the house. She was tall and lithe, wore a cowgirl hat, and had a hard look on her delicate features. Hello, Hazel said, taking charge when Dylan lingered beside his door. He called about the German shepherds. Shaley watched them approach, her blue-green eyes missing nothing. Had she been crying? Hazel wasn't sure as she'd never met this woman before. But her eyes were a little red around the edges, and she kept her arms clenched tightly across her stomach. They're in the garage, she said, hooking her chin to the right, where a three-car garage sat attached to the homestead. Hazel tucked her arm through Dylan's and tugged him away from the front steps. He couldn't seem to stop staring at the house, and Hazel realized that he was sizing it up, deciding if he could perhaps buy this place and live here. Come on she whispered. Dogs today. Shaley lifted the single garage door, and the yipping of puppies met Hazel's ears. Oh, they're so cute, she exclaimed, moving forward to see the brown, golden, and black pups. Dylan, look at them. This one's available, Shaley said, bending to pick up a pup at the back of the pack. He's a male. I call him Tantor, 
but you can rename him, obviously. She handed him to Hazel, who immediately passed him to Dylan. And this one. Shaley picked up another dog. Her name's Maple. Hazel cradled Maple the German Shepherd, instantly falling in love with her. How old are they? Seven weeks. You can take them home next week. Next week, Dylan. Hazel beamed at him. How much? He managed to ask. They're purebred, American Kennel Club dogs, she said. They're 600 each. She pushed the louder, yappier puppies away from the barrier. I need a deposit to hold them. Dylan struck the puppy in his hands, obviously in love with it. Do I have to take them both? No, Shaley said. Hazel caught the glare she gave Dylan before she switched to Hazel. Discomfort spread through her. This woman was clearly unhappy about something, and Hazel sensed it had nothing to do with the German shepherds. I want this one, Dylan said, glancing at Hazel and the puppy she held. I'll take 200 now, and four when you come back for him. Shaley stepped out of the pen and took the puppy from Hazel. He handed his wallet to her, and surprised, Hazel opened it to find a thick fold of bills. She counted out 200 and waited for Shaley to write a receipt, all while watching Dylan come back to himself as he scrubbed and cooed at the German shepherd. By the time they were ready to go, his smile had returned, and she had her boyfriend back, courtesy of a puppy. Chapter 17 Dylan could barely sleep. He'd spent an hour talking with Shane about the new German shepherd he'd just put a deposit on. Shane had been brilliant with Cinna, the dog he'd gotten last year, and Dylan wanted to train his dog upright, so it would be just as good as the Sheltie his brother owned. They tossed names back and forth, but Dylan still couldn't decide, and he didn't need to right away. He couldn't bring the pup home for another week anyway. Home. What a strange word. He stared at the ceiling in the loft, the soft snores of his brother soothing him. At least Austin could sleep. He'd always been able to snooze like the dead, while Dylan woke at the slightest sound. Wasn't he nervous about touring the new ranch tomorrow? Didn't his thoughts crowd out his exhaustion and keep him awake? As Dylan thought about what life might be like with a ranch he could call home, a sense of peace finally slipped through the cracks in the blinds, the same way the bright moonlight did. Everything in the country was so silent, and Dylan took comfort in knowing that even if things didn't work out with Triple Towers, he still had this ranch, this community Dwayne's father had built, to come home to. Finally, his rumbling thoughts quieted, and he slept. Morning came early, as it always did, and they had a quick family meeting over toast and eggs, courtesy of Shane. We're meeting here to head over there at four o'clock, Shane said. Robin will be here at lunchtime. He lifted his orange juice glass and drank. Dwayne said he could send his dad over to talk to us, if we wanted. He came down here to look at this ranch when he was much younger than us. Might have something good to tell us. He surveyed his brothers. Should we have him come out? Sure, Dylan said. Or we can go into town, if it's easier for Chase. They'd been hired by Duane's father almost four years ago, as Duane had just taken over the management and ownership of the ranch a couple of years ago. Dylan knew that Chase and Maggie Carver had come to Texas Hill Country from Amarillo, where her family was from. They'd taken on Grapeseed Ranch when it was failing, and they'd built it from the ground up. Any advice Chase could give, Dylan thought they should at least consider. I'll text Duane and find out what's easiest. He tapped on his phone and glanced up when he was done. You still feel good about it? We haven't seen it yet, Dylan said at the same time Austin blurted. Yeah, of course. Dylan looked at his younger brother, really looked. Though he was only three years younger and about to turn 33, Austin wore a youthful vibe in his face. His trademark royal family blue eyes always seemed to harbor a secret, and a laugh was always just a moment or two away. But in those few moments, Dylan saw and felt the same longing for home that had plagued him for years. Austin was just better at hiding it. Or maybe he hadn't realized the need for somewhere to call home until very recently. John's not going to list the ranch, Shane said. We can afford to take the time we need. He finished eating and stood to collect his plate. His phone buzzed on the table where he left it, and Dylan took a quick look at it. Dwayne said his dad can come for lunch. Felicity will make something at the homestead. He read the words again, the reality of them sinking in. Were they really about to buy a 15,000-acre ranch? The money they'd be spending, the debt they'd be accruing, 
the responsibility they'd be shouldering. Dylan took a deep breath. This was what men did. This was what his father should have been able to hold together and provide for them. Buying the ranch had felt right yesterday at the bank, with all the numbers spread before them. It was still right this morning, despite his fears, his anxieties, and his worries. Is Hazel coming? Shane asked, just to hint more curiosity in his voice than Dylan liked. Yep, he said. She said she could. Let me make sure she can come at four. Here at four, Shane clarified. We'll go over to Triple Towers together at 4.30. That's when the tour starts. Is Duane going to come? Austin asked. I wouldn't think so, Shane said. Do we want him to come? Dylan took his dishes into the sink. I think we should ask Chase to come, if he can. He's the one who's done this before. Let's see what he says at lunch. Shane blew out his breath, the concern in his eyes a comfort to Dylan. At least they weren't going into this without covering all their bases. Come on, Cinna. Time to get to work. With that, Shane leapt through the front door, his dog right at his heels. Dylan arrived at the homestead first, 30 minutes early for their scheduled lunch with Chase Carver. He found Felicity in the kitchen, the scent of brown beef hanging in the air and making his mouth water. Hey, Felicity. She gave him a wide smile as she twisted to look over her shoulder without moving from the spot in front of the stove. Dylan, grab me that chili sauce, would you? He picked up the bulbous bottle and moved to stand beside her. Sloppy Joe's. That's right. It's one of the only things I'm good at. She tapped the pan with her wooden spoon. Dump that in here. He scoffed and twisted the lid on the chili sauce. That's not true. I've eaten a lot of your food. It's all good. She stirred in the chili sauce, the pan hissing when the colder liquid hit the hot surface. That's because May's been teaching me. He watched the mixture come together before turning away. Well, I can barely boil water, he said. So I think you're doing just fine. He rounded the counter and sat at the bar. How are things with the adoption? My letter was okay? He'd written it over the weekend with Hazel's help out at the cabin. While he wasn't normally overly sentimental, Felicity felt like the maternal influence in his life, and he wanted her to be happy. Your letter was great, she said. I turned it in yesterday. We don't know anything yet. We're still putting all the paperwork together. She flashed him a smile and added, If you're here, make yourself useful. Those rolls need to be cut, and there's fruit in the fridge that needs to be washed. Dylan got to work, answering her questions about Hazel with ease. He liked that he could talk about her freely, without embarrassment, and he wondered when he'd gotten brave enough to do that. Her parents arrived, and Dylan shook Chase's hand and hugged Maggie, grinning all the while. They were the ones who breathed life into this place, and he suddenly saw them in a new light. Duane and Shane came through the back door, already engaged in conversation about one of the horses. They pulled out water bottles and washed their hands, and things in the kitchen started heating up. A knock sounded on the front door, and then Robin came through it, causing Shane's whole face to fill with happiness. Dylan wondered if he looked at Hazel like that, if he could ever sweep his hand casually around her the way Duane did as he leaned down and pressed a kiss to Felicity's temple, if this new ranch would provide somewhere for him to have a soft landing when his days were hard. Did Hazel want it? The ranch life wasn't for everyone, he knew, and his mom had told him several times over the last 15 years since their lives had taken a 180 turn that she was so much happier in the city. That could be from a lot of different things, he told himself, including being in a healthy relationship instead of the one she'd been trapped in with Dad. He hadn't heard from his father for a while, something Dylan noted but didn't know what to do with, and he didn't have time to stew over it as Austin arrived and Felicity announced that lunch was served. They all fit around the big dining room table, and the chatter was pleasant and easy. He was used to being alone in a crowd, but since he'd started dating Hazel, he'd also grown used to being part of a couple. He felt in between, and when Chase said, Well, let's talk about this ranch, Dylan's pulse spiked. He pushed his food away, though he wasn't quite finished eating. Yes, sir. Shane wiped his mouth with his napkin and said, Tell us what to look for when we go this afternoon. You've already got their financial information, right? Chase's once blonde hair was completely white now, but his eyes were still animated, indicating that his mind was still as sharp as a tack. Yes, sir, Shane said again. 
they're not good. When we first came here, Grapeseed wasn't doing well either. He gathered Maggie's hand into his. But when we got here, and we saw the place, the buildings, the cabins you boys live in, all of it, we just knew. He smiled at his wife. It was a lot of work, I won't lie. But we felt like the Lord had directed us here, and we were willing to work. We're willing to work, Dylan said, knowing he could speak for his brothers in this instance. Do all three of you want to live and work the ranch together? Chase asked. Thankfully, both Austin and Shane started nodding at the same time Dylan did. All right, then. You'll each need a home to yourselves. If there isn't what you need, is there land to build it later? That's what we did with the guest house in the back there. Chase's voice took on a reminiscent tone. It wasn't there when we bought the ranch, but as soon as Maggie had Duane, we started discussing when we could build it and where. We knew, well, we hoped. He smiled at Maggie. That one of our kids would want to take over the ranch one day, and they'd need somewhere to live until that happened. Turned out Duane didn't really need it, but it was still there. And perhaps his kids will use it one day. Felicity pulled in a breath, but she released it just as quickly. I got married as quick as I could, Duane deadpanned. Not all of us find our soulmate at age 19. He gave his mother a pointed look. She laughed, the sound filling the house with joy. Had Dylan ever had that at the family ranch? He wasn't sure. It felt like so long ago that he'd been there. Almost like it had happened in a different lifetime. It took us ten years to build the house, Maggie said. Chase did a lot of the work himself, around the ranch chores and schedule. You just have to do what you can, when you can. Dylan nodded. We'll look for those things, because I like to live at the ranch. He scanned his brothers. You guys too, right? I mean, Robin has her tiny house. We could live in that, yes, Shane said. I'm sure there's somewhere to park it on the ranch. But we'd probably want something more permanent for down the line, when kids come. A flush entered his face, and Dylan remembered his surprise when Robin had said they weren't opposed to babies a few weeks ago. I'm not dating anyone, Austin said. I'd still like a place of my own, eventually. Maggie patted his hand, and he gave her a warm smile. What else? Shane asked. Find out about water rights, Chase said. All the neighboring ranches and land. Check the fences. Ask about staff. Dwayne mentioned some are contracted to stay on. You have to keep them. Just three people, Shane said. But one of them is John's daughter. Chase's face crumpled into a frown. Shaley, why hasn't she taken over the ranch? If she already works there. I don't know, Shane said. Maybe she doesn't want to. I met her, Dylan said, blurting out the words. What? Shane pierced him with a glare. When? She's the one with the German shepherds, he said. Hazel and I went out to Triple Towers to look at the pups last night. So you've already been there? Shane's voice was so incredulous that guilt drove into Dylan's heart. Sort of. I didn't see much. The homestead. The dogs were in one of the garages. He glanced at Austin, who also wore a look like he'd been punched. It was no big deal. Shane held his gaze for another moment and then returned his attention to Chase. Should we take pictures or anything like that? Sure, Chase said. Look at everything. Ask questions. Don't be afraid. But most of all, pay attention to how you feel while you're there. Dylan nodded, and Shane did too, and that was the end of the conversation. The topic shifted to Chase and Maggie's life in town, how they were adjusting to their new neighbors who had six dogs and three cats. Help us, he prayed as lunch broke up, and he headed back outside for an afternoon of work. He couldn't articulate much more than that. But then again, maybe God didn't need a long, drawn-out plea to be able to assist Dylan and his brothers regarding this new ranch that could become their new home. Chapter 18 Hazel left the office 15 minutes later than she'd planned. Then choosing the right clothes to tour a ranch seemed impossible. She'd already laid out a simple pair of khaki shorts and a purple tank, but that hadn't seemed right once she'd made it home. Now she wore a light yellow blouse with tiny red flowers on it and denim capris. Total ranch tour attire, she hoped. Harried and nervous, 
She kept the speedometer above the legal limit so she wouldn't miss going with Dylan and his brothers to look at Triple Tower's ranch. She pulled up to his cabin at 410 to find him sitting on the front steps, his lips puckered into a whistle. A leaf cascaded over her, and she jumped out of the truck. Sorry I'm late. He patted the step beside her and cut off his brilliant whistle. We're not leaving for a few more minutes. He wore his usual jeans, cowboy boots, and a short-sleeved shirt. This one was a button down the color of raw salmon, and it made his dark cowboy hat stand out. She sat beside him, her emotions one big jumbled ball of yarn. Of course she wanted to be here with him. She was thrilled he'd included her in this major event in his life. Though she'd only been involved with him for a month, she felt like he'd been building to this moment in his life for years and years. It felt huge and all-encompassing, and it choked off anything she might have wanted to talk about before they left. He went back to whistling, and she smiled as she hugged his arm to her body and laid her cheek against his bicep. She really wanted him to get what he needed to be happy. An image of her discarded salon chair flashed in her mind. What did she need to be happy? Hazel hadn't thought she was unhappy, at least not until she'd met Dylan and decided he was worthy of more than one date. Sure, she'd known her life wasn't what she'd hoped it would be, but she had a good job and friends, and she hadn't had a problem getting a date. What she'd had issues with was letting someone into her life that might stay, might blow up her carefully hollowed-out life and make it complicated. She swallowed hard, wishing she didn't feel so unsettled. The front door opened, and a dog came clicking down the wooden steps, pausing at her side. Hey, girl. She struck Cinna once and then stood with Dylan. Ready? Shane asked, a pair of sunglasses already covering his eyes. He clutched his fiancé's fingers. Austin said he'd ride with us. Sounds great, Dylan said, his voice a bit on the strained side. Of course it was. He had all his hopes and dreams riding on this tour, and Hazel found herself thinking a constant prayer as they walked over to her truck. You'll drive, he asked. Sure. She pasted on what she hoped was a reassuring smile. You ready for this? His eyes seemed focused on something else, but he nodded. Yeah, been waiting all day. How'd the meeting with Chase go? Great. He let go of her hand and moved toward the passenger side of the truck. Hazel hurried to climb in and reach over to rake the trash and clothes off his side of the seat. He never said that her messiness bothered him, but he did tidy up whenever he came to her house. Once, she told herself. He'd only been to her house twice, and he'd cleaned up her counter and loaded her dishwasher the second time. She wasn't sure if it was a statement or just something he'd done. She said nothing about it, and neither had he. No matter what, his heightened anxiety bled into the atmosphere, and Hazel found herself clutching the steering wheel too tight, too tight. She breathed in, trying to relax. Did you want my opinion? She asked, or just moral support? Dylan finally looked at her like she wasn't a stranger. Both. Hazel was glad for such a direct answer, but she wished she would give her more than one-word answers. The ranch sat down the road, on the other side, about another ten minutes, and they arrived right behind Shane, Robin, and Austin. The sign over the entrance had beautifully carved cattle, walking toward three towers in the distance. She hadn't noticed the towers when they'd come last night to see the puppies, but she saw them now as she turned onto the property. One looked like a water tower or a stock tank. The other was a feed silo, and the third a tall grain elevator. They sat to the south, directly in front of Hazel as she completed the turn. The homestead waited down the road a ways and faced east, something she hadn't noticed last night. She rounded the garage and parked next to Shane, but didn't cut the engine. All right. This looks nice. They'd been here last night, and Dylan had sort of fallen into a trance. He was doing the same thing now, his eyes glued to the sprawling homestead with its freshly painted white trim and the deep blue of the rest of the house pretty, at least in Hazel's opinion. Looks like they've been working on it, she said, painting and whatnot. Yeah. He reached for the door handle and they got out of the truck and joined the others. There was no grass in the front, but several rows of rose bushes that Shane looked at like he'd never seen a flower before. Those will require work, he said. I'm handy with the clippers, Robin said, threading her arm through his and leading him toward the steps. A man opened the front door and came out onto the porch, 
which wrapped around the side of the house away from the three-car garage, where Hazel knew housed a half a dozen puppies at the moment. You must be the Royal Brothers. He smiled from his mouth to his eyes, and when he walked, he had a definite limp that made Hazel's heart twist. He wore a black cowboy hat he tipped at each of them before shaking their hands. I'm John Hatch. He was very clearly at least 70 years old, much too old to be running a 15,000-acre cattle ranch with 1,100 head of cattle. Heck, Hazel didn't even know if Shane, Dillon, and Austin could do it. That was a lot of land and a lot of cows and pastures to rotate and equipment to maintain and the buildings. She cut off her thoughts, her negativity not going to help anything. Let's start with the house, shall we? He led them inside, and the work that Hazel had seen on the outside extended within the walls, too. Everything had been repainted. Walls, ceilings, baseboards, even the kitchen cabinets. The windows along the back of the house were huge and let in a lot of light. And for the first time since Sunday morning, when Shane and Austin came bounding down the steps with excitement about this ranch, Hazel felt it, too. Dylan's hand found hers and squeezed. They toured the bedrooms and went up to the second floor. The house was huge, with a large multi-purpose room over the garage. Two families could easily live here, if they were willing to share a kitchen. You don't have a family, sir, Shane asked, getting the obvious question out of the way. One daughter, he said, and Hazel thought of the red-eyed woman from last night. Was she sad she was losing her ranch? Or had she been crying for some other reason? She joined the army, John continued. She's not interested in the ranch. She's out there somewhere. He didn't speak in an awkward or unkind voice, but the tension in his mouth was obvious to Hazel. The backyard was fully fenced and evidence of dogs and puppies lay everywhere. She raises German shepherds, he said. She uses this yard a lot, put in the fence herself. Is she Shaley? Shane asked, flipping a page in the folder. That's right. This says she stays on as a ranch hand for 12 months after the sale. That's right. Shane exchanged a glance with Dylan, but Hazel couldn't decipher the meaning. The yard was well kept, with several trees that would provide shade in the brutal Texas summers. John showed them the garage and then headed past all the roses to the barns, sheds, and pens that lay down the road a bit. They are two open-air barns, he said. The cattle are all free-range and they sell well. I've got a hundred chickens and I go into the farmer's market every few days to sell the eggs. He pointed to the huge chicken coop, as well as the enclosure where they slept. Beside that sat one of the open-air barns with a long pasture behind it. The equipment shed's down on the end, John said, pausing. Apparently they weren't going to go all the way to the end. They stood in a crossroads, with the road continuing east in front of them, north to the equipment sheds, and south toward the towers. All the equipment comes with the ranch. It's included in the price. Some of it is in need of repair, but nothing too major that Berkeley can't fix. Tyson Berkeley ran a farm machinery shop in town. Even Hazel knew that. Dylan nodded and nudged Austin when another building came into view. What's that? It looked like another house, but it wasn't as well kept as the main homestead. That's the cabin I converted into my offices, John said. My wife got tired of everything being stacked on the kitchen table. His smile was wide, but this time... It wasn't nearly as blinding or happy as before. So I converted a small cabin into the business hub of the ranch. How big is it? Dylan asked. Standard. Two bedrooms. Could be three, if someone was willing to put some work into it. Bathroom. Kitchen. Living room. You could easily put two ranch hands in it tomorrow. How many ranch hands will we need to keep the ranch going? Austin asked, taking the folder from his brother. We can see that Shaley Hatch, Oker Donovan, and Carlos Cazar are contracted to stay on for 12 months. Will that be enough? John shook his head. With the three of you and the three of them, and the work that needs to be done around here, I'd say you need about 10 more ranch hands. Is there housing for them? Dylan asked. Right down this way. John pivoted and limped away from the equipment buildings, as well as a second open-air barn and what Hazel guessed were stables along the road that continued east. On one side of the road, trees as tall as skyscrapers billowed in the breeze. They cast shadows on a row of cabins opposite them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Enough for twelve men, Dylan said, not really asking. 
The first one is where Ochre and Carlos are living, John said. Shaylee's in the homestead right now, but she knows she'll have to move out. So she'll take another one, Shane said. All three brothers looked like they were working through the logistics in their minds. And that leaves four. Eight more men and three of us. There's room for more cabins, Dylan said quietly. Are you going to build them? Shane asked without a hint of anger or sarcasm in his tone. He genuinely wanted to know. Yeah, I can build them. He looked at Hazel and then Shane. There's a house back there too. That could be... He lifted one shoulder in a powerful shrug. And if we added, say, three more cabins here, maybe making two of them larger, we could have another house for one of us, as well as a bigger, better place for our foreman. One of us won't be the foreman? Austin asked. Hazel's mind spun with how much they needed to sort out, and her first inclination was to run from a task this large. But she admired Shane, Dylan, and Austin, who all stood there, thinking, sharing, and tackling their dreams. She turned away wandering further down the road. What would her life out here be like if she continued dating Dylan? Surely Shane would take the homestead, though it was extremely large and more could fit. Maybe all three of them would live there together until everything was built and decided. She didn't know, and she didn't have to decide. The tour continued, and she kept her hand in Dylan's for moral support. She didn't know how to offer him her opinion. He didn't seem to have a problem discussing things with his brothers or asking questions of John so she let him. Hazel also let her mind wander down a path she hadn't been on in a long time. Fear filled her as she thought about living 30 minutes outside of town, 30 minutes from a grocery store, 40 minutes from work, from her friends. She also didn't know where she fit in this family, since she wore no diamond and had only been dating Dylan for a few weeks. You don't have to know right now, she told herself, but she still felt unsettled and uneasy about the whole thing. So, Dylan said once they'd buckled their seatbelts behind the safety of the closed doors of her truck. What did you think? Hazel looked at him and saw the hope, the anticipation, and she had no idea what to say. Chapter 19 Dylan waited while Hazel went under the ranch sign and checked before she got on the road, leading back to Grapeseed Ranch. Like there would be any traffic out here. Dylan had checked the road past the ranch, and Triple Towers was the only other destination out here. When she still didn't answer, Dylan felt the need to fill the silence. I thought it was fantastic, he said, finally releasing the breath he'd been holding during the hour-long tour. The main homestead was huge. It was, she finally said. What are you guys thinking? Well, Shane's getting married, he exhaled again. I'm sure they'll have a family. I want to get married someday, and Austin too, eventually. We'll all need a home to live in on the ranch. He looked out the window at the ranch land passing by. There's plenty of land for more homes. So it'd be the Royal Compound, is that it? Royal Ranch and Compound. He chuckled, reaching across the distance between them and taking her hand in his. I like the name Royal Ranch. So you're going to buy it? The numbers looked good yesterday. We can all buy in, be three-way owners of the ranch. John spoke true. The cattle he raises sells well. Then why is he selling? Didn't Shane say the ranch was bankrupt? He spends more than he makes and has for years. He's bankrupt, but the ranch should be profitable if run properly. We learned all that yesterday, and we decided if we felt good while we were here that we would buy it. And you feel good about it? A smile burst onto Dylan's face. He'd been nervous at first, walking around someone else's house looking at someone else's family pictures on the walls. He'd seen a family of three for a house that could easily accommodate 15, and he noticed a few pictures with just John and his wife. Then the rest of the photos were just John and Shaley. There was a history there, and Dylan wondered if it was as rocky and potholed as his. At the same time, the ranch held absolute hope for him and his brothers, a way for him to have everything he'd worked for, if only 15 years late. You want to go to dinner? He asked. Yes, she answered instantly. How do you feel about barbecue? Don't all good Texans love barbecue? He gave her a wary look. What does this barbecue come with? Line dancing? Poetry reading? Hazel laughed, and for the first time since they'd driven onto the Triple Towers Ranch, Dylan felt her relax. As a matter of fact, 
Blues Street has live bands that play almost every night. If we're lucky, who's ever there tonight will have good equipment. Dylan watched her, admiring the laugh lines around her eyes and the way she could flirt with him without even looking at him. Good equipment? What does that mean? Every artist has to bring their own stuff. Mics, amps, that kind of stuff. Sometimes, if they're just starting out or not used to playing live, the sound is too loud or too quiet. Sometimes they're not that great, but I've never been disappointed when I go to Blue Street. She gave him a sultry look that made him want to kiss her. The food is always great. Dylan wanted great food, great music, his beautiful hazel, and the ranch. I've never even heard of Blue Street, he said. Where is it? It's on the end of Donut Street, down by the Industrial District. Oh, so the wrong side of the tracks. No wonder I haven't heard of it. Oh, because you're so prim and proper, she snorted, and Dylan was glad she'd pulled herself out of whatever funk she'd fallen into. He couldn't really blame her. He felt like a completely different person now than he had while touring the ranch. He sighed a happy sigh, seeing all the different pieces of his life coming together. What should I name my dog? He asked. They tossed names back and forth, and finally she said, I don't know, you've rejected everything I've said, in a surly tone. She turned into a parking lot with one weak lamp in the middle of it. Dylan sat up straight and scanned the area. Are you sure there's a restaurant here? It's a barbecue joint, she said, killing the engine and getting out. Not a restaurant, she grinned at him. What about Titan? Titan? She stared at him straight-faced. For the dog. Oh, he startled, his brain whirring through topics like Tasmanian devil. You know, I kind of like Titan. Hallelujah, she said in a dry voice, and she got out of the truck. Dylan hurried to follow her, catching her around the waist at the front of the truck. Are you really annoyed about the dog name? He asked, holding her close and swaying with her to the distant beat of the music beating from behind the door. She softened in his arms and whatever had her silent earlier had disappeared. Of course not. She stretched up and kissed him quick. Now let's go eat. I'm starving. The atmosphere inside the barbecue joint was unlike anything he'd seen on a Tuesday night. It smelled like meat and grease and tangy barbecue sauce, and Dylan's mouth started to water. It was mostly dark except for the stage, which was raised two feet off the floor and brightly lit. Low lamps hung from the ceiling over the other tables, which were about half occupied. It was much too loud inside for the number of people, because tonight's band featured four men dressed in skinny jeans and black t-shirts, wailing into the mic in front of them. Twisted calfskin, Hazel said like she knew this band, and Dylan looked at her. Excuse me? You listen to this? She pointed across the distance. See the guy at the drums? I went out with him once. Dylan knew she'd been out with a lot of men once, so he didn't think too much of it. But you like their music? Heavens no. She smiled at the man who greeted them and held up two fingers. They're almost done, he assured them in a booming voice and led them toward the back of the place, away from the stage. It was slightly quieter back here, and if Dylan hadn't seen the three meat platter, he may have suggested they go somewhere else. But sure enough, Twisted Calfskin packed up their screechy mics and amps, guitars and drum set after only one more song, leaving behind blessed silence. The food came quickly, and Dylan had never tasted brisket so tender. What's in this stuff? He asked, picking up the bottle of barbecue sauce labeled with just a single chili pepper. It was spicy and sweet and savory all at the same time. He dripped some more onto his pulled pork. He couldn't get enough. I told you I've never left here disappointed. She grinned at him and lifted a pork rib to her lips. Finally satiated, Dylan drained the last of his soda and leaned back in his chair. You never told me what you thought of the ranch. Hazel met his gaze with trepidation in hers, which set his nerves humming. Say it, he said. Whatever you're thinking, you can tell me. He folded his arms and set his jaw as a brace against whatever she might say. I like the ranch, she said carefully, obviously choosing her words with care. I don't quite know where. Well, where I fit on that ranch. Dylan blinked, the only reaction he dared to show. But beneath his ribs, his heart started crashing around, and his mind raced with thoughts like, With me, sweetheart, 
You belong with me on that ranch. And you don't think you belong out there? Or there's nowhere for us at Grapeseed, that's for sure. He said nothing. Just watched her as her big old eyes filled with an emotion he couldn't quite name. Not really sadness, not disappointment. Probably just nerves to admit to him how she was really feeling. It'll be a big adjustment, he finally said when she didn't elaborate. I imagine so, yes. She picked up her napkin and started shredding it. What's the next step? Financing, he said. Shane's meeting with John's realtor in the morning, and he's going to help us with the loan officer. Things could move quickly then. He hated that she wouldn't look at him. Possibly. He leaned back into the table and reached across it to still her hands by covering them with both of his. What's really going on? She lifted one shoulder, that pretty blouse rippling with the movement. I don't know. Sure you do. He finally lifted her eyes to meet his. Look who's saying uncomfortable things now. Don't change the subject, he said. But yeah, I like how you've been so direct with me. A man can change. I'm sure he can. So, he pressed, what's really the problem? I just, she swallowed, and Dylan felt a storm coming, and he didn't like it. It's a big ranch, she said, with a lot to get done in a short amount of time. I feel like I'm going to get lost, left behind. Dylan let her words sink into his ears, run through his mind. He didn't know how to respond, because she had spoken true. Triple Towers was a very big ranch, with so much to do, he couldn't even think about all of it without becoming completely overwhelmed. I don't want you behind me, Dylan finally said. I want you right beside me. I've never lived or worked on a ranch, she said simply. I'll teach you. She regarded him with shudders over her eyes. What are you saying? He didn't know, trying to sort through how he felt. Yes, he liked Hazel, a lot but was he in love with her? It was far too soon for that, right? He shook his head, his phone brightening and chiming. He pulled his hands back and picked up the device, regretting the choice as soon as he saw who had texted. It's my dad, he said. Oh? He didn't miss the incredulity in her voice. He felt it racing through him too. Yeah, he texts from time to time. This time it said, hey, Austin mentioned something about you three buying a ranch. Frustration colored this near-perfect meal, and it didn't have anything to do with Hazel's troubling words. His dad had a special way of ruining the best of situations, and Dylan cursed his younger brother for thinking he could involve their father in these types of things. He turned the phone over and focused back on Hazel. You're not going to respond? No. He told her the long story out of the cabin, and he felt no need to get into it again. There was something much bigger at play here, between the two of them, and Dylan didn't want to give priority to the man who had abandoned him, not over Hazel. In fact, he couldn't envision himself putting much of anything over Hazel, but he couldn't quite vocalize that, even though he had gotten better at saying hard things. His phone buzzed, and he growled as he flipped it over and silenced it completely. Maybe you should talk to him, she said. I don't want to talk to him, Dylan said. I want to talk to you, or rather, I want you to talk to me. Chapter 20 Hazel trekked out to Grapeseed Ranch again on Saturday, the last few days uneventful in the physical sense. But she was exhausted mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. She'd managed to convince Dylan that she was okay, just feeling her way through a new situation at Blues Street on Tuesday. So she'd gone to work, cluttered up her newly clean desk again, walked Milo and Monty, and stopped and looked at that salon chair more in three days than she had in the past three years. She'd been happy with the salon in her home, though it was simple and she didn't make truckloads of money. She thought about Dylan sitting in it as she trimmed his coppery blonde hair, and then Mildred Burneau and the other lady she used to chat with when they came to her salon. Would anyone make a 30-minute drive to get their hair set? That was about when Hazel turned away from the salon chair and went to work. She did her best to ignore it when she got home in the evenings, but it was always there, taunting her. She pulled up to Dylan's cabin, but he wasn't sitting on the steps waiting for her like he'd been the last few times. She went to the door and knocked, but no one answered, 
so she took his place on his front steps and texted him. Coming came his reply several seconds later. The front door on Curtin May's cabin opened, and someone came out onto the porch. Hazel could just see the top of his cowboy hat under the eaves, and her body reacted physically. She did really like him, and it was more than a racing pulse and the promise of a kiss. It was a softening in her emotional barriers, the absence of so many confusing thoughts. He calmed her and excited her at the same time, and she had no idea how or why or what it meant. He spoke in a low voice to Greta, whose whimpers carried across the grass between them. He bent and collected something. Then his boots clunked as he came down the stairs, and she rose to meet him when he crossed the lawn. She's gonna come with us, he said, carrying a child's car seat. Is that okay? Hazel sure did enjoy the sight of this tall, tough cowboy carrying a one-year-old baby. Dark-haired and chubby-cheeked, Greta regarded Hazel with watery eyes. If you know how to put that car seat in, she said, reaching up to smooth Greta's fuzzy curls back. She smelled like powder and flowers and everything soft a baby should smell like. Hazel hadn't given tons of thought to having children, but the need exploded through her now. And not just anyone's children. She wanted dark blonde babies like Dylan. Her heart really pumped then, because what was she supposed to do with that craving? Did she love him? She sure liked a lot of things about him, including his kind heart and his work ethic and his loyalty and dedication to his brothers. He okay? He asked, smoothing her hair back this time. She leaned into his touch, her eyes closing briefly and said, Yeah, I'm okay. Their eyes met, and Hazel let herself release all her pent-up confusion and frustration. Whether he could read it in her eyes or not, she didn't know. He certainly saw something, because concern entered his expression as he swept one arm around her waist and drew her into a half-embrace with Greta on his right hip. Come on, she said, hoping to play off the moment as something lighter than it was. Let's go get your dog. The next several minutes passed while he wrestled with the car seat and she played with Greta on the front lawn. Joy filled her at the wonder the little girl experienced with simply pushing a ball back and forth. Soon enough, her cries had turned into giggles, and Dylan had her seat ready. He scooped her up with a laugh, causing Greta to shriek and gut laugh in only a way a baby could. He strapped her into the seat, which sat right next to the passenger window, and he turned back to Hazel. I couldn't get it to go in the middle. Want me to drive and you can ride next to me? Sure. She handed over her keys and they piled into her truck. Ten easy minutes later, they arrived back at the ranch that Dylan and his brothers would be buying soon. The paperwork had been started, and now it was just a matter of time to get all the financial documents in order. Oh, Dwayne said we could have Dean and Chadwell, he said as he got out of the car. Hazel worked the buckles on the car seat and removed Greta twisting to pass her off to Dylan. That's great. I can't believe he's giving up two of his cowboys, but I suppose it's up to them where they work. Dylan clamped his lips together and nodded. His eyes roamed the road that struck east, forming the crossroads and epicenter of the ranch several hundred yards down. Dwayne's a good man. He extended his hand to help her out, and they faced the homestead together. In that moment, that single heartbeat, Hazel saw a whole future of them facing challenges and unexpected problems, and the best of times, together. Then he walked toward the front door, leaving her to wonder if he felt the same about her, if he wanted to spend forever with her, if he was willing to build a life with her the way he seemed so willing to rebuild this ranch. Twenty minutes later, she sat behind the wheel while Dylan juggled the eight-week-old German shepherd pup, a chuckle coming from him every few seconds. Hold still, bud, he said, but the dog didn't quite know how. They had a scraggly blanket in the back of the truck, along with a gallon-sized zipper bag of dog food Shaley had been feeding the puppies, two toys, and his paperwork. Dylan cooed at the dog the same way he did Greta, and again, Hazel liked it. Once back at the ranch, he took Greta and Titan in his cabin, where the back corner behind the dining table had been sectioned off with a couple of homemade gates. He put Titan in the square, which also had a bowl of water and an empty bowl for food. He poured some in, talking to the dog all the while. Shane'll be home soon, and then you'll meet Cinna, he told Titan. She's a great dog, so you have to learn from her. Do what she does. He turned to find Greta reaching for the remote control to the television, and he darted toward her. Nope, 
not that little miss. He grinned at her and picked her up. Should we go see if your mom is feeling better? May sick? Hazel looked in the direction of the other cabin as if she could see through walls. Caught a summer cold, didn't sleep last night. Her dad on some task with Duane on the east edge of the ranch, and I told May I'd take Greta for an hour or two so she could sleep. Someone knocked on the door, and Dylan called for them to come in. Dean entered, followed by two more cowboys. Gabe and Chadwell, if Hazel remembered right, and she wasn't entirely sure she had. The German shepherd abandoned his food and put his front paws up on the chicken wire as the men came closer. You got him, Dean said, glancing at Dylan. He grinned at him and then met Hazel's eyes. Oh, hello, ma'am. His smile was quick and genuine, and Hazel returned it. Okay, let me take Greta, she said, stepping over to Dylan. She took the girl from him and carried her into the kitchen. You hungry, baby? When had she started cooing at this tiny human the way Dylan did? She glanced over to him, but he was absorbed with his friends and his dog, thankfully. She opened the fridge and pulled out what looked like leftover spaghetti. Dylan couldn't have made this, but she figured it was free to eat. After a minute-long spin in the microwave, she cut up pieces of noodles and let Greta use her fingers to eat them. The cabin was small, true. Only one bedroom in the loft. But with her, the baby, Dylan, his friends, and the dog, it felt like a little corner of heaven where she wanted to live. A feeling descended upon her she hadn't experienced in a long time. Contentment. She didn't need a new job. She didn't need a date every other night. She didn't need a big house in the center of town that everyone could see. She needed a family. People who cared about her and put her at the top of their priority list. Dylan met her eyes, a broad smile on his face to match his impossibly wide shoulders. And she knew in that moment that she'd fallen in love with him. Monday presented her with a new case on the outskirts of Austin. She texted Dylan on her way out of town. She spent a few days there, talking to residents and trying to find evidence of the cougar they sweared they'd seen. She never saw it, and in the past, she might have written off the eyewitness accounts of the mountain lion. However, she'd seen such a creature, and it had been terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. She returned in time for the weekend, but when she texted Dylan, he said he and his brothers had decided to go visit their mother in San Antonio. So Hazel turned to Jason and Michaela, determined not to stay home alone just because her boyfriend had family plans. Hazel used to dress up and go out all the time. She liked it. Of course, she liked it more when the handsome man on the other side of the door was Dylan. But when Jason beeped the horn, Hazel bounded down the steps to join him in the car with a healthy smile on her face. Where's Michaela? She asked, leaning into the passenger side without climbing in. Got called in for an emergency. On a Friday night? Hazel opened the door and got in the car. Terse broke down, was desperate and called her after hours number. You know, she can't resist the money. He chuckled as he pulled away from the curb. And you're not at the shop tonight. I hired two twenty-somethings to do the evening shifts, he said. Male and female. He cut her a grin. They get along great, if you know what I mean. Hazel laughed with him and relaxed into the headrest, a sigh slipping from her mouth. So it's me and you tonight. Grilled cheese at the movie theater? Who oh, no, he said. If you want grilled cheese, let's go make one in the back of the shop. I want to see a movie, she said. We can get dinner there. The only thing I'll eat is pizza at the theater. Snob. She pushed against his arm, enjoying the playfulness they'd always had as friends. I'll buy the food if you buy the tickets. Deal. He drove a few more blocks before hitting the weekend traffic, which would soon worsen as they flocked to town for the summer season. So, where's Dylan this wonderful Friday night? Hazel looked out the window, her voice a little too casual when she said, Busy with his family. Jason didn't notice or didn't press the issue, and Hazel managed to enjoy herself with her friend. Only a few fleeting thoughts about Dylan puncturing her evening. And she decided when Jason dropped her off and she went inside to her two English bulldogs that she liked getting out of the house, sure. But going out with Dylan was definitely more magical. She missed him more than she wanted to admit. But she forced herself not to text him. He was with his family. She could wait. Couldn't she? 
Chapter 21 Dylan lost track of which day it was. After visiting his mother in San Antonio for the weekend, he worked the ranch, met with Curtin Duane, trained his dog to go to the bathroom outside, sleep on his feet and not his face, and walk on a leash. Titan was a champion, and he looked at Dylan for everything. He had to go through old paperwork from the sale of the ranch, print out documents from his bank, and countless other little tasks that weighed on him. Shane was going through the same thing, but he seemed better equipped to deal with a thousand and one tasks than Dylan did. He realized that his older brother had been managing such things for 15 years, and he appreciated Shane even more. Dylan ached to see Hazel, inhale that frosted peach pie scent of her skin, and kiss her lips. But he had to settle for quick phone calls and lengthy texts while Austin snored in the bed beside him. She didn't seem too put out by their lack of contact, which was good because things only got worse the next week. Paperwork to be signed, and boxes to be packed, and new contracts to be negotiated. Everything happened quickly, and May disappeared into June. His dog grew bigger, and before Dylan knew it, he was loading everything he owned into the back of a moving truck. He focused on the work, trying to ignore the summer heat that had descended on Hill Country. Shane passed him as he exited the house. Hazel's here. Dylan's step stuttered in time with his pulse. He set the two boxes he was carrying on the railing and flew down the steps, searching for her. Her red truck sat down the road a bit, more in front of Kurt's than his cabin, which made sense given the moving truck taking up the rest of the lane. She came around the large vehicle, and Dylan froze. Her hair was half as long as it had been the last time he'd seen her. It framed her face now, the curls barely brushing her shoulders. Not only that, but she'd put light streaks in it, making it more blonde than brown now. She wore a pair of jean shorts that went halfway down her thigh, running shoes, and a cherry red sleeveless shirt that revealed the muscles in her arms. She wore a smile, too, and tucked her hands in her back pockets as she turned her walk into more of a sachet. Hey, stranger, she drawled, that sassy, flirty grin on her perfect face. Hazel, he breathed wondering how his lungs had managed to keep functioning for the past few weeks without seeing her each and every day. He closed the distance between them and swept her into his arms, that sweet, fruity smell hitting him full in the chest. Around him, men called to each other. His brothers continued to load boxes. A dog barked, not Titan, but Dylan held on to the feel of Hazel in his arms, the scent of her skin, the sound of her soft laughter. Moving day, she said backing up, an edge in her eyes Dylan hadn't seen in a while. Wariness, like what she'd worn in her expression the first time she'd teased him about his dancing and whistling on the front porch next door. And I had to find out from Austin. Hazel towed the ground, her eyes suddenly magnetic to the grass there. I told you, Dylan said. Hadn't he? She shook her head, her playfulness gone. The wariness had morphed into disappointment and sadness and it punched the air right out of his lungs. He didn't. Frustration welled within him, and he raked his hands down his face, slightly unseating his cowboy hat. I meant to, obviously. He repositioned his hat, his throat suddenly dry and scratchy. I'm sorry. Dylan, Shane called, and he turned back toward the cabin. His brother waved him to join him on the porch, one hand holding the phone to his ear. He didn't look happy, and he turned away as he spoke. Dylan wasn't aware of the call he'd needed to be involved with, but Shane clearly needed him. I'll be right back, he said. Yeah, yeah, of course, she said. You go. I'm gonna... I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna go too. She hooked a thumb over her shoulder and backed up a few steps. Call me, you know, if you have time. Hazel turned and walked away, and Dylan watched her go, frozen and numb as he tried to figure out what she just said. Are you breaking up with me? He called after her. She turned around without breaking her stride. Yes, she called back. Even though she'd put two dozen feet of distance between them, Dylan still saw the way her chin trembled. Now she clutched her fingers together to prevent them from shaking. He wasn't close enough to see her tears, but she swept one hand across her cheek before spinning around and striding toward her truck, clearly anxious to get away from the ranch as fast as possible. No. Not the ranch. Him. Hazel wanted to get away from him as fast as possible. 
Dylan, Shane called again, and Dylan spun away from the red truck before he could see it tear down the dirt road. What? He snapped as he climbed the steps. Shane looked as angry as Dylan felt, and he shoved the phone at him. It's dad. I need you to deal with this right now. Dylan took the phone, his anger fading to that horrible numbness again. He didn't want to deal with his father either. Not right now, not today. Dad, he said, putting the phone up to his ear. I'm here. Now's not a good time. Dylan hung up without giving his father a chance to say anything else. He started scrolling through the phone as desperation coiled and built inside him. Why couldn't he find Hazel's number? His mind wasn't working, and he glanced up at Shane when he came back onto the porch. What did you tell him? He plucked the phone from Dylan's fingers, and it was in that moment that Dylan realized he wasn't holding his own device. No wonder he couldn't find Hazel's number. What's wrong? Shane pocketed the phone and peered more closely at Dylan. His throat felt raw, and the sun was so blasted hot. He swiped off his cowboy hat and wiped his forehead. What did Dad say to you? Dylan shook his head, everything inside him tight, tight, tight. Not Dad, he swallowed, trying to make sense of things. Hazel broke up with me. Shock passed across Shane's face. She did, just now? Dylan nodded, his eyes hot. Well, call her, Shane said, looking past Dylan. We're fine here, go get her. Dylan turned and saw the dust settling from where her truck had kicked it up into the air. I can't go get her. He ducked his head, his feelings hardening. We're moving today. Dylan, I'm fine, Shane. He spun away and went back into the cabin, but he couldn't make his eyes settle on the next thing that needed to be carried out. A week later, Dylan was seriously wondering if he and his brothers had lost their minds. There was so much work to do around the ranch. They'd all been working 16-hour days, and barely a dent had been made. At least the endless work didn't allow him to obsess over Hazel. She was there in his mind anyway, all the time. When something happened, he wanted to text her and tell her. When he'd moved in, he wanted to show her where he was living now. When he'd finally talked to his father and found out he'd been trying to get their mailing address so he could send a ranch warming gift, he wanted to call Hazel and rant to her about him. He hadn't texted her once, nor had he called. She said to call him when he had time, and honestly, he didn't have time. Was he selfish for wanting it all? The ranch, the German shepherd, and the woman? Other men seemed to be able to make things work. Why couldn't he? He pushed the thoughts out of his mind and set another nail in the gate he was fixing on a horse stall. Shane and Robin's relationship wasn't brand new. They'd been through rough weather before, and she'd been by Shane's side all week. Her trailer now parked down on the end of Cabin Row, as Austin had dubbed the Lane of Cabins. She wouldn't be able to stay there forever, as Dylan had plans to add at least four more cabins to the line. But for now, she was fine. She'd be moving into the homestead with Shane once they were married anyway. For now, all three brothers were all living in the homestead, with Shane in the master bedroom down the hall from the kitchen on the main level. Austin and Dylan were upstairs, almost above the garage, but Dylan hated it. The room was too quiet without Austin, and that hadn't helped his slight sleeping habits. He'd spent the last seven days doing carpentry, fixing animal pens in the stables for horses they didn't have, as he was right now. Well, Shane had brought one horse with him from Grapeseed Ranch. A ranch with one horse. What a joke. He'd fix up the cabins first, because Dean and Chadwell were moving in later that day. Shane had a few more cowboys coming for interviews in the next week and they needed the room and board to be inviting, because they sure couldn't afford to pay the men much. Finished with the stable for now, Dylan packed up his tools, said, Come on, Titan, and returned to the small shed beside the barn with his dog at his side. The building held a riding lawnmower, and a tool bench ran along the back wall. Handheld tools, like hammers, screwdrivers, and more littered the surface, and he returned the few he'd been using with a long sigh. Weed whackers, leaf blowers, rakes, and larger tools hung on nails on the walls, and Dylan was grateful the ranch had come with all the tools and equipment they'd need to run it, or at least try to run it. Shane insisted they meet every evening to discuss what they'd gotten done that day and what the next day would bring. He'd been working with Shay to know how things had been done on the ranch before they'd arrived, 
which pastures were next in the rotation, where the cattle were, and where the water was on the land. Austin had been working with Oker and Carlos, getting a feel for what it took to keep the smaller animals watered and fed, what state the equipment was in, and what the ranch hands did all day, and where everything was located. Each night, Dylan barely had the energy to drop to his knees and thank the Lord for the ranch where they'd landed. But he hadn't missed a night since learning buying Triple Tower's ranch might actually be an option. No matter how tired he was, he made sure to thank God for the opportunity to be where he was in Hill Country, on this ranch with his family. Since moving on to the ranch, he'd added a plea for Hazel to his brief ministrations before bed. Just a quick sentence about keeping her safe, helping her to be happy, or giving him the courage to call her the next day. It still hadn't happened. He stood in the shade of the tool shed, tightened panting at his feet, the heat seeping through the wood and making the air smell like dust and timber. Hazel had been so good at telling him what was on her mind, and she had encouraged him to do the same. Picturing her, he wondered what she was doing right that moment, on this bright, clear Saturday summer morning. He pulled out his phone and dialed her before he lost his confidence. The line rang and rang, and she didn't pick up. A slip of relief moved through Dylan, making his voice stronger when he spoke to her voicemail. Hey, Hazel, he said. It's Dylan. He hoped she hadn't deleted his number from her phone. Um, well, I guess I've just been thinking a whole lot about you, and I miss you. His voice stuck in his throat after that, though he felt like he had more to say to her. I'll call you later, he finished and hung up. Air whooshed out of his lungs, and he turned away from the hammers and nails and assorted nuts and bolts. After all, there was too much work to do to stand around feeling sorry for himself. Chapter 22 Hazel stared at the picture she'd just hung on the wall, her phone held to her ear as Dylan's voice came through the speaker. He'd called. When she'd seen his name on her display, she thought she'd been pranked. That Jason had somehow figured out how to make his call look like it had come from Dylan. But no, there was his bass voice coming through the line, saying pretty things like, I've been thinking about you, and I miss you. She hadn't been able to stop thinking about him, and the way she missed him bordered on obsessive. Knocking pulled her attention from the message and the trance she'd fallen into while listening to it. Coming, she called, ending the call and setting the phone on the desk in her salon. She met Leslie in the kitchen. Oh, good, you came in. You don't have to knock. Hazel had put a magnetic sign on the door that read, Hair by Hazel on the top line, with, Come on in beneath that. Her house didn't have a separate entrance for the salon, but her customers didn't seem to mind. Hazel tried to have bottled water in the fridge for every client who came, along with something they liked. For some, it was a cookie. For others, granola bars. Leslie set her purse on the counter and picked up the snack pack of crackers. I'm assuming these are for me. Peanut butter and cheese crackers, all you. Hazel grinned at her. How are things at the office? The same, she said following Hazel down the short hall to the salon. Well, besides your stacks of folders and empty soda cans. She grinned at Hazel in the mirror, sobering quickly. You okay, sweetie? Hazel pulled herself together as best she could. Yeah, sure, I'm okay. She started fluffing Leslie's dark hair. What were you thinking today? Oh, the same. Leslie adjusted herself in the chair while Hazel draped her with the cape. You know me. No adventurous bones in this body. Hazel laughed. She washed, she cut. She went through all the motions, and when Leslie left, Hazel twisted the lock on her doors and sank onto the couch. Monty wandered over and collapsed onto the floor in front of her, a huff coming from his mouth. I know, she said, letting her hand drape over the side of the couch so she could pat him. What she was answering for the dog, she didn't know. But she did know her life had gone back to hollow now that Dylan had vacated it. I miss you, he called. And he hadn't asked her to call him back. He said he'd call her again later. She got up and retrieved her phone from the salon, dialing as she went back to the couch. Michaela, she said when her friend picked up. Dylan called. What should I do? I'll be over in ten minutes. Michaela hung up without another word, and Hazel smiled to herself for the first time in weeks. 
Hazel had coffee brewing graham crackers set out when Michaela burst through the front door. He called? Hazel nodded and ripped open the first package of graham crackers. When? Michaela asked, tossing her purse onto the couch. What did he say? Nodding to the phone, Hazel asked. Coffee? Of course. Michaela swiped the phone from the counter while Hazel poured coffee and got out cream and sugar. With everything assembled, they sat at the bar together. Hazel broke a graham cracker along the seam and dipped it in her coffee. Michaela put the voicemail message on speaker, and Dylan's wonderful voice filled the whole house. Hey, Hazel, it's Dylan. Pause. Um, well, I guess I've just been thinking a whole lot about you, and I miss you. Pause. I'll call you later. Hazel met her friend's eyes, which were wide and sparkly. He'll call you later. We'll see, Hazel said. Do you want him to call you later? Hazel shrugged, tired of the constant war in her head. He's busy right now. Maybe once everything's settled. In her heart, she wanted Dylan to choose her over the ranch. But such thoughts made her feel like the most selfish woman on the planet. And she hadn't vocalized them to anyone, not even Michaela. Have you figured it out yet? Michaela asked next, deftly moving from the subject of Dylan calling to something else. Oh, I love the salon, she said. It makes me happy. What else? Summertime, Hazel gave Michaela a side smile. Going out to eat, baking cookies, you and Jason. She put her hand over her friends. She also had never told Michaela that spending time with her and Jason was akin to torture. Seeing them so happy, their fingers entwined, the way they whispered to each other, and had stars of love in their eyes had only served to remind her of what she didn't have what she thought she didn't want. But since she'd broken up with Dylan, she challenged herself to figure out what made her happy and to try to get it. So she'd quit her job at Texas Parks and Wildlife, learned how to bake the perfect chocolate chip cookie, and reopened her salon. She had clients every day, but she'd need to increase her workload in order to live once her savings ran out. And, Michaela prompted, Hazel knew what she wanted her to say, knew what she wanted to tell her. So she said, Dylan Collie makes me happy. If only she knew what to do about it. Maybe you should call him back. Michaela lifted the carton of cream and poured a splash into her coffee. Maybe I should. Hazel wanted to, but she had no idea what to say. She didn't want to resent him because he was busy chasing his dream. She couldn't expect him to give them up just because she felt neglected. But that wasn't it at all, and she knew it. No. The reason Dylan's dedication to the new ranch, his new life, was because it reminded her all too much of her relationship with Peter. His dreams always came before hers. His needs superseded hers. He walked away when he wanted, came home when he wanted, did whatever he wanted. And she'd been down that path before, and she didn't need to have a redo. No siree. So it had been easier to end things with him before he ripped her heart out and squeezed the life from it all while she waited and watched, a willing participant. Most days, she was proud she'd taken the initiative to break up with him. But some days, she simply wanted to drive out to his new ranch and beg him to take her back. Should we order in? Michaela asked. Wings delivers now. You're not going to meet Jason? Oh, sure, later, at the ice cream shop. Of course she was. She had a boyfriend who owned a busy business and still had time for her. Hazel swallowed the bitterness and managed to say, All right, yeah, let's order in, without giving away how she really felt. Hazel did not call Dylan back. He hadn't asked her to, and she didn't know what to say to him anyway. At times, her desperation to drive out to his new ranch and see how things were going nearly choked her. Other times, she made it through several appointments without thinking about him at all. She wasn't sure which she liked better. A week passed, and she went to church on Sunday. She hadn't seen Dylan in two weeks since she'd broken up with him, and though she scanned every face beneath the cowboy hat, she couldn't find him today either. She sat on the end of the bench, on the back left side of the church, almost in the shadows from the balcony above. For some reason, she didn't want to sit next to Jason and Michaela and bask in all their lovey-dovey glow. Maybe that made her a bad person. Maybe she was just employing some self-preservation. No matter what, 
She enjoyed the sermon much better when she wasn't tasting the jealousy on her tongue. Pastor Gifford spoke about taking time each day to enjoy God's goodness. Hazel wasn't sure when the last time she'd done such a thing. Even something as simple as a rose bush in your backyard, the minister said, can give you a moment to remember the Lord and all he's done for you. Hazel determined to find something simple like a rose bush, the way her dogs greeted her each day, or the rising of the sun to help remind her of the Lord. Every day, just something little. The meeting ended and she hurried out the door and into the bright sunlight before she had to talk to anyone. Her phone rang just as she pulled out of the parking lot, and she swiped on the call from her mother. Mom, she said, how are you? Good enough. Didn't hear from you last week. No accusation rode in the words, just concern. Hazel usually initiated the calls, and her mom had obviously called today in case Hazel wouldn't. Yeah, I was. Hazel couldn't finish the sentence. She certainly wasn't busy, though she had visited the big tense events just outside of town and done a few haircuts as demos, handed out hundreds of business cards. How's the salon going? Good. Hazel turned left and drove away from downtown. Great. I got about six new clients last week's from the demos I did at the swap meet last weekend. Six new clients? That's fantastic, sweetie. Her mom meant it, too. She didn't have a malicious bone in her body. So you're staying busy. Definitely. Hazel Street came into view, but she didn't slow down. If she kept going, she could take the next right and head north, toward the turnoff that would take her out to Grapeseed and Triple Towers. Her mom started talking about Evan and the woman he'd just asked to marry him. Her joy came through in every word, and Hazel passed her street and made the right turn. It was only a matter of minutes before her mom asked her about Dylan. She'd managed to avoid telling anyone past Michaela and Jason about the breakup. Even her boss and friends at work just thought she'd quit to start her salon back up. Which, of course, was why she'd quit. Dylan had nothing to do with that decision, though he probably was a catalyst for Hazel to really consider what made her happy. She'd always had a measure of bravery. At least she had until the disastrous relationship with Peter. So how are you and Dylan? Her mom asked. Things got serious fast. Might there be another wedding this year? Hazel snorted, the ridiculousness of the question making her head pound. No, Mom. Ah, uh, well, Dylan is really busy with his new ranch. So he ended up buying it. Yep. Maybe if she gave simple answers, her mom would get the hint and go back to talking about the rest of the family. How is it? Hazel looked down the road that would lead her back to him, but she didn't turn. I don't really know, Mom. We broke up. A gasp came through the line and Hazel closed her eyes in a long blink though she was still driving. Pulling over, she said, It's not a big deal, Mom. We've been dating for a few weeks, that's it. Are you okay? I'm fine, she insisted, though her heart recoiled at the statement. He wasn't Peter. What does that mean? Hazel gazed down the long stretch of road, the brown wild grasses waving along the side for the road. It means, Mom, that I hadn't invested everything in him. I'm okay. You seemed to like him. I did like him. She leaned her head against the glass, once again wondering if she'd been foolish when she'd broken up with Dylan. But he hadn't seemed to have time for her, and she just couldn't repeat the same mistakes she'd made with Peter. So what's stopping you two from being together? Ah, that was the question of the year, wasn't it? Hazel couldn't answer it but she had to remember how she'd felt in the few weeks when Dylan was too busy to see her. His texts had decreased, and she'd had to hear from Austin when they were moving. Everyone gets busy, she told herself, but she'd felt like he'd abandoned her just because a ranch had come along. And Peter had done the same thing, and Hazel just couldn't go through a similar situation again. I don't know, Mom. Think about it. I will. Hazel listened to her mom talk about how her dad's cholesterol had gone up since his last blood test and how he wouldn't give up hiding Snickers bars in various drawers around the house. She laughed and told her mom she loved her and the call ended. Hazel still sat on the side of the road, the question, what's stopping you from being together, running through her mind? Her phone vibrated and she glanced at it, realizing that she'd missed a call while she'd been on the call with her mom. A call from Dylan.
Chapter 23 Dylan left another message for Hazel, this time adding, We're just hanging around today. If you want to come out, I'll come pick you up. He pressed his eyes closed and wished he could delete the words, delete the voicemail, delete the whole day and just start over. He didn't know what else to say to cover that, so he just said, Talk to you later, and hung up, staring at his phone like it had somehow bewitched him into leaving a ridiculous message. He shook his head. What had come over him? Maybe it was a pure exhaustion. He, Shane, and Austin had agreed to only do light chores on the Sabbath and really try to rest as much as possible. Both of his brothers were currently taking naps, and Robin would be coming out later with steaks and salads for a Sunday afternoon picnic. Dylan felt restless, and he'd escaped the walls of the house to explore the ranch a little bit. He'd gone down the lane in front of the cabins. The air was fresh and the wind clean, and he felt at home on this ranch though he'd only been there for two weeks. But it wasn't quite the home he'd envisioned, because Hazel wasn't there. His footsteps faltered, and he paused in a patch of shade. His heart thundered in his chest. Home was where Hazel was. I need her, he whispered to himself. I love her. His feet seemed to have grown roots, because he couldn't get them to move, though they were screaming at him to go. Go now and get over to her house. She'd probably gone to church, and sometimes Pastor Gifford's sermons went a little long. He didn't normally do that in the middle of the summer knowing that his patrons liked to get out with their families in the afternoons. But what other reason would Hazel have to ignore his calls? His mouth filled with the bitter taste, and it seemed like pain swooped from his throat to the bottom of his stomach. Maybe she'd blocked his number. Maybe he'd never be able to talk to her again. No. A fire started in his blood, and he turned around and strode back toward the homestead and a truck that would take him to Hazel. If she wouldn't pick up her phone, he'd go to her house. He veered onto Grapeseed Ranch as he started to go by it, his mind waffling between heading straight to Hazel's and trying to reconcile or just letting her have the space she clearly wanted. She hadn't called him back, and he'd let eight days go by before phoning her again. Felicity met him at the top of the steps of the homestead, a knowing look on her face. Thought I might see you around here sooner or later. She headed for the door and ushered him inside. Dylan didn't have to say anything. He simply went in to enjoy the air conditioning and whatever Felicity would put in front of him. Where are the other boys? She asked, though she couldn't be much older than Dylan. Napping, he said, settling onto a bar stool. I can't even seem to sleep at night, much less during the day. Hmm. She pulled out a carton of eggs and filled a pot with water. How long are you going to be here? Dunno. Dylan ran his hand under his hat and through his hair. Is it Hazel? He saw no point in denying it. He'd come here to talk to someone who might be able to help him. All Shane had said in the 15 days since Hazel had ended their relationship was, go talk to her. He really hoped Felicity wouldn't say the same thing. Yes. She nodded and dropped nine eggs into the pot, set it on the stove, and cranked the flame underneath it. So what are you thinking? Dwayne came through the back door, clapping his hands together. You should have seen Bulletproof, he said. He took the bit like he'd been chomping on it his whole life. He caught sight of Dylan and continued toward the kitchen sink. Hey, Dylan. When his hands were clean, he pushed Felicity's hair behind her ear and kissed her cheek. Hey, darling. He grinned at her, and they shared something secret Dylan could only dream about. Be careful, Felicity said, a teasing note in her tone. You'll make all the other horses jealous the way you go on about bulletproof. His smile only widened and he took in the ingredients Felicity had laid out. Are you making potato salad? Dylan wants to talk about Hazel. She shrugged one shoulder and kept peeling potatoes. I never said that. You did, you just didn't use words. Duane said, let me shower and I'll be right back. He disappeared down the hall and Dylan enjoyed the comfortable atmosphere of this house. It felt serene, like anything could be said here, nothing would be judged. Any news on the adoption stuff? he asked, remembering his manners. We made it through the first round, Felicity said, her face lighting up. So our profile will be made soon, and then we'll see if a birth mom chooses us. Someone's gonna take one look at you and Duane and pick you, Dylan said with more confidence than he'd felt in a long, long time. Thank you. Felicity fell silent, 
moving around the kitchen as she chopped, boiled, and diced potatoes, eggs, and pickles for the salad. Duane returned to the kitchen wearing a pair of loose sweats and a t-shirt. What'd I miss? He won't say much. Have you talked to her? Duane asked, coming around the bar to sit beside Dylan. Shaking his head, he said, I've called a couple of times. She doesn't answer. She doesn't call back. I had to drive to Marysville to get Felicity back. Against his sister's advice, Felicity folded mayonnaise and mustard into the potatoes. She salted the salad and mixed it some more. It worked out okay, I think. She flashed him a tender smile. So I should go over there, and what? I've already called twice. Have you apologized? Dwayne asked. Dylan sighed and pushed his hat further over his eyes. That's just it. I don't even know what I did wrong. Probably should find out, Dwayne said. And then apologize for it, Felicity said. Oh, and tell her you love her. I sure liked it when Dwayne said that. She pulled three bowls from the cupboard and dished up the potato salad. It's not as good cold, but it's still decent. I like it warm, Dwayne said, pulling his bowl closer and digging in. Dylan loved Felicity's potato salad, too and he took a few bites of the salty, creamy concoction. So you're saying, I just drive over there, apologize, and tell her I love her. The order you say things doesn't really matter, Felicity said. Lead with, I love you, Duane advised. You do love her, right? A sense of rightness moved through Dylan, and he once again saw no point in denying it. Yeah. Don't sound so happy about it, Felicity joked, a soft smile in her face. Hazel is a reasonable woman. She'll forgive you. Dwayne nodded. And if she doesn't, just keep going back until she does. Did you have to do that? Felicity and Dwayne exchanged a glance. Not really, he said. But she had some stipulations to our relationship. That sounds so like I'm so selfish, Felicity said. She faced Dylan. I'm not traditional. We needed to be on the same page. That's all. The same page, Dylan echoed. He had no idea what book Hazel was even operating in right now, but there was no better time to find out. Forty minutes later, he'd parked on the street in front of her place, his nerves crowding into the back of his mouth and the potato salad he'd eaten rolling in his gut. Her truck sat in the carport, and he got out and approached the side door, which now bore a sign that said, Hair by Hazel, come on in. He knocked instead of opening her door and entering her home unannounced. Just a sec. Her voice, even muted through the door, made every cell in his body sing. When she whipped open the door to reveal herself in a pale pink top and a short pair of black shorts, Dylan couldn't even speak. Both of her dogs crowded the doorway, their happy faces nearing and their noses sniffing like mad. They could probably smell Titan, and Dylan let them smell his hand and lick them. He didn't remove his eyes from Hazel's. In the few weeks they'd been apart, he'd forgotten how beautiful she was, how sexy, how kind. Dylan, she said. His name in her voice unlocked his vocal cords. I called you a couple of times. I know. I want you to come out to the ranch this afternoon. I'll listen to the messages. Dylan wasn't sure if he should be glad that she had, especially since she hadn't returned his calls, or texted, or anything. She looked at him evenly, though he could see her pulse dancing in her neck. She seemed as nervous as him, and Dylan had no idea what to do or say. He wasn't even really sure why she'd broken up with him. I need a haircut, he blurted out. Do you have any appointments today? She tilted her head to the side and appraised him. I suppose I have a few minutes before the bread comes out. She backed up, keeping her grip tight on the door. He entered her house having only been there a few times, and glanced around. It looked like a completely different person lived there. There were no piles of mail on the table, no work jackets strewn over the back of the couch. The countertop was clean, and the scent of honey and yeast hung in the air. You bake? I've taken a few classes lately, she said with a casual air that indicated she'd been doing quite a lot without his knowledge. And you opened a salon. Hmm, she gestured down the hall somewhere he hadn't gone. It's in the spare bedroom. After you. He stepped in front of her, 
very aware of the weight of her eyes on his back as he took the few steps and entered the salon. Tons of light spilled through the large windows with all the blinds open. The salon chair he'd seen beside the back door now sat proudly in the middle of the room, with a black rubber mat surrounding it. A large mirror had been mounted on the wall, and his skinny desk sat against the wall just inside the door. Two plants adorned the surface, and he couldn't quite identify the scent hanging in the air. It was probably something like orange cinnamon bun or something crazy like that. Hazel preferred those fancy designer scents, and Dylan had missed the peachy sweet smell of her skin. Right here, he moved toward the chair. Sit on down, she said. Take off your hat. He complied and handed it to her so she could set it on the desk. When Hazel didn't touch him or make any move to put a cape around his neck, he turned toward her. She stared at him, her hands clenched tightly together. What are you doing here? She asked, her voice timid and tiny. Dylan hated it. Hated that he made her feel anything but wonderful. I miss you, he said, swallowing back his nerves. If there was ever a time for him to say how he felt, it was right here, right now. I don't like my life without you in it. I wanted to see you, so I came to see you. He drew in a deep breath. That ranch isn't home without you there. I want you there, not just this afternoon for dinner, but always. Hazel. He stood and took a step toward her, stalling when she stiffened. Hazel, he said again, his lips sticking and his throat dry. I love you. The words flowed from his mouth, lifting his heart and making the room spin slightly. I'm in love with you. Tears gathered in her eyes, and one splashed her cheek. She made no move to wipe it away. I'm not sure what I did, he said, but I'll fix it. Just tell me what it is, and I won't do it again. He reached out and gently took her fingers into his. They trembled violently, and he stroked them until they were calm. Please, Hazel. Please tell me what I did wrong so I can make it right. Chapter 24 Hazel didn't want to tell Dylan what he'd done wrong. It sounded stupid inside her own brain, and she'd been battling with her emotions for five weeks. But he stood before her in all his handsome cowboy glory, from that charcoal hat to his black polo to those long, jean-clad legs. He'd been brave. She wondered how much courage it took to drive into town to see someone who wouldn't call you back. Sit down, she said more of a barking command than the gentle way she'd intended. Dylan blinked and returned to the salon chair. She pulled a drape from the hook along the back wall and fanned it around his neck. Her fingers brushed his skin as she snapped the cape, and a shiver ran from her shoulders to her toes. You just want this cleaned up? Yes, ma'am. Hazel melted from the outside in, her heart the last thing to thaw. Everything about him being here was so right and she knew she needed to employ the same bravery he had. I felt like you were too busy for us, she said, her scissors going snip, snip, snip along the longer hair on top of his head. The new ranch came first, and that bothered me. I know that makes me into a bad person, but honestly, their eyes met in the mirror, and Dylan seemed only interested in what she had to say. Go on, he urged. It reminded me too much of Peter, she swallowed her fingers working through Dylan's hair as if they had a mind of their own. He always did what he wanted, molded me into what he wanted, and I was always on the outside looking in, always at home waiting for him. You, it felt the same. She went back to the cut because it was easier to focus on his hair than his beautiful eyes. And when you didn't even tell me you were moving, I felt abandoned, and I've never gone out with a man twice since Peter walked out on me, until you. Snip, snip, snip. His hair fell to the floor and she pushed him right and left and back to make sure she got it all even. I'm so sorry, he finally said. I can see what you mean now, but I didn't mean to act like that. The situation was tense on a lot of levels. I know that. She put the scissors on the shelf in front of him and plugged in the trimmers. With her back to him and her eyes down, she didn't have to see his face which made it easier to keep talking. And that's why I said I'm a bad person. I should have been more patient or something, but I just couldn't. She switched on the trimmers, the electric buzzing sound made talking a little harder. 
She turned them off again, turned toward him, and looked right into his eyes. I know life gets busy sometimes. Bad things happen and make situations hard. Heck, good things can bring tension and stress. But I don't want to be number two, ever. She lifted her chin. I did that for years, and I was made to feel that second best was all I could ever be. With every muscle in her chest quaking and her hands shaking too hard to hold the clippers, she added, I'm worth being picked first. She put the clippers down on the shelf and drew in a deep breath. Of course you are, Dylan said. Hazel, you are. He stood and gently turned her toward him, gathering her into his arms. She wrapped her arms around him, stealing his strength as she tried to inhale calmness into her still shaking lungs. She felt herself calm in the safety of his arms, the masculine scent of his cologne sinking into her senses. I'm sorry, he whispered. I want to always choose you first. I will choose you first in the future, I promise. He pushed away from her, his eyes as bright, as sincere as she'd ever seen them. Okay, I love you and I'll put you first. He was made of handsome lines and pretty words, and she believed him, she loved him. She nodded and a smile tugged at the corners of her mouth. There's one more thing I need. Name it. A kiss. Thankfully, Dylan's serious eyes crinkled, and he smiled as he lowered his mouth to touch hers. And finally, finally Hazel felt like she'd gotten it all. Wow, you've really done a lot of work here. Hazel glanced around as she got out of his truck. He'd insisted they go together in his truck though she'd said he'd have to drive her all the way back to town that evening. I don't care, Hazel. I want you right beside me. And then he kissed her like he loved her, and Hazel climbed into the truck and held his hand the whole way out to his new ranch. I've been working on all the buildings, he said. I think I'm getting closer to caught up. Then I'm going to build a few more cabins down on the end. More cabins? We need more ranch hands, he said. And there's not enough space for who we need. He glanced down the long road leading away from where they'd parked. I'm going to build my house out there too, I think. Hazel slipped her hand into his. Really? You want to live out with the ranch hands? Shane will always be the foreman, Dylan said. He was born for it. I was born as the middle child, the one who gets things done but quietly, on the outskirts. I'm sure that's not true. It is. It's why I like going out to the cabin in the north end zone at Grapeseed. He squeezed her hand and locked his eyes on hers. I'm okay with it. I used to hate my role in the family, among my brothers, but I'm fine with it now. In Austin, where will he live? There's a second house just down at the crossroads, he said. Remember how John was using it as his business headquarters? Well, it's cleaned out now, and it needs some major remodeling. Then Austin will move in there. How long would that take? It's down on the list a bit. Dylan started to move toward the house, and Hazel went with him. Oh, the dogs. She dropped his hand and turned back to let Milo and Monty out of the back of the truck. They jumped down, their paws puffing up dust and sprinted around. They'll calm down once they smell everything, she said, smiling at them. Titan will go nuts, Dylan chuckled, but he's potty trained now, and I've taught him to sit. So much progress, even while working and moving. Dylan froze, his gaze nervous. A twinge of guilt hit Hazel when she realized how what she'd said sounded. It's fine, Dylan. I don't expect you to ignore the needs of your new puppy. She tugged him toward the homestead. Come on, I can smell steak cooking and I'm starving. They went inside and found a flurry of activity with Austin stirring something on the stove, a panicked look on his face. Shane, he called, his gaze flying to her and Dylan when he heard the door close. A dog barked, and his claws slipped on the hard floor as Dylan's pup sprinted toward him. Milo and Monty panted and started circling the new dog, all tails whipping in circles. This is going to burn, Austin said, and Robin and Shane are out babysitting the steaks, and she said all I had to do was stir it. Like I can cook, Dylan said. He looked at Hazel. Maybe, he nodded toward Austin, and Hazel stepped up to the stove to see the barbecue sauce simmering nicely in the pot. It's fine, she said. Keep stirring. Shane came in through the back door and said, Dylan, Hazel. A smile formed on his face as he came closer. 
he drew Hazel into a quick side hug that felt like acceptance. Good to see you again. He sent a pointed glance at Dylan, who ignored him, and said, Why are you yelling at me? to Austin. I can't stir this, he said. I just wanted ten minutes alone with Robin, Shane grumbled, stepping over to the stove and taking the wooden spoon from his brother. Oh, please, Austin said. You don't need to be alone to kiss her. You do it constantly, right in front of me. I do not. Shane's tone suggested Austin stop talking immediately, and the youngest royal brother moved away, the message clearly received. Nice haircut, he said to Dylan. Thanks. Dylan surveyed the kitchen. What can we do to help? Go set the picnic table on the back porch, Shane said. We're eating outside? Yeah, that didn't sound all that fun to Hazel either, though she usually liked being outdoors. Austin got the outdoor air conditioner working. Shane took the pot off the stove and set it on the granite countertop. It's cool on the patio. Dylan led Hazel outside to a beautiful shaded patio, which indeed had air conditioning blowing from the vents in the ceiling above. What's up there? she asked. That's the balcony off my bedroom, he said. I wonder if my deck is heated in the winter. Nope, Austin joined them. And I fixed the shades, too. He indicated the sunshades that fell between the posts that held up the balcony. It's like another room out here, but without the real walls. Hazel loved the seemingly screened-in porch, the scent of browned meat, and the glorious Texas sunshine. But most of all, she loved the way her hand fit in Dylan's, and she loved that she felt accepted and at home on this ranch. And she turned to Dylan to say the words she wanted to at her house and hadn't been able to. I love you, she said. He jerked his gaze to hers, searching, examining, wondering. Yeah? She giggled. Yeah, I love you. Her laughter rolled out of her as he swept her into his arms and kissed her. Come on. Austin grumbled. Not you, too. August 25th. I'm so nervous. Shane looked like he was going to throw up. Dylan, unfortunately, knew how he felt. They were both dressed in black tuxedos that cost way too much money. But Shane's mother had insisted, saying, You only get married once. Then she looked right into Shane's eyes, then Dylan's, then Austin's. You boys make the right choice, and you'll only get married once. It should be in a tuxedo. She'd paid for the clothes, and surprisingly, their father had offered to pay for all the food at Shane's wedding dinner party, which would take place immediately following the ceremony. It's fine, Dylan said. You're fine. He straightened his brother's tie. You love her, and she loves you, and you're going to be blissfully happy in that huge homestead. Shane cocked his head. Are you trying to talk me out of this? She hates the size of the house. Dylan chuckled. Not everyone can be comfortable in 200 square feet. He stepped back and looked at Shane. Relax. This is a happy day. Enjoy it. He turned and took the new cowboy hat from Austin. They'd bought it together for their oldest brother. The man who had given up a lot of his own dreams to make sure the brothers all had this opportunity to be at Triple Towers together. We got you this. He dusted some invisible lint from the stunning black velvet cowboy hat. He beamed at Shane. It's your day, brother. Shane took the hat, a sniff the only indication of his emotion. He fitted it onto his head, completing the cowboy groom look so well that Dylan just knew Robin would be thrilled to see him at the end of the aisle. Three knocks sounded on the door, and Shane nearly jumped out of his boots. Relax, Dylan said one more time knowing that it was so much easier to say it than to actually do it. Austin opened the door and murmured something through the three-inch gap. They're ready for us, he said. Shane took a deep breath and lifted both arms so his brothers could come to him. They formed a triangle, their arms making the sides as they leaned in. Dylan remembered each and every time they'd done this, as boys before their sporting events, as men, right after their father abandoned them again with every ranch they went to, and minutes before they signed the paperwork on their ranch. Emotion filled Dylan. You deserve this, Shane, he whispered. We all do, Shane said, and we'll get it. He met Dylan's eyes and then Austin. I love you guys. 
Dylan and Austin repeated the sentiment, and they left the room to take their positions at the front of the chapel. Dylan sat between his mother and Hazel, leaning over to kiss his mom on the forehead before taking Hazel's hand in his. His throat felt like sand, and he wasn't even planning to propose until after the party. Austin sat on the other side of Hazel, with several cowboys filling the row, and leaving just enough space for Dylan's dad and his new wife on the end. Dylan hadn't seen him much since he'd only arrived in town that morning. Shane had put his foot down and said he didn't want him at the rehearsal dinner, but that he could attend the wedding and the party following it. His father hadn't argued, and Dylan thought he was probably realizing the damage he'd inflicted on his sons 16 years prior. His mother leaned over to whisper to him, How is he? Shane stood ten feet away, a bundle of nerves. He's fine, Dylan whispered back, willing Shane to calm down. Or he will be, once Robin comes out. As if Dylan could command things, the music switched to the wedding march, and he twisted toward the back of the chapel, standing a moment later as Robin appeared in the doorway, Duane on her arm, both of them beaming down the aisle. She didn't know who her father was, and she was an only child but she'd found acceptance and belonging with Shane and the cowboys at Grapeseed Ranch, just like Dylan and his brothers had. When Dwayne passed her to Shane, he leaned in and said something that made Shane grin. As Dylan had predicted, Shane calmed as soon as Robin was at his side. Pastor Gifford started the ceremony, and Dylan didn't hear too much of what he said. He got swept away in the romance of the wedding, and he stood and cheered when Shane dipped Robin back and kissed her. Hazel cuddled into a side, and Dylan imagined himself at the front of the crowd, kissing her as his wife. The dryness in his mouth disappeared. He wanted her to wear his diamond, and he suddenly found himself wishing the party was already over. And it hadn't even started yet. An hour later, he paced in the reception center, which smelled like flowers, freshly baked bread, and Hazel's ice-peached skin. They should be here by now. They're on their way. Hazel didn't even look up from her phone. Five minutes out. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Robin's mother stood at the microphone as she was the MC for the evening. She grinned at the double doors, but they stayed stubbornly closed. Dylan took a seat at the table with Duane and Felicity, Kurt and May, and Austin and his mother. Austin had his eyes glued to the table next to them, and Dylan followed his gaze to find him frowning at Shaley Hatch. She didn't even glance at him, her arms crossed tightly across her body. Dylan elbowed Austin and lifted his eyebrows. His brother shook his head, looking more disgruntled by the second. May I present Mr. and Mrs. Shane Royal? Robin's mother had a great announcer's voice, and she was clearly enjoying her part of the wedding. The double doors opened and Shane and Robin entered, lifting their hands as the crowd cheered. She wore a bright blue party dress that fell to her knees, her white blonde hair spiked up in her funky style. They made their way to the head table, where they would be the only two sitting. They seemed to shine like gold, and Dylan was overjoyed his brother had finally found his way to happiness. Dinner was served, and then the DJ started with the music. By the time Shane and Robin made their big departure, Dylan was dying to get his proposal out. Want to dance one more time? He whispered to Hazel. People were starting to head out and there was no music. She looked at him, a sparkly curiosity in her eyes. Right now. Right now. All right. She stood and turned toward the dance floor. Austin slipped him the ring box, and Dylan managed to get it in his pocket before following Hazel out to the floor. A song began to play, and Dylan nodded to the DJ, who had obviously been alerted to what was about to happen. Dylan swayed lazily with her a few times, gathering his courage the way she'd taught him. Hazel, he said. She lifted her head from his chest. Hmm? Without hesitation, for fear he might abandon his plans, he dropped to one knee and pulled the ring box from his pocket. A hush fell over the remaining crowd, and the DJ silenced the song. I'm in love with you. I want to dance with you every day of my life. Will you be my wife? He hadn't intended to rhyme. All his carefully practiced words that made the perfect proposal and vanished the moment he'd taken her into his arms for this final dance. He opened the lid on the ring box as her hands clutched at the collar of her dress. They shook, 
and Dylan loved that about her. Her golden eyes shone like stars as she nodded. Yes, she whispered. Relief rushed through Dylan and he stood, pulling the princess cut diamond out of the box and slipping it onto her left ring finger. She said yes, he called to the crowd as he lifted her now diamond-laden hand into the air. Cheering and applause came from his friends and family, and Dylan couldn't believe he was here, in this moment, experiencing such a momentous occasion. Just two months ago, he wondered if he'd made the biggest mistake of his life buying a ranch and letting Hazel get away from him. The past seven weeks with her had been pure bliss, and he worked to make sure she was always at the top of his list. He looked down at her, and everything, all the laughter, the music, the dim lights fell away. I love you, he said. And I love you. I'll build you whatever kind of house you want, he said. One with a walkout salon. He bent down and kissed her. Okay? Okay. She brushed her lips against his, a tease really, before saying, I can't wait to be your wife. And then she kissed him in a way that truly testified that what she'd said was true. Chapter One Austin Royal washed his hands with the best mechanic soap available, but the faint black lines of grease never really left his skin. It would have to be enough. He was already late, and there was nothing that made him jumpier than walking into church after the sermon had started, something his parents had ingrained in him since he was a boy. He took a few precious seconds to smooth his beard, thinking it had come in quite nicely, despite what his brother said. Then he swiped his cowboy hat from the dresser in his bedroom and headed downstairs. He shared the homestead with his oldest brother Shane and his wife Robin. They'd been married for about three months now, and everyone had worked out a system to keep from stepping on each other's toes. Dylan had taken over Robin's tiny house, a 208-foot square home that she'd parked way down on the end of Cabin Row, where Dylan spent most of his time anyway. He'd built one new cabin already, and had the skeleton of another going up. He worked with the cattle on the ranch the brothers had bought six months ago, and he was halfway through remodeling the home Austin would eventually move into. Austin grabbed his keys from the hook by the door in the kitchen. Going to church, he called, not really sure where everyone else was at the moment. Someone yelled back to him, and he skipped down the few steps in the garage to one of the trucks they owned. He was happier than he'd ever been since being forced to leave his family's ranch just outside of San Antonio. He just celebrated his 33rd birthday. By all accounts, Austin should be laughing while he counted his blessings. But a vein of anger existed in him he didn't know how to deal with. Always there, always just seething right below the surface, the negativity felt like a black plague on his soul. He'd been trying to get to church every week, and sometimes that helped but he was starting to suspect that it wasn't enough, that nothing would be able to cure him from this darkness he felt inside himself. He kept the music off as he drove, using the 30-minute drive to mentally run through his upcoming week. He craved this solitude, as he'd been working with the three ranch hands that had come with Triple Towers when he and his brothers had bought it. Ochre and Carlos were friendly enough. They'd educated all the brothers about where things were and how things were done. Shane had changed almost all of it, because the ranch was in complete disrepair, both physically and financially. Dylan had taken care of the outbuildings. Together, he and Shane were working on the pasture rotations, getting more hay planted, and dealing with all the legal rights with the water on the ranch. Austin had been tasked with all the horse care, which wasn't much, considering they had four horses. Shane had brought one over from Grapeseed Ranch, where the brothers used to work, and Dylan and his fiance Hazel and Austin had purchased a horse each from Levi Rhodes. Austin loved horses and didn't mind the time it took to care for them. Robin, who was a professional farrier, did quite a bit to keep them shod and healthy too. Austin's real love, surprisingly, came with the huge hen house that had come with the ranch. Shane had wanted to sell the chickens and knock down the coop in favor of something else. But Austin had taken a liking to the clucking, a methodical gathering of eggs, and the seemingly constant need to feed the beasts. With 104 chickens to care for, Austin spent a lot of time in that coop. It had become his sanctuary of sorts, and he wasn't sure if he should chuckle at that or take the fact of the matter to his grave. When he wasn't doing those tasks, he worked with Shaley in the equipment shed, thus the grease stains in his fingerprints. She'd been an army mechanic, 
and while she was as beautiful as an angel, she had the disposition of a cornered wildcat. He got along best with her out of anyone, so he'd been enduring hours with her in the afternoon, under her rough hand of correction, his patience thinning by the day. She went to the same church as him, but he deliberately didn't ask her to drive in with him, nor did he sit by her. He'd asked, once. The look of disdain she'd given him had been scathing enough to remind him each week that she was not interested. Fine by him. He needed the thirty minutes in and the thirty minutes back to recenter himself anyway, and her presence was anything but centering. He arrived in plenty of time to park where he wanted and sit on the far right side the way he liked. Sometimes a couple of cowboys he knew from other ranches and farms surrounding the town of Grapeseed Falls sat by him, but today the crowd was thin. Didn't matter. Austin needed to be there, even if it was just him and the minister. Pastor Gifford got up and said, Everyone must be home baking pies today. And Austin remembered that it was nearly Thanksgiving. His mother would be joining them on the ranch on the Wednesday before the holiday, and he'd be the one to make sure she got settled. He always was, though Dylan and Shane took care of their mom, too. The pastor spoke about being grateful, accepting help when it was offered, and offering service at this time of year to those who might need it. Pray for opportunities to serve others, he said. The Lord can use you. He will use you. Austin felt like he could barely keep his head above water most days. He didn't get a chance to interact with many people outside the ranch, but he supposed there were still plenty of opportunities to help the ranch hands or his brothers with something. Wasn't there? After the service ended, Austin stayed in his seat while everyone else filed out. Pastor Gifford would be busy for several minutes, and Austin needed a few minutes before their meeting anyway. He finally plucked up the courage to ask Pastor Gifford for help. Was that why the minister had focused his speech today about accepting help or looking for ways to serve? What if that was all Austin needed to hear? He closed his eyes and prayed, asking God for guidance, for a way to cleanse himself from his dark thoughts. No definitive answer came, not that Austin was expecting it to. When there was little noise left coming from the foyer, Austin stood and made his way there. Pastor Gifford saw him and finished saying goodbye to the last couple. Austin, he said warmly, a smile on his face that felt 100% genuine. Let's go talk in my office. He led the way down a short hall and around the corner before pushing through a thick door and into a decent-sized office. He pulled his tie loose around his neck and sighed as he sat. What can I help you with today? He folded his arms on his desk and looked at Austin expectantly. Austin removed his cowboy hat and worried his fingers along the brim. He sat, too, wishing the words would magically align themselves. Well, I'm not really sure. What's bothering you? Austin looked at the man, probably close to his father's age. The thought of his father clarified things. I'm angry, he said. About a lot of things that shouldn't make me angry. I don't feel normal. It's always there, and I don't know how to get rid of it. Pastor Gifford nodded. Go on. I think I just need to know what to do. The minister shook his head, though a smaller version of the smile he'd worn in the foyer returned. I can't tell you what to do. He opened a desk drawer and turned his attention to that. Let me see. I think I have something you might try. Austin wanted a pill. Maybe some magic beans, anything that would take this feeling away. He leaned forward as Pastor Gifford placed a simple business card on the desk. Anger management? Austin read the card. Classes, meetings, and more. Thursdays at 7 p.m. He looked at the pastor. You think I should go to anger management classes? I've had several patrons who've attended, he said, nudging the card closer. They speak highly of the program. Austin took the card, but it felt too heavy to take home with him. All right. Thanks. He stood, disappointed, not quite expecting the minister to give him more to do. That well of anger he barely kept contained started boiling, and Austin needed to leave. Now. He stuffed the card in his back pocket and left the office, then the church. The wind tried to steal his hat from right off the top of his head, another thing to make him angry. The blasted wind. Who got angry over wind? 
Time seemed to move slowly, but Thursday eventually came. He didn't want to tell anyone where he was going, because then they'd want to know why. And he didn't want Shane or Dylan to A, worry, or B, ask him questions, or C, give him advice. Sure, he knew Shane spoke with a therapist regularly, using an app called Talk To Me. It had done amazing things for Shane's own pent-up anger and feelings of abandonment. Dylan didn't seem to have quite as many problems, but Austin had noticed that he'd stopped talking to their father about a year ago. He seemed happier for it, too, and Hazel had really helped in that department as well. Austin, the youngest still unattached, was lonely. Angry about being lonely. Sad, angry about being sad. And most of all, he was completely done with being duped by his dad. That was what made him the angriest, and he decided while he put his horse away on Thursday evening that he would go to the anger management meeting. He met Robin on his way out of the stable and seized the opportunity. Hey, I'm heading into town tonight. Can you tell Shane? Sure. She didn't give him a funny look or question why he'd go into town on a Thursday. Now if he could just get the keys and get out of there. He managed to do both without seeing anyone except Shay, who had her two German shepherds engaged in some sort of training exercise. Her dogs were beautiful and well-behaved, and she spent serious time making sure of both. It was barely 5.30 when he arrived in Grapeseed Falls, so Austin bummed around town, got dinner, and finally parked at the library a few minutes before the meeting was set to start. Maybe he could sneak in the back and just listen. With only two minutes to spare, he got out of the truck and went inside the lower level of the library, where all the meeting rooms were located. Low-level chatter met his ears from a room at the end of the hall, and he slicked his palms down the front of his jeans. His heart pounded, and he felt like he was walking the plank, heading right for a watery grave. The door stood open and a patch of brighter light fell onto the carpet. The scent of chocolate and something fruity met his nose, but it wasn't comforting the way it had been when his mother had baked cookies for the boys after school. He paused a few strides away from the door, his mind still warring with itself. He hadn't seen anyone yet, and he could just walk on by, pretend he'd come to the wrong room. Anything, something. Just go inside. The words entered his mind, erasing and silencing the jumbled mess his thoughts had become. So he straightened his shoulders and marched toward the room, deciding once and for all that he was not going to let his anger rule his life. Not anymore. His first step in the room and someone moved right in front of him. He couldn't slow, couldn't stop, couldn't dodge. His instinct kicked in and he had a half second to brace before he collided with another body. A softer body than his, but still hard in specific places. He grabbed onto her arms. It was a woman with streaked hair, pink tips. Something cold and wet seeped through his shirt and he looked down at his chest. Punch, red punch. Let go of me, the woman spoke in a near growl, and Austin hastened to obey her, unsure of when he'd clamped his fingers around her biceps. Another step back, and all his senses started working again, eyes, nose, ears. A hush had fallen on the room, and he glanced around to find at least a dozen people in attendance, including the woman he'd barreled straight into. Shay, he asked. She accepted a handful of napkins from another woman and started mopping up her own ruined shirt. She wore a pair of jeans that hugged every feminine curve, the same pair of cowgirl boots he'd seen countless times, and a pretty seafoam green shirt. Well, it used to be pretty. Now with the red stain, it looked like a Christmas nightmare. What are you doing here? She asked, and not kindly. Her hazel eyes flashed with annoyance but she didn't look fully at him until she'd thrown away the wad of napkins. She folded her arms and cocked her hip, and Austin should not have found her so attractive. After all, this was going to be an argument, and he wouldn't walk away the winner. He rarely did with Shaley Hatch. But she was gorgeous and strong and feminine all at the same time. He'd sensed a softer Shay under the hard armor she'd presented to the world, but he hadn't cracked it, hadn't even tried wasn't sure it was worth the effort. But now, staring at her in this new environment where she couldn't boss him around and couldn't make him feel two inches tall, Austin wondered if the spark he'd always felt between them was really as one-sided as she'd claimed it to be. So he'd asked her to dance at his brother's wedding. He could admit it. 
She turned him down by laughing in his face and saying she'd never be interested in him. His place with her had been made very clear, and he hadn't tried to move from the corner she'd put him in. But now, now something started to buzz in his bloodstream, whisper fantasies through his mind, fan that dormant flame into something brilliant and hot. Let it go, Shay, the woman who brought her the napkin said, stepping between her and Austin. It's time to start. She cast a nervous look at Austin that said, please just go sit down or leave something. Shay drew in a deep breath through her nose, her glare miraculously dropping in intensity. Time to start, right. She turned away from him and then twisted back to say, I think the meaning for men who steal women's ranches is upstairs, in a cold dismissive tone that made all the parts of Austin that had started to hum quiet especially when Shay rounded the few rows of chairs that had been set up, took her position at the front of the room and said, All right, everyone. Welcome to our weekly meeting. It's time to begin. This has been Catching the Cowboy, a Royal Brothers novel, Grapeseed Falls Romance Book 5, written by Liz Isaacson, performed by Caroline McLaughlin. Copyright 2018 to present by Elena Johnson. Production copyright by Elena Johnson.